Part Two, Chapter One of Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. Part Two, Chapter One, The Indian Ocean. Now we begin the second part of this voyage under the seas. The first ended in that moving scene at the Coral Cemetery, which left a profound impression on my mind. And so Captain Nemo would live out his life entirely in the heart of this immense sea, and even his grave lay ready in its impenetrable depths. There the last sleep of the Nautilus's occupants, friends bound together in death as in life, would be disturbed by no monster of the deep. No man, either, the captain had added. Always that same fierce, implacable defiance of human society. As for me, I was no longer content with the hypotheses that satisfied Conseil. That fine lad persisted in seeing the Nautilus's commander as merely one of those unappreciated scientists who repay humanity's indifference with contempt. For Conseil, the captain was still a misunderstood genius who, tired of the world's deceptions, had been driven to take refuge in this inaccessible environment where he was free to follow his instincts. But to my mind, this hypothesis explained only one side of Captain Nemo. In fact, the mystery of that last afternoon when we were locked in prison and put to sleep, the captain's violent precaution of snatching from my grasp the spyglass poised to scour the horizon, and the fatal wound given that man during some unexplained collision suffered by the Nautilus, all led me down a plain trail. No. Captain Nemo wasn't content simply to avoid humanity. His fearsome submersible served not only his quest for freedom, but also, perhaps, it was used in Lord knows what schemes of dreadful revenge. Right now, nothing is clear to me. I still glimpse only glimmers in the dark, and I must limit my pen, as it were, to taking dictation from events. But nothing binds us to Captain Nemo. He believes that escaping from the Nautilus is impossible. We are not even constrained by our word of honor. No promises fetter us. We're simply captives, prisoners masquerading under the name guests for the sake of everyday courtesy. Even so, Ned Land hasn't given up all hope of recovering his freedom. He's sure to take advantage of the first chance that comes his way. No doubt I will do likewise, and yet I will feel some regret at making off with the Nautilus's secrets so generously unveiled for us by Captain Nemo, because ultimately should we detest or admire this man? Is he the persecutor or the persecuted? In all honesty, before I leave him forever, I want to finish this underwater tour of the world, whose first stages have been so magnificent. I want to observe the full series of these wonders gathered under the seas of our globe. I want to see what no man has seen yet, even if I must pay for this insatiable curiosity with my life. What are my discoveries to date? Nothing, relatively speaking, since so far we've covered only 6,000 leagues across the Pacific. Nevertheless, I'm well aware that the Nautilus is drawing near to populated shores, and if some chance for salvation becomes available to us, it would be sheer cruelty to sacrifice my companions to my passion for the unknown. I must go with them, perhaps even guide them. But will this opportunity ever arise? The human being, robbed of his free will, craves such an opportunity, but the scientist, forever inquisitive, dreads it. That day, January 21, 1868, the chief officer went at noon to take the sun's altitude. I climbed onto the platform, lit a cigar, and watched him at work. It seemed obvious to me that this man didn't understand French, because I made several remarks in a loud voice that were bound to provoke him into some involuntary show of interest had he understood them, but he remained mute and emotionless. 
while he took his sights with his sextant one of the nautilus's sailors that muscular man who had gone with us to crespo island during the first underwater excursion came up to clean the glass panes of the beacon i then examined the fittings of this mechanism whose power was increased a hundredfold by biconvex lenses that were designed like those in a lighthouse and kept its rays productively focused this electric lamp was so constructed as to yield its maximum illuminating power in essence its light was generated in a vacuum ensuring both its steadiness and intensity such a vacuum also reduced wear on the graphite points between which the luminous arc expanded this was an important savings for captain nemo who couldn't easily renew them but under these conditions wear and tear were almost non-existent when the nautilus was ready to resume its underwater travels i went below again to the lounge the hatches closed once more and our course was set due west we then plowed the waves of the Indian Ocean, vast liquid plains with an area of 550 million hectares, whose waters are so transparent it makes you dizzy to lean over their surface. There, the Nautilus generally drifted at a depth between 100 and 200 meters. It behaved in this way for some days. To anyone without my grand passion for the sea, these hours would surely have seemed long and monotonous, but my daily strolls on the platform where i was revived by the life-giving ocean air the sights in the rich waters beyond the lounge windows the books to be read in the library and the composition of my memoirs took up all my time and left me without a moment of weariness or boredom all in all we enjoyed a highly satisfactory state of health the diet on board agreed with us perfectly and for my part I could easily have gone without those changes of pace that Ned Land, in a spirit of protest, kept taxing his ingenuity to supply us. What's more, in this constant temperature, we didn't even have to worry about catching colds. Besides, the ship had a good stock of the madrepore dendrophilia, known in Provence by the name sea fennel, and a poultice made from the dissolved flesh of its polyps will furnish an excellent cough medicine. For some days we saw a large number of aquatic birds with webbed feet, known as gulls or sea mews. Some were skillfully slain, and when cooked in a certain fashion, they make a very acceptable platter of water game. Among the great wind riders, carried over long distances from every shore and resting on the waves from their exhausting flights, I spotted some magnificent albatross, birds belonging to the Longepines long-winged family, whose discordant calls sound like the braying of an ass. The Totipalmes, fully webbed family, was represented by swift frigate birds, nimbly catching fish at the surface, and by numerous tropic birds of the genus Phaeton, among others the red-tailed tropic bird, the size of a pigeon, its white plumage shaded with pink tints that contrasted with its dark-hued wings. The Nautilus's nets hauled up several types of sea turtle from the hawksbill genus, with arching backs whose scales are highly prized. Diving easily, these reptiles can remain a good while underwater by closing the fleshy valves located at the external openings of their nasal passages. When they were captured, some hawksbills were still asleep inside their carapaces, a refuge from other marine animals. The flesh of these turtles is nothing memorable, but their eggs make an excellent feast as for fish they always filled us with wonderment when staring through the open panels we could unveil the secrets of their aquatic lives i noted several species i hadn't previously been able to observe i'll mention chiefly some trunk fish unique to the red sea the sea of the east indies and that part of the ocean washing the coasts of equinoctial america like turtles armadillos sea urchins and crustaceans these fish are protected by armor plate that's neither chalky nor stony but actual bone sometimes this armor takes the shape of a solid triangle sometimes that of a solid quadrangle among the triangular type i noticed some half a decimeter long with brown tails yellow fins and wholesome exquisitely tasty flesh i even recommend that they be acclimatized to fresh water 
a change incidentally that a number of saltwater fish can make with ease i'll also mention some quadrangular trunkfish topped by four large protuberances along the back trunkfish sprinkled with white spots on the underside of the body which make good house pets like certain birds boxfish armed with stings formed by extensions of their bony crusts and whose odd grunting has earned them the nickname sea pigs then some trunkfish known as dromedaries with tough leathery flesh and big conical humps from the daily notes kept by mr conseil i also retrieve certain fish from the genus tetradon unique to these seas southern puffers with red backs and white chests distinguished by three lengthwise rows of filaments and jugfish seven inches long decked out in the brightest colors then as specimens of other genera blowfish resembling a dark brown egg furrowed with white bands and lacking tails globefish genuine porcupines of the sea armed with stings and able to inflate themselves until they look like a pincushion bristling with needles seahorses common to every ocean flying dragonfish with long snouts and highly distended pectoral fins shaped like wings which enable them if not to fly at least to spring into the air spatula-shaped paddlefish whose tails are covered with many scaly rings snipefish with long jaws excellent animals twenty-five centimeters long and gleaming with the most cheerful colors bluish-gray dragon nets with wrinkled heads myriads of leaping blennies with black stripes and long pectoral fins gliding over the surface of the water with prodigious speed delicious sailfish that can hoist their fins in a favorable current like so many unfurled sails splendid nursery fish on which nature has lavished yellow azure silver and gold yellow mackerel with wings made of filaments bullheads forever spattered with mud which make distinct hissing sounds sea robins whose livers are thought to be poisonous ladyfish that can flutter their eyelids finally archer fish with long tubular snouts real ocean-going flycatchers armed with a rifle unforeseen by either remington or chassapot it slays insects by shooting them with a simple drop of water from the eighty-ninth fish genus in Lacepede's system of classification belonging to his second subclass of bony fish characterized by gill covers and a bronchial membrane i noted some scorpion fish whose heads are adorned with stings and which have only one dorsal fin these animals are covered with small scales or have none at all depending on the subgenus to which they belong the second subgenus gave us some didactylous specimens three or four decimeters long streaked with yellow their heads having a phantasmagoric appearance as for the first subgenus it furnished several specimens of that bizarre fish aptly named toadfish whose big head is sometimes gouged with deep cavities sometimes swollen with protuberances bristling with stings and strewn with nodules it sports hideously irregular horns its body and tail are adorned with callosities its stings can inflict dangerous injuries it's repulsive and horrible from january twenty one to the twenty third the nautilus traveled at a rate of two hundred and fifty leagues in twenty four hours hence five hundred and forty miles at twenty two miles per hour if during our trip we were able to identify these different varieties of fish it's because they were attracted by our electric light and tried to follow alongside but most of them were outdistanced by our speed and soon fell behind temporarily however a few managed to keep pace in the nautilus's waters on the morning of the twenty fourth in latitude twelve degrees five minutes south and longitude ninety four degrees thirty three minutes we raised keeling island a madreporic upheaving planted with magnificent coconut trees which had been visited by mr darwin and captain fitzroy the nautilus cruised along a short distance off the shore of this desert island our dragnets brought up many specimens of polyps and echinoderms plus some unusual shells from the branch mollusca 
captain nemo's treasures were enhanced by some valuable exhibits from the delphinula snail species to which i joined some pointed star coral a sort of parasitic polypary that often attaches itself to seashells soon keeling island disappeared below the horizon and our course was set to the northwest toward the tip of the indian peninsula civilization ned land told me that day much better than those papuan islands where we ran into more savages than venison on this indian shore professor there are roads and railways english french and hindu villages we wouldn't go five miles without bumping into a fellow countryman come on now isn't it time for our sudden departure from captain nemo no no ned i replied in a very firm tone let's ride it out as you seafaring fellows say the nautilus is approaching populated areas it's going back toward europe let it take us there after we arrive in home waters we can do as we see fit besides i don't imagine captain nemo will let us go hunting on the coasts of malabar or coromandel as he did in the forests of new guinea well sir can't we manage without his permission i didn't answer the canadian i wanted no arguments deep down i was determined to fully exploit the good fortune that had put me on board the nautilus after leaving keeling island our pace got generally slower it also got more unpredictable often taking us to great depths several times we used our slanting fins which internal levers could set at an oblique angle to our waterline thus we went as deep as two or three kilometers down but without ever verifying the lowest depths of this sea near india which soundings of thirteen thousand meters have been unable to reach as for the temperature in these lower strata the thermometer always and invariably indicated four degrees centigrade i merely observed that in the upper layers the water was always colder over shallows than in the open sea on january twenty five the ocean being completely deserted the nautilus spent a day on the surface turning the waves with its powerful propeller and making them spurt to great heights under these conditions who wouldn't have mistaken it for a gigantic cetacean i spent three-quarters of the day on the platform i stared at the sea nothing on the horizon except near four o'clock in the afternoon a long steamer to the west running on our opposite tack its masting was visible for an instant but it couldn't have seen the nautilus because we were lying too low in the water i imagine that steamboat belonged to the peninsular and oriental line which provides service from the island of ceylon to sydney also calling at king george sound and melbourne at five o'clock in the afternoon just before that brief twilight that links day with night in tropical zones conseil and i marveled at an unusual sight it was a delightful animal whose discovery according to the ancients is a sign of good luck aristotle athenaeus pliny and apion studied its habits and lavished on its behalf all the scientific poetry of greece and italy they called it nautilus and pompilius but modern science has not endorsed these designations and this mollusk is now known by the name argonaut anyone consulting conseil would soon learn from the gallant lad that the branch mollusca is divided into five classes that the first class features the cephalopoda whose members are sometimes naked sometimes covered with a shell which consists of two families the dibranchiata and the terebranchiata which are distinguished by their number of gills that the family dibranchiata includes three genera the argonaut the squid and the cuttlefish and that the family terebranchiata contains only one genus the nautilus after this catalogue if some recalcitrant listener confuses the argonaut which is acetabuliferous in other words a bearer of suction tubes with the nautilus which is tentaculiferous a bearer of tentacles it will be simply unforgivable now it was a school of argonauts then voyaging on the surface of the ocean we could count several hundred of them they belonged to that species of argonaut covered with protuberances and exclusive to the seas near india 
these graceful mollusks were swimming backward by means of their locomotive tubes sucking water into these tubes and then expelling it six of their eight tentacles were long thin and floated on the water while the other two were rounded into palms and spread to the wind like light sails i could see perfectly their undulating spiral-shaped shells which cuvier aptly compared to an elegant cockle-boat it's an actual boat indeed it transports the animal that secretes it without the animal sticking to it the argonaut is free to leave its shell i told conseil but it never does not unlike captain nemo conseil replied sagely which is why he should have christened his ship the argonaut for about an hour the nautilus cruised in the midst of this school of mollusks then lord knows why they were gripped with a sudden fear as if at a signal every sail was abruptly lowered arms folded bodies contracted shells turned over by changing their center of gravity and the whole flotilla disappeared under the waves it was instantaneous and no squadron of ships ever maneuvered with greater togetherness just then night fell suddenly and the waves barely surged in the breeze spreading placidly around the nautilus's side plates the next day january twenty sixth we cut the equator on the eighty-second meridian and we re-entered the northern hemisphere during that day a fearsome school of sharks provided us with an escort dreadful animals that teem in these seas and make them extremely dangerous there were port jackson sharks with a brown back a whitish belly and eleven rows of teeth big eye sharks with necks marked by a large black spot encircled in white and resembling an eye and isabella sharks whose rounded snouts were strewn with dark speckles often these powerful animals rushed at the lounge window with a violence less than comforting by this point ned land had lost all self-control he wanted to rise to the surface of the waves and harpoon the monsters especially certain smooth hound sharks whose mouths were paved with teeth arranged like a mosaic and some big five-meter tiger sharks that insisted on personally provoking him but the nautilus soon picked up speed and easily left astern the fastest of these man-eaters on january twenty seven at the entrance to the huge bay of bengal we repeatedly encountered a gruesome sight human corpses floating on the surface of the waves carried by the ganges to the high seas these were deceased indian villagers who hadn't been fully devoured by vultures the only morticians in these parts but there was no shortage of sharks to assist them with their undertaking chores near seven o'clock in the evening the nautilus lay half submerged navigating in the midst of milky white waves as far as the eye could see the ocean seemed lactified was it an effect of the moon's rays no because the new moon was barely two days old and was still lost below the horizon in the sun's rays the entire sky although lit up by stellar radiation seemed pitch black in comparison with the whiteness of these waters conseil couldn't believe his eyes and he questioned me about the causes of this odd phenomenon luckily i was in a position to answer him that's called a milk sea i told him a vast expanse of white waves often seen along the coasts of amboina and in these waterways but conseil asked could master tell me the cause of this effect because i presume this water hasn't really changed into milk no my boy and this whiteness that amazes you is merely due to the presence of myriads of tiny creatures called infusoria a sort of diminutive glowworm that's colorless and gelatinous in appearance as thick as a strand of hair and no longer than one-fifth of a millimeter some of these tiny creatures stick together over an area of several leagues several leagues conseil exclaimed yes my boy and don't even try to compute the number of these infusoria you won't pull it off because if i'm not mistaken certain navigators have cruised through milk seas for more than forty miles 
i'm not sure that conseil heeded my recommendation because he seemed to be deep in thought no doubt trying to calculate how many one-fifths of a millimeter are found in forty square miles as for me i continued to observe this phenomenon for several hours the nautilus's spur sliced through these whitish waves and i watched it glide noiselessly over this soapy water as if it were cruising through those foamy eddies that a bay's currents and countercurrents sometimes leave between each other near midnight the sea suddenly resumed its usual hue but behind us all the way to the horizon the skies kept mirroring the whiteness of those waves and for a good while seemed imbued with the hazy glow of an aurora borealis End of Part 2, Chapter 1Part 2, Chapter 2 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne Chapter 2, A New Proposition from Captain Nemo on january twenty eighth in latitude nine degrees four minutes north when the nautilus returned at noon to the surface of the sea it lay in sight of land some eight miles to the west right off i observed a cluster of mountains about two thousand feet high whose shapes were very whimsically sculpted after our position fix i re-entered the lounge and when our bearings were reported on the chart i saw that we were off the island of ceylon that pearl dangling from the lower lobe of the indian peninsula i went looking in the library for a book about this island one of the most fertile in the world sure enough i found a volume entitled ceylon and the singalese by h c sir esq re-entering the lounge i first noted the bearings of ceylon on which antiquity lavished so many different names it was located between latitude five degrees fifty five minutes and nine degrees forty nine minutes north and between longitude seventy nine degrees forty two minutes and eighty two degrees four minutes east of the meridian of greenwich its length is two hundred and seventy five miles its maximum width a hundred and fifty miles its circumference nine hundred miles its surface area twenty four thousand four hundred and forty eight square miles in other words a little smaller than that of ireland just then captain nemo and his chief officer appeared the captain glanced at the chart then turning to me the island of ceylon he said is famous for its pearl fisheries would you be interested professor aronnax in visiting one of those fisheries certainly captain fine it's easily done only when we see the fisheries we'll see no fishermen the annual harvest hasn't yet begun no matter i'll give orders to make for the gulf of manar and we'll arrive there late tonight the captain said a few words to his chief officer who went out immediately soon the nautilus re-entered its liquid element and the pressure gauge indicated that it was staying at a depth of thirty feet with the chart under my eyes i looked for the gulf of manar i found it by the ninth parallel off the northwestern shores of ceylon it was formed by the long curve of little manar island to reach it we had to go all the way up ceylon's west coast professor captain nemo then told me there are pearl fisheries in the bay of bengal the seas of the east indies the seas of china and japan plus those seas south of the united states the gulf of panama and the gulf of california but it's off ceylon that such fishing reaps its richest rewards no doubt we'll be arriving a little early fishermen gather in the gulf of manar only during the month of march and for thirty days some three hundred boats concentrate on the lucrative harvest of these treasures from the sea each boat is manned by ten oarsmen and ten fishermen the latter divide into two groups dive in rotation and descend to a depth of twelve meters with the help of a heavy stone clutched between their feet and attached by a rope to their boat you mean 
i said, that such primitive methods are still all that they use? All, Captain Nemo answered me. Although these fisheries belong to the most industrialized people in the world, the English, to whom the Treaty of Amiens granted them in 1802. Yet it strikes me that diving suits like yours could perform yeoman service in such work. Yes, since those poor fishermen can't stay long under water. On his voyage to Ceylon, the Englishman Percival made much of a Kaffir who stayed under five minutes without coming up to the surface, but I find that hard to believe. I know that some divers can last up to 57 seconds, and highly skillful ones to 87, but such men are rare, and when the poor fellows climb back on board, the water coming out of their noses and ears is tinted with blood. I believe the average time under water that these fishermen can tolerate is 30 seconds, during which they hastily stuff their little nets with all the pearl oysters they can tear loose. But these fishermen generally don't live to advanced age. Their vision weakens, ulcers break out on their eyes, sores form on their bodies, and some are even stricken with apoplexy on the ocean floor. Yes, I said. It's a sad occupation, and one that exists only to gratify the whims of fashion. But tell me, Captain, how many oysters can a boat fish up in a work day? About 40,000 to 50,000. It's even said that in 1814, when the English government went fishing on its own behalf, its divers worked just 20 days and brought up 76 million oysters. At least, I asked, the fishermen are well paid, aren't they? Hardly, Professor. In Panama they make just one dollar per week. In most places they earn only a penny for each oyster that has a pearl, and they bring up so many that have none. Only one penny to those poor people who make their employers rich? That's atrocious. On that note, Professor, Captain Nemo told me, you and your companions will visit the Manar Oyster Bank, and if by chance some eager fisherman arrives early, well, we can watch him at work. That suits me, Captain. By the way, Professor Aronnax, you aren't afraid of sharks, are you? Sharks! I exclaimed. This struck me as a pretty needless question, to say the least. Well, Captain Nemo went on, I admit, Captain, I'm not yet on very familiar terms with that genus of fish. We're used to them, the rest of us, Captain Nemo answered, and in time you will be too. Anyhow, we'll be armed, and on our way we might hunt a man-eater or two. It's a fascinating sport. So, Professor, I'll see you tomorrow, bright and early. This said in a carefree tone, Captain Nemo left the lounge. If you're invited to hunt bears in the Swiss mountains, you might say, Oh, good, I get to go bear hunting tomorrow. If you're invited to hunt lions on the Atlas Plains or tigers in the jungles of India, you might say, Ha! Now's my chance to hunt lions and tigers. But if you're invited to hunt sharks in their native element, you might want to think it over before accepting. As for me, I passed a hand over my brow, where beads of cold sweat were busy forming. Let's think this over, I said to myself, and let's take our time. Hunting otters in underwater forests, as we did in the forests of Crespo Island, is an acceptable activity. But to roam the bottom of the sea when you're almost certain to meet man-eaters in the neighborhood, that's another story. I know that in certain countries, particularly the Andaman Islands, Negroes don't hesitate to attack sharks, dagger in one hand and noose in the other. But I also know that many who face those fearsome animals don't come back alive. Besides, I'm not a Negro, and even if I were a Negro, in this instance I don't think a little hesitation on my part would be out of place. And there I was, fantasizing about sharks, envisioning huge jaws armed with multiple rows of teeth and capable of cutting a man in half. I could already feel a definite pain around my pelvic girdle. 
and how i resented the offhand manner in which the captain had extended his deplorable invitation you would have thought it was an issue of going into the woods on some harmless fox hunt thank heavens i said to myself conseil will never want to come along and that'll be my excuse for not going with the captain as for ned land i admit i felt less confident of his wisdom danger however great held a perennial attraction for his aggressive nature i went back to reading sir's book but i leafed through it mechanically between the lines i kept seeing fearsome wide-open jaws just then conseil and the canadian entered with a calm even gleeful air little did they know what was waiting for them e god sir ned land told me your captain nemo the devil take him has just made us a very pleasant proposition oh i said you know about with all due respect to master conseil replied the nautilus's commander has invited us together with master for a visit tomorrow to salon's magnificent pearl fisheries he did so in the most cordial terms and conducted himself like a true gentleman he didn't tell you anything else nothing sir the canadian replied he said you'd already discussed this little stroll indeed i said but didn't he give you any details on not a one mr naturalist you will be going with us right me why yes certainly of course i can see that you like the idea mr land yes it will be a really unusual experience and possibly dangerous i added in an insinuating tone dangerous ned land replied a simple trip to an oyster bank assuredly captain nemo hadn't seen fit to plant the idea of sharks in the minds of my companions for my part i stared at them with anxious eyes as if they were already missing a limb or two should i alert them yes surely but i hardly knew how to go about it would master conseil said to me give us some background on pearl fishing on the fishing itself i asked or on the occupational hazards that on the fishing the canadian replied before we tackle the terrain it helps to be familiar with it all right sit down my friends and i'll teach you everything i myself have just been taught by the englishman h c sir ned and conseil took seats on a couch and right off the canadian said to me sir just what is a pearl exactly my gallant ned i replied for poets a pearl is a tear from the sea for orientals it's a drop of solidified dew for the ladies it's a jewel they can wear on their fingers necks and ears that's oblong in shape glassy in luster and formed from mother of pearl for chemists it's a mixture of calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate with a little gelatin protein and finally for naturalists it's a simple festering secretion from the organ that produces mother of pearl in certain bivalves branch mollusca conseil said class acephala order testacea correct my scholarly conseil now then those testacea capable of producing pearls include rainbow abalone turbo snails giant clams and saltwater scallops briefly all those that secrete mother of pearl in other words that blue azure violet or white substance lining the insides of their valves are mussels included too the canadian asked yes the mussels of certain streams in scotland wales ireland saxony bohemia and france good the canadian replied from now on we'll pay closer attention to them but i went on for secreting pearls the ideal mollusk is the pearl oyster meleagrina margartifera that valuable shellfish pearls result simply from mother of pearl solidifying into a globular shape either they stick on the oyster shell or they become embedded in the creature's folds on the valves a pearl sticks fast on the flesh it lies loose but its nucleus is always some small hard object say a sterile egg or a grain of sand around which the mother of pearl is deposited in thin concentric layers 
over several years in succession can one find several pearls in the same oyster conseil asked yes my boy there are some shellfish that turn into real jewel coffers they even mention one oyster about which i remain dubious that supposedly contained at least 150 sharks 150 sharks ned land yelped oh did i say sharks i exclaimed hastily i meant 150 pearls sharks wouldn't make sense indeed conseil said but will master now tell us how one goes about extracting these pearls one proceeds in several ways and often when pearls stick to the valves fishermen even pull them loose with pliers but usually the shellfish are spread out on mats made from the esparto grass that covers the beaches thus they die in the open air and by the end of ten days they've rotted sufficiently next they're immersed in huge tanks of salt water then they're opened up and washed at this point the sorters begin their twofold task first they remove the layers of mother of pearl which are known in the industry by the names legitimate silver bastard white or bastard black and these are shipped out in cases weighing 125 to 150 kilograms then they remove the oysters meaty tissue boil it and finally strain it in order to extract even the smallest pearls do the prices of these pearls differ depending on their size conseil asked not only on their size i replied but also according to their shape their water in other words their color and their orient in other words that dappled shimmering glow that makes them so delightful to the eye the finest pearls are called virgin pearls or paragons they form in isolation within the mollusk's tissue they're white often opaque but sometimes of opalescent transparency and usually spherical or pear-shaped the spherical ones are made into bracelets the pear-shaped ones into earrings and since they're the most valuable they're priced individually the other pearls that stick to the oyster's shell are more erratically shaped and are priced by weight finally classed in the lowest order the smallest pearls are known by the name seed pearls they are priced by the measuring cup and are used mainly in the creation of embroidery for church vestments but it must be a long hard job sorting out these pearls by size the canadian said no my friend that task is performed with eleven strainers or sieves that are pierced with different numbers of holes those pearls staying in the strainers with twenty to eighty holes are in the first order those not slipping through the sieves pierced with one hundred to eight hundred holes are in the second order finally those pearls for which one uses strainers pierced with nine hundred to a thousand holes make up the seed pearls how ingenious conseil said to reduce dividing and classifying pearls to a mechanical operation and could master tell us the profits brought in by harvesting these banks of pearl oysters according to sir's book i replied these salon fisheries are farmed annually for a total profit of three million man-eaters francs conseil rebuked yes francs three million francs i went on but i don't think these fisheries bring in the returns they once did similarly the central american fisheries used to make an annual profit of four million francs during the reign of king charles v but now they bring in only two-thirds of that amount all in all it's estimated that nine million francs is the current yearly return for the whole pearl harvesting industry but conseil asked haven't certain famous pearls been quoted at extremely high prices yes my boy they say julius caesar gave servilia a pearl worth one hundred and twenty thousand francs in our currency i've even heard stories the canadian said about some lady in ancient times who drank pearls in vinegar cleopatra conseil shot back it must have tasted pretty bad ned land added abominable ned my friend conseil replied but when a little glass of vinegar is worth one million five hundred thousand francs its taste is a small price to pay i'm sorry i didn't marry the gal 
the Canadian said, throwing up his hands with an air of discouragement. Ned Land married to Cleopatra, Conseil exclaimed. But I was all set to tie the knot, Conseil, the Canadian replied in all seriousness, and it wasn't my fault the whole business fell through. I even bought a pearl necklace for my fiance, Kate Tender, but she married somebody else instead. Well, that necklace cost me only a dollar and fifty cents, but you can absolutely trust me on this, Professor. Its pearls were so big, they wouldn't have gone through that strainer with twenty holes. <laughs> my gallant ned i replied laughing those were artificial pearls ordinary glass beads whose insides were coated with essence of orient wow the canadian replied that essence of orient must sell for quite a large sum as little as zero it comes from the scales of a european carp it's nothing more than a silver substance that collects in the water and is preserved in ammonia it's worthless maybe that's why kate tender married somebody else replied mr land philosophically but i said getting back to pearls of great value i don't think any sovereign ever possessed one superior to the pearl owned by captain nemo this one conseil said pointing to a magnificent jewel in its glass case exactly and i'm certainly not far off when i estimate its value at two million uh francs conseil said quickly yes i said two million francs and no doubt all it cost our captain was the effort to pick it up ha ned land exclaimed during our stroll tomorrow who says we won't run into one just like it bah conseil put in and why not what good would a pearl worth millions do us here on the nautilus here no ned land said but elsewhere oh elsewhere conseil put in shaking his head in fact i said mr land is right and if we ever brought back to europe or america a pearl worth millions it would make the story of our adventures more authentic and much more rewarding that's how i see it the canadian said but said conseil who perpetually returned to the didactic side of things is this pearl fishing ever dangerous no i replied quickly especially if one takes certain precautions what risks would you run in a job like that ned land said swallowing a few gulps of salt water whatever you say ned then trying to imitate captain nemo's carefree tone i asked by the way gallant ned are you afraid of sharks me the canadian replied i'm a professional harpooner it's my job to make a mockery of them it isn't an issue i said of fishing for them with a swivel hook hoisting them onto the deck of a ship chopping off the tail with a sweep of the axe opening the belly ripping out the heart and tossing it into the sea so it's an issue of huh yes precisely in the water in the water ye gods just give me a good harpoon you see sir these sharks are badly designed they have to roll their bellies over to snap you up and in the meantime ned land had a way of pronouncing the word snap that sent chills down the spine well how about you conseil what are your feelings about these man-eaters me conseil said i'm afraid i must be frank with master good for you i thought if master faces these sharks conseil said i think his loyal manservant should face them with him end of chapter two part two chapter three of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne chapter three a pearl worth ten million night fell i went to bed i slept pretty poorly man-eaters played a major role in my dreams and i found it more or less appropriate that the french word for shark requin 
has its linguistic roots in the word requiem the next day at four o'clock in the morning i was awakened by the steward whom captain nemo had placed expressly at my service i got up quickly dressed and went into the lounge captain nemo was waiting for me professor aronnax he said to me are you ready to start i'm ready kindly follow me what about my companions captain they've been alerted and are waiting for us aren't we going to put on our diving suits i asked not yet i haven't let the nautilus pull too near the coast and we're fairly well out from the manar oyster bank but i have the skiff ready and it will take us to the exact spot where we'll disembark which will save us a pretty long trek it's carrying our diving equipment and will suit up just before we begin our underwater exploring captain nemo took me to the central companionway whose steps led to the platform ned and conseil were there enraptured with the pleasure trip getting under way oars in position five of the nautilus's sailors were waiting for us aboard the skiff which was moored alongside the night was still dark layers of clouds cloaked the sky and left only a few stars in view my eyes flew to the side where land lay but i saw only a blurred line covering three-quarters of the horizon from southwest to northwest going up ceylon's west coast during the night the nautilus lay west of the bay or rather that gulf formed by the mainland and manar island under these dark waters there stretched the bank of shellfish an inexhaustible field of pearls more than twenty miles long captain nemo conseil ned land and i found seats in the stern of the skiff the longboat's coxswain took the tiller his four companions leaned into their oars the moorings were cast off and we pulled clear the skiff headed southward the oarsmen took their time i watched their strokes vigorously catch the water and they always waited ten seconds before rowing again following the practice used in most navies while the longboat coasted drops of liquid flicked from the oars and hit the dark troughs of the waves pitter-pattering like splashes of molten lead coming from well out a mild swell made the skiff roll gently and a few crested billows lapped at its bow we were silent what was captain nemo thinking perhaps that this approaching shore was too close for comfort contrary to the canadian's views in which it still seemed too far away as for conseil he had come along out of simple curiosity near five thirty the first glimmers of light on the horizon defined the upper lines of the coast with greater distinctness fairly flat to the east it swelled a little toward the south five miles still separated it from us and its beach merged with the misty waters between us and the shore the sea was deserted not a boat not a diver profound solitude reigned over this gathering place of pearl fishermen as captain nemo had commented we were arriving in these waterways a month too soon at six o'clock the day broke suddenly with that speed unique to tropical regions which experience no real dawn or dusk the sun's rays pierced the cloud curtain gathered on the easterly horizon and the radiant orb rose swiftly i could clearly see the shore which featured a few sparse trees here and there the skiff advanced toward Manar Island, which curved to the south. Captain Nemo stood up from his thwart and studied the sea. At his signal, the anchor was lowered, but its chain barely ran because the bottom lay no more than a meter down, and this locality was one of the shallowest spots near the bank of shellfish. Instantly, the skiff wheeled around under the ebb tide's outbound thrust here we are professor aronnax captain nemo then said you observe this confined bay a month from now in this very place the numerous fishing boats of the harvesters will gather and these are the waters their divers will ransack so daringly this bay is felicitously laid out for their type of fishing it's sheltered from the strongest winds 
and the sea is never very turbulent here highly favorable conditions for diving work now let's put on our underwater suits and we'll begin our stroll i didn't reply and while staring at these suspicious waves, I began to put on my heavy aquatic clothes, helped by the longboat's sailors. Captain Nemo and my two companions suited up as well. None of the Nautilus's men were to go with us on this new excursion. Soon we were imprisoned up to the neck in India rubber clothing, and straps fastened the air devices onto our backs. As for the Runcorf device, it didn't seem to be in the picture. Before inserting my head into its copper capsule, I commented on this to the captain. Our lighting equipment would be useless to us, the captain answered me. We won't be going very deep, and the sun's rays will be sufficient to light our way. Besides, it's unwise to carry electric lanterns under these waves. Their brightness might unexpectedly attract certain dangerous occupants of these waterways. As Captain Nemo pronounced these words, I turned to Conseil and Ned Land, but my two friends had already encased their craniums in their metal headgear, and they could neither hear nor reply. I had one question left to address to Captain Nemo. What about our weapons? I asked him. Our rifles. Rifles? What for? Don't your mountaineers attack bears dagger in hand? And isn't steel surer than lead? Here's a sturdy blade. Slip it under your belt, and let's be off. I stared at my companions. They were armed in the same fashion, and Ned Land was also brandishing an enormous harpoon he had stowed in the skiff before leaving the Nautilus. Then, following the captain's example, I let myself be crowned with my heavy copper sphere, and our air tanks immediately went into action. An instant later, the longboat's sailors helped us overboard one after the other, and we set foot on level sand in a meter and a half of water. Captain Nemo gave us a hand signal. We followed him down a gentle slope and disappeared under the waves. There, the obsessive fears in my brain left me. I became surprisingly calm again. The ease with which I could move increased my confidence, and the many strange sights captivated my imagination. The sun was already sending sufficient light under these waves. The tiniest objects remained visible. After ten minutes of walking, we were in five meters of water, and the terrain had become almost flat. Like a covey of snipe over a marsh, there rose underfoot schools of unusual fish from the genus Monopterus, whose members have no fin but their tail. I recognized the Javanese eel, a genuine eight-decimeter serpent with a bluish-gray belly, which, without the gold lines over its flanks, could easily be confused with the conger eel. From the butterfish genus, whose oval bodies are very flat, I observed several adorned in brilliant colors and sporting a dorsal fin like a sickle, edible fish that, when dried and marinated, make an excellent dish known by the name carawade. Then some sea poachers, fish belonging to the genus Aspidophorides, whose bodies are covered with scaly armor divided into eight lengthwise sections. Meanwhile, as the sun got progressively higher, it lit up the watery mass more and more. The seafloor changed little by little. Its fine-grained sand was followed by a genuine causeway of smooth crags covered by a carpet of mollusks and zoophytes. Among other specimens in these two branches, I noted some windowpane oysters with thin valves of unequal size, a type of ostracod unique to the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, then orange-hued lucina with circular shells, all shaped auger shells, some of those Persian murex snails that supply the Nautilus with such wonderful dye, spiky periwinkles fifteen centimeters long that rose under the waves like hands ready to grab you, turban snails with shells made of horn and bristling all over with spines, lamp shells, edible duck clams that feed the Hindu marketplace, subtly luminous jellyfish of the species Pelagia panopyra, and finally some wonderful oculina flabelliforma, magnificent sea fans that fashion one of the most luxuriant tree forms in this ocean. 
in the midst of this moving vegetation under arbors of water plants there raced legions of clumsy articulates in particular some fanged frog crabs whose carapaces form a slightly rounded triangle robber crabs exclusive to these waterways and horrible parthenope crabs whose appearance was repulsive to the eye one animal no less hideous which i encountered several times was the enormous crab that mr darwin observed to which nature has given the instinct and requisite strength to eat coconuts it scrambles up trees on the beach and sends the coconuts tumbling they fracture in their fall and are opened by its powerful pincers here under these clear waves this crab races around with matchless agility while green turtles from the species frequenting the malabar coast moved sluggishly among the crumbling rocks near seven o'clock we finally surveyed the bank of shellfish where pearl oysters reproduce by the millions these valuable mollusks stick to rocks where they're strongly attached by a mass of brown filaments that forbids their moving about in this respect oysters are inferior even to mussels to whom nature has not denied all talent for locomotion the shellfish meleagrina that womb for pearls where valves are nearly equal in size has the shape of a round shell with thick walls and a very rough exterior some of these shells were furrowed with flaky greenish bands that radiated down from the top these were the young oysters the others had rugged black surfaces measured up to fifteen centimeters in width and were ten or more years old captain nemo pointed to this prodigious heap of shellfish and i saw that these mines were genuinely inexhaustible since nature's creative powers are greater than man's destructive instincts true to those instincts ned land greedily stuffed the finest of these mollusks into a net he carried at his side but we couldn't stop we had to follow the captain who was headed down trails seemingly known only to himself the sea floor rose noticeably and when i lifted my arms sometimes they would pass above the surface of the sea then the level of the oyster bank would lower unpredictably often we went around tall pointed rocks rising like pyramids in their dark crevices huge crustaceans aiming their long legs like heavy artillery watched us with unblinking eyes while underfoot there crept millipedes bloodworms aricia worms and annelid worms whose antennas and tubular tentacles were incredibly long just then a huge cave opened up in our path hollowed from a picturesque pile of rocks whose smooth heights were completely hung with underwater flora at first this cave looked pitch black to me inside the sun's rays seemed to diminish by degrees their hazy transparency was nothing more than drowned light captain nemo went in we followed him my eyes soon grew accustomed to this comparative gloom i distinguished the unpredictably contoured springings of a vault supported by natural pillars firmly based on a granite foundation like the weighty columns of tuscan architecture why had our incomprehensible guide taken us into the depths of this underwater crypt i would soon find out after going down a fairly steep slope our feet trod the floor of a sort of circular pit there captain nemo stopped and his hand indicated an object that i hadn't yet noticed it was an oyster of extraordinary dimensions a titanic giant clam a holy water font that could have held a whole lake a basin more than two meters wide hence even bigger than the one adorning the nautilus's lounge i approached this phenomenal mollusk its mass of filaments attached to a table of granite and there it grew by itself in the midst of the cave's calm waters i estimated the weight of this giant clam at three hundred kilograms hence such an oyster had fifteen kilos of meat and you'd need the stomach of king gargantua to eat a couple dozen captain nemo was obviously familiar with this bivalve's existence this wasn't the first time he'd paid it a visit and i thought his sole reason for leading us to this locality was to show us a natural curiosity i was mistaken captain nemo had an explicit personal interest in checking on the current condition of this giant clam 
the mollusk's two valves were partly open the captain approached and stuck his dagger vertically between the shells to discourage any idea about closing then with his hands he raised the fringed membrane-filled tunic that made up the animal's mantle there between its leaf-like folds i saw a loose pearl as big as a coconut its globular shape perfect clarity and wonderful orient made it a jewel of incalculable value carried away by curiosity i stretched out my hand to take it weigh it fondle it but the captain stopped me signaled no removed his dagger in one swift motion and let the two valves snap shut i then understood captain nemo's intent by leaving the pearl buried beneath the giant clam's mantle he allowed it to grow imperceptibly with each passing year the mollusk's secretions added new concentric layers the captain alone was familiar with the cave where this wonderful fruit of nature was ripening he alone reared it so to speak in order to transfer it one day to his dearly beloved museum perhaps following the examples of oyster farmers in china and india he had even predetermined the creation of this pearl by sticking under the mollusk's folds some piece of glass or metal that was gradually covered with mother-of-pearl in any case comparing this pearl to others i already knew about and to those shimmering in the captain's collection i estimated that it was worth at least ten million francs it was a superb natural curiosity rather than a luxurious piece of jewelry because i don't know of any female ear that could handle it our visit to this opulent giant clam came to an end captain nemo left the cave and we climbed back up the bank of shellfish in the midst of these clear waters not yet disturbed by divers at work we walked by ourselves genuine loiterers stopping or straying as our fancies dictated for my part i was no longer worried about those dangers my imagination had so ridiculously exaggerated the shallows drew noticeably closer to the surface of the sea and soon walking in only a meter of water my head passed well above the level of the ocean conseil rejoined me and gluing his huge copper capsule to mine his eyes gave me a friendly greeting but this lofty plateau measured only a few fathoms and soon we re-entered our element i think i've now earned the right to dub it that ten minutes later captain nemo stopped suddenly i thought he'd called a halt so that we could turn and start back no with a gesture he ordered us to crouch beside him at the foot of a wide crevice his hand motioned toward a spot within the liquid mass and i looked carefully five meters away a shadow appeared and dropped to the seafloor the alarming idea of sharks crossed my mind but i was mistaken and once again we didn't have to deal with monsters of the deep it was a man a living man a black indian fisherman a poor devil who no doubt had come to gather what he could before harvest time i saw the bottom of his dinghy moored a few feet above his head he would dive and go back up in quick succession a stone cut in the shape of a sugar loaf which he gripped between his feet while a rope connected it to his boat served to lower him more quickly to the ocean floor this was the extent of his equipment arriving on the seafloor at a depth of about five meters he fell to his knees and stuffed his sack with shellfish gathered at random then he went back up emptied his sack pulled up his stone and started all over again the whole process lasting only thirty seconds this diver didn't see us a shadow cast by our crag hid us from his view and besides how could this poor indian ever have guessed that human beings creatures like himself were near him under the waters eavesdropping on his movements not missing a single detail of his fishing so he went up and down several times he gathered only about ten shellfish per dive because he had to tear them from the banks where each clung with its tough mass of filaments and how many of these oysters for which he risked his life would have no pearl in them i observed him with great care 
his movements were systematically executed and for half an hour no danger seemed to threaten him so i had gotten used to the sight of this fascinating fishing when all at once just as the indian was kneeling on the seafloor i saw him make a frightened gesture stand and gather himself to spring back to the surface of the waves i understood his fear a gigantic shadow appeared above the poor diver it was a shark of huge size moving in diagonally eyes ablaze jaws wide open i was speechless with horror unable to make a single movement with one vigorous stroke of its fins, the voracious animal shot toward the Indian, who jumped aside and avoided the shark's bite, but not the thrashing of its tail, because that tail struck him across the chest and stretched him out on the seafloor. The scene lasted barely a few seconds. The shark returned, rolled over on its back, and was getting ready to cut the Indian in half when Captain Nemo, who was stationed beside me, suddenly stood up. Then he strode right toward the monster, dagger in hand, ready to fight it at close quarters. Just as it was about to snap up the poor fisherman, the man-eater saw its new adversary, repositioned itself on its belly, and headed swiftly toward him. I can see Captain Nemo's bearing to this day. Bracing himself, he waited for the fearsome man-eater with wonderful composure, and when the latter rushed at him, the captain leaped aside with prodigious quickness, avoided a collision, and sank his dagger into its belly. But that wasn't the end of the story. A dreadful battle was joined. The shark bellowed, so to speak. Blood was pouring into the waves from its wounds. The sea was dyed red, and through this opaque liquid I could see nothing else nothing else until the moment when through a rift in the clouds i saw the daring captain clinging to one of the animal's fins fighting the monster at close quarters belaboring his enemy's belly with stabs of the dagger yet unable to deliver the deciding thrust in other words a direct hit to the heart in its struggles the man-eater turned the watery mass so furiously its eddies threatened to knock me over I wanted to run to the captain's rescue, but I was transfixed with horror, unable to move. I stared wild-eyed. I saw the fight enter a new phase. The captain fell to the seafloor, toppled by the enormous mass weighing him down. Then the shark's jaws opened astoundingly wide, like a pair of industrial shears, and that would have been the finish of Captain Nemo had not Ned Land, quick as thought, rushed forward with his harpoon and driven its dreadful point into the shark's underside the waves were saturated with masses of blood the waters shook with the movements of the man-eater which thrashed about with indescribable fury ned land hadn't missed his target this was the monster's death rattle pierced to the heart it was struggling with dreadful spasms whose aftershocks knocked conseil off his feet meanwhile ned land pulled the captain clear uninjured the latter stood up went right to the indian quickly cut the rope binding the man to his stone took the fellow in his arms and with a vigorous kick of the heel rose to the surface of the sea the three of us followed him and a few moments later, miraculously safe, we reached the fisherman's longboat. Captain Nemo's first concern was to revive this unfortunate man. I wasn't sure he would succeed. I hoped so, since the poor devil hadn't been under very long. But that stroke from the shark's tail could have been his death blow. Fortunately, after vigorous massaging by Conseil and the captain, I saw the nearly drowned man regain consciousness little by little. He opened his eyes. How startled he must have felt! How frightened, even, at seeing four huge copper craniums leaning over him. And above all, what must he have thought when Captain Nemo pulled a bag of pearls from a pocket in his diving suit and placed it in the fisherman's hands? This magnificent benefaction from the man of the waters to the poor Indian from Ceylon was accepted by the latter with trembling hands. His bewildered eyes indicated that he didn't know to what superhuman creatures he owed both his life and his fortune. At the captain's signal, we returned to the bank of shellfish, 
and retracing our steps, we walked for half an hour until we encountered the anchor connecting the seafloor with the Nautilus's skiff. Back on board, the sailors helped divest us of our heavy copper carapaces. Captain Nemo's first words were spoken to the Canadian. Thank you, Mr. Land, he told him. Tit for tat, Captain, Ned Land replied. I owed it to you. The ghost of a smile glided across the captain's lips, and that was all. To the Nautilus, he said. The longboat flew over the waves. A few minutes later, we encountered the shark's corpse again, floating. From the black markings on the tips of its fins, I recognized the dreadful Squalus melanopterus from the seas of the East Indies, a variety in the species of sharks proper. It was more than twenty-five feet long. Its enormous mouth occupied a third of its body. It was an adult, as could be seen from the six rows of teeth forming an isosceles triangle in its upper jaw. Conseil looked at it with purely scientific fascination, and I'm sure he placed it, not without good reason, in the class of cartilaginous fish, order Chondopterygia, with fixed gills, family Salacia, genus Squalus. While I was contemplating this inert mass, suddenly a dozen of these voracious Melanoptera appeared around our longboat, but paying no attention to us, they pounced on the corpse and quarreled over every scrap of it. By 8.30 we were back on board the Nautilus. There I fell to thinking about the incidents that marked our excursion over the Manar oyster bank. Two impressions inevitably stood out. One concerned Captain Nemo's matchless bravery, the other his devotion to a human being, a representative of that race from which he had fled beneath the seas. In spite of everything, this strange man hadn't yet succeeded in completely stifling his heart. When I shared these impressions with him, he answered me in a tone touched with emotion. That Indian, Professor lives in the land of the oppressed and i am to this day and will be until my last breath a native of that same land end of part two chapter three part two chapter four of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne chapter four the red sea during the day of january twenty nine the island of ceylon disappeared below the horizon and at a speed of twenty miles per hour the nautilus glided into the labyrinthine channels that separate the maldive and lacadive islands it likewise hugged Kilton Island, a shore of madreporic origin discovered by Vasco da Gama in 1499, and one of the nineteen chief islands in the island group of the Lacadives, located between latitude 10 degrees and 14 degrees 30 minutes north, and between longitude 50 degrees 72 minutes and 69 degrees east. By then we had fared 16,220 miles, or 7,500 leagues from our starting point in the seas of Japan. The next day, January 30, when the Nautilus rose to the surface of the ocean, there was no more land in sight. Setting its course to the north-northwest, the ship headed toward the Gulf of Oman, carved out between Arabia and the Indian Peninsula, and providing access to the Persian Gulf. This was obviously a blind alley with no possible outlet. So where was Captain Nemo taking us? I was unable to say. Which didn't satisfy the Canadian, who that day asked me where we were going. We're going, Mr. Ned, where the captain's fancy takes us. His fancy, the Canadian replied, won't take us very far. The Persian Gulf has no outlet, and if we enter those waters, it won't be long before we return in our tracks. All right, we'll return, Mr. Land, and after the Persian Gulf, if the Nautilus wants to visit the Red Sea, the Strait of Bab el-Mandeb is still there to let us in. 
i don't have to tell you sir ned land replied that the red sea is just as landlocked as the gulf since the isthmus of suez hasn't been cut all the way through yet and even if it was a boat as secretive as ours wouldn't risk a canal intersected with locks so the red sea won't be our way back to europe either but i didn't say we'd return to europe what do you figure then i figure that after visiting these unusual waterways of arabia and egypt the nautilus will go back down to the indian ocean perhaps through mozambique channel perhaps off the mascarene islands and then make for the cape of good hope and once we're at the cape of good hope the canadian asked with typical persistence well then we'll enter that atlantic ocean with which we aren't yet familiar what's wrong ned my friend are you tired of this voyage under the seas are you bored with the constantly changing sight of these underwater wonders speaking for myself i'll be extremely distressed to see the end of a voyage so few men will ever have a chance to make but don't you realize professor aronnax the canadian replied that soon we'll have been imprisoned for three whole months aboard this nautilus no ned i didn't realize it i don't want to realize it and i don't keep track of every day and every hour but when will it be over in its appointed time meanwhile there's nothing we can do about it and our discussions are futile my gallant ned if you come and tell me a chance to escape is available to us then i'll discuss it with you but that isn't the case and in all honesty i don't think captain nemo ever ventures into european seas this short dialogue reveals that in my mania for the nautilus i was turning into the spitting image of its commander as for ned land he ended our talk in his best speechifying style that's all fine and dandy but in my humble opinion a life in jail is a life without joy for four days until february three the nautilus inspected the gulf of oman at various speeds and depths it seemed to be traveling at random as if hesitating over which course to follow but it never crossed the tropic of cancer after leaving this gulf we raised muscat for an instant the most important town in the country of oman i marveled at its strange appearance in the midst of the black rocks surrounding it against which the white of its houses and forts stood out sharply i spotted the rounded domes of its mosques the elegant tips of its minarets and its fresh leafy terraces but it was only a fleeting vision and the nautilus soon sank beneath the dark waves of these waterways then our ship went along at a distance of six miles from the arabic coasts of mara and hadramaut their undulating lines of mountains relieved by a few ancient ruins on february five we finally put into the gulf of aden a genuine funnel stuck into the neck of bab el mandeb and bottling these indian waters in the red sea on february six the nautilus cruised in sight of the city of aden perched on a promontory connected to the continent by a narrow isthmus a sort of inaccessible gibraltar whose fortifications the english rebuilt after capturing it in eighteen thirty nine i glimpsed the octagonal minarets of this town which used to be one of the wealthiest busiest commercial centers along this coast as the arab historian idrisi tells it i was convinced that when captain nemo reached this point he would back out again but i was mistaken and much to my surprise he did nothing of the sort the next day february seven we entered the strait of bab el mandeb whose name means gate of tears in the arabic language twenty miles wide it's only fifty-two kilometers long and with the nautilus launched at full speed clearing it was the work of barely an hour but i didn't see a thing not even Piram island where the british government built fortifications to strengthen aden's position there were many english and french steamers plowing this narrow passageway liners going from suez to bombay calcutta melbourne reunion island and mauritius far too much traffic for the nautilus to make an appearance on the surface so it wisely stayed in mid-water finally at noon we were plowing the waves of the red sea 
the red sea that great lake so famous in biblical traditions seldom replenished by rains fed by no important rivers continually drained by a high rate of evaporation its water level dropping a meter and a half every year if it were fully landlocked like a lake this odd gulf might dry up completely on this score it's inferior to its neighbors the caspian sea and the dead sea whose levels lower only to the point where their evaporation exactly equals the amounts of water they take to their hearts this red sea is two thousand six hundred kilometers long with an average width of two hundred and forty in the days of the ptolemies and the roman emperors it was a great commercial artery for the world and when its isthmus has been cut through it will completely regain that bygone importance that the suez railways have already brought back in part i would not even attempt to understand the whim that induced captain nemo to take us into this gulf but i wholeheartedly approved of the nautilus's entering it it adopted a medium pace sometimes staying on the surface sometimes diving to avoid some ship and so i could observe both the inside and top side of this highly unusual sea on february eighth as early as the first hours of daylight mocha appeared before us a town now in ruins whose walls would collapse at the mere sound of a cannon and which shelters a few leafy date trees here and there this once important city used to contain six public marketplaces plus twenty-six mosques and its walls protected by fourteen forts fashioned a three-kilometer girdle around it then the nautilus drew near the beaches of africa where the sea is considerably deeper there through the open panels and in a mid-water of crystal clarity our ship enabled us to study wonderful bushes of shining coral and huge chunks of rock wrapped in splendid green furs of algae and fucus what an indescribable sight and what a variety of settings and scenery where these reefs and volcanic islands leveled off by the libyan coast but soon the nautilus hugged the eastern shore where these tree forms appeared in all their glory this was off the coast of tehama and there such zoophyte displays not only flourished below sea level but they also fashioned picturesque networks that unreeled as high as ten fathoms above it the latter were more whimsical but less colorful than the former which kept their bloom thanks to the moist vitality of the waters how many delightful hours i spent in this way at the lounge window how many new specimens of underwater flora and fauna i marveled at beneath the light of our electric beacon mushroom-shaped fungus coral some slate-colored sea anemone including the species thalassianthus aster among others organ pipe coral arranged like flutes and just begging for a puff from the god pan shells unique to this sea that dwell in madreporic cavities and whose bases are twisted into squat spirals and finally a thousand samples of a polypary i hadn't observed until then the common sponge first division in the polyp group the class spongiaria has been created by scientists precisely for this unusual exhibit whose usefulness is beyond dispute the sponge is definitely not a plant as some naturalists still believe but an animal of the lowest order a polypary inferior even to coral its animal nature isn't in doubt and we can't accept even the views of the ancients who regarded it as halfway between plant and animal but i must say that naturalists are not in agreement on the structural mode of sponges for some it's a polypary and for others such as professor milne edwards it's a single solitary individual the class spongiaria contains about three hundred species that are encountered in a large number of seas and even in certain streams where they've been given the name freshwater sponges but their waters of choice are the red sea and the mediterranean near the greek islands or the coast of syria these waters witness the reproduction and growth of soft delicate bath sponges whose prices run as high as one hundred and fifty francs a piece the yellow sponge from syria the horn sponge from barbary etc but since i had no hope of studying these zoophytes in the seaports of the levant from which we were separated by the insuperable isthmus of suez i had to be content with observing them in the waters of the red sea 
so i called conseil to my side while at an average depth of eight to nine meters the nautilus slowly skimmed every beautiful rock on the easterly coast there sponges grew in every shape globular stalk-like leaf-like finger-like with reasonable accuracy they lived up to their nicknames of basket sponges chalice sponges distaff sponges elkhorn sponges lion's paws peacock's tails and neptune's gloves designations bestowed on them by fishermen more poetically inclined than scientists a gelatinous semi-fluid substance coated the fibrous tissue of these sponges and from this tissue there escaped a steady trickle of water that after carrying sustenance to each cell was being expelled by a contracting movement this jelly-like substance disappears when the polyp dies emitting ammonia as it rots finally nothing remains but the fibers either gelatinous or made of horn that constitute your household sponge which takes on a russet hue and is used for various tasks depending on its degree of elasticity permeability or resistance to saturation these polyparies were sticking to rocks shells of mollusks and even the stalks of water plants they adorned the smallest crevices some sprawling others standing or hanging like coral outgrowths i told conseil that sponges are fished up in two ways either by dragnet or by hand the latter method calls for the services of a diver but it's preferable because it spares the polypary's tissue leaving it with a much higher market value other zoophytes swarming near the sponges consisted chiefly of very elegant species of jellyfish mollusks were represented by varieties of squid that according to professor orbigny are unique to the red sea and reptiles by vergata turtles belonging to the genus chelonia which furnished our table with a dainty but wholesome dish as for fish they were numerous and often remarkable here are the ones that the nautilus's nets most frequently hauled on board rays including spotted rays that were oval in shape and brick red in color their bodies strewn with erratic blue speckles and identifiable by their jagged double stings silver-backed skates common sting rays with stippled tails butterfly rays that looked like huge two-meter cloaks flapping at mid-depth toothless guitar fish that were a type of cartilaginous fish closer to the shark trunk fish known as dromedaries that were one and a half feet long and had humps ending in backward curving stings serpentine moray eels with silver tails and bluish backs plus brown pectorals trimmed in gray piping a species of butterfish called the fiatola decked out in thin gold stripes and the three colors of the french flag montague blennies four decimeters long superb jacks handsomely embellished by seven black crosswise streaks with blue and yellow fins plus gold and silver scales snooks standard mullet with yellow heads parrotfish wrasse triggerfish gobies etc plus a thousand other fish common to the oceans we had already crossed on february nine the nautilus cruised in the widest part of the red sea measuring one hundred and ninety miles straight across from swaken on the west coast to cunifitta on the east coast at noon that day after our position fix captain nemo climbed onto the platform where i happened to be i vowed not to let him go below again without at least sounding him out on his future plans as soon as he saw me he came over graciously offered me a cigar and said to me well professor are you pleased with this red sea have you seen enough of its hidden wonders its fish and zoophytes its gardens of sponges and forests of coral have you glimpsed the towns built on its shores yes captain nemo i replied and the nautilus is wonderfully suited to this whole survey ah it's a clever boat yes sir clever daring and invulnerable it fears neither the red sea's dreadful storms nor its currents and reefs indeed i said this sea is mentioned as one of the worst and in the days of the ancients if i'm not mistaken it had an abominable reputation thoroughly abominable professor aronnax 
the greek and latin historians can find nothing to say in its favor and the greek geographer strabo adds that it's especially rough during the rainy season and the period of summer prevailing winds the arab idrisi referring to it by the name gulf of Khazoum, relates that ships perished in large numbers on its sandbanks and that no one risked navigating it by night this he claims is a sea subject to fearful hurricanes strewn with inhospitable islands and with nothing good to offer either on its surface or in its depths as a matter of fact the same views can also be found in arian agathochides and artemidorus one can easily see i answered that those historians didn't navigate aboard the nautilus indeed the captain replied with a smile and in this respect the moderns aren't much farther along than the ancients it took many centuries to discover the mechanical power of steam who knows whether we'll see a second nautilus within the next hundred years progress is slow professor aronnax it's true i replied your ship is a century ahead of its time perhaps several centuries it would be most unfortunate if such a secret were to die with its inventor captain nemo did not reply after some minutes of silence we were discussing he said the views of ancient historians on the dangers of navigating this red sea true i replied but weren't their fears exaggerated yes and no professor aronnax answered captain nemo who seemed to know his red sea by heart to a modern ship well rigged solidly constructed and in control of its course thanks to obedient steam some conditions are no longer hazardous that offered all sorts of dangers to the vessels of the ancients picture those early navigators venturing forth in sailboats built from planks lashed together with palm tree ropes caulked with powdered resin and coated with dogfish grease they didn't even have instruments for taking their bearings they went by guesswork in the midst of currents they barely knew under such conditions shipwrecks had to be numerous but nowadays steamers providing service between suez and the south seas have nothing to fear from the fury of this gulf despite the contrary winds of its monsoons their captains and passengers no longer prepare for departure with sacrifices to placate the gods and after returning they don't traipse in wreaths and gold ribbons to say thanks at the local temple agreed i said and steam seems to have killed off all gratitude in seamen's hearts but since you seem to have made a special study of this sea captain can you tell me how it got its name many explanations exist on the subject professor aronnax would you like to hear the views of one chronicler in the fourteenth century gladly this fanciful fellow claims the sea was given its name after the crossing of the israelites when the pharaoh perished in those waves that came together again at moses's command to mark that miraculous sequel the sea turned a red without equal thus no other course would do but to name it for its hue an artistic explanation captain nemo i replied but i'm unable to rest content with that so i'll ask you for your own personal views here they come to my thinking professor aronnax this red sea designation must be regarded as a translation of the hebrew word edrum and if the ancients gave it that name it was because of the unique color of its waters until now however i've seen only clear waves without any unique hue surely but as we move ahead to the far end of this gulf you'll note its odd appearance i recall seeing the bay of el tour completely red like a lake of blood and you attribute this color to the presence of microscopic algae yes it's a purplish mucilaginous substance produced by those tiny buds known by the name trichodesmia forty thousand of which are needed to occupy the space of one square millimeter perhaps you'll encounter them when we reach el tour hence captain nemo this isn't the first time you've gone through the red sea aboard the nautilus no sir 
then, since you've already mentioned the crossing of the Israelites and the catastrophe that befell the Egyptians, I would ask if you've ever discovered any traces under the waters of that great historic event. No, Professor, and for an excellent reason. What's that? It's because the same locality where Moses crossed with all his people is now so clogged with sand, camels can barely get their legs wet. You can understand that my Nautilus wouldn't have enough water for itself. And that locality is? I asked. That locality lies a little above Suez, in a sound that used to form a deep estuary when the Red Sea stretched as far as the Bitter Lakes. Now, whether or not their crossing was literally miraculous, the Israelites did cross there in returning to the Promised Land, and the Pharaoh's army did perish at precisely that locality. So I think that excavating those sands would bring to light a great many weapons and tools of Egyptian origin. Obviously, I replied, and for the sake of archaeology, let's hope that sooner or later such excavations do take place, once new towns are settled on the isthmus after the Suez Canal has been cut through, a canal, by the way, of little use to a ship such as the Nautilus. Surely, but of great use to the world at large, Captain Nemo said. The ancients well understood the usefulness to commerce of connecting the Red Sea with the Mediterranean, but they never dreamed of cutting a canal between the two, and instead they picked the Nile as their link. If we can trust tradition, it was probably Egypt's King Sesostris who started digging the canal needed to join the Nile with the Red Sea. What's certain is that in 615 B.C., King Necho II was hard at work on a canal that was fed by Nile water and ran through the Egyptian plains opposite Arabia. This canal could be traveled in four days, and it was so wide, two triple-tiered galleys could pass through it abreast. Its construction was continued by Darius the Great, son of Hystaspes, and probably completed by King Ptolemy II. Strabo saw it used for shipping, but the weakness of its slope between its starting point near Bubastis and the Red Sea left it navigable only a few months out of the year. This canal served commerce until the century of Rome's Antonine emperors. It was then abandoned and covered with sand, subsequently reinstated by Arabia's Caliph Omar I, and finally filled in for good in 761 or 762 A.D., by Caliph al-Mansur, in an effort to prevent supplies from reaching Mohammed ibn Abdullah, who had rebelled against him. During his Egyptian campaign, your general Napoleon Bonaparte discovered traces of this old canal in the Suez Desert, and when the tide caught him by surprise, he well nigh perished just a few hours before rejoining his regiment at Hajaroth, the very place where Moses had pitched camp 3,300 years before him. Well, Captain, what the ancients hesitated to undertake, Mr. Jeliseps is now finishing up. His joining of these two seas will shorten the route from Cadiz to the East Indies by 9,000 kilometers, and he'll soon change Africa into an immense island. Yes, Professor Aranax, and you have every right to be proud of your fellow countrymen. Such a man brings a nation more honor than the greatest commanders. Like so many others, he began with difficulties and setbacks, but he triumphed because he has the volunteer spirit. And it's sad to think that this deed, which should have been an international deed, which would have ensured that any administration went down in history, will succeed only through the efforts of one man. So all hail to Mr. Deliceps. Yes, all hail to that great French citizen, I replied, quite startled by how emphatically Captain Nemo had just spoken. Unfortunately, he went on, I can't take you through that Suez Canal, but the day after tomorrow you'll be able to see the long jetties of Port Said when we're in the Mediterranean. In the Mediterranean? I exclaimed. Yes, Professor. Does that amaze you? What amazes me is thinking we'll be there the day after tomorrow. Oh, really? Yes, Captain, although since I've been aboard your vessel, I should have formed the habit of not being amazed by anything. But what is it that startles you? 
the thought of how hideously fast the nautilus will need to go if it's to double the cape of good hope circle around africa and lie in the open mediterranean by the day after tomorrow and who says it will circle africa professor what's this talk about doubling the cape of good hope but unless the nautilus navigates on dry land and crosses over the isthmus or under it professor aronnax under it surely captain nemo replied serenely under that tongue of land nature long ago made what man today is making on its surface what there's a passageway yes an underground passageway that i've named the arabian tunnel it starts below suez and leads to the bay of pelusium but isn't that isthmus only composed of quicksand to a certain depth but at merely fifty meters one encounters a firm foundation of rock and it's by luck that you discovered this passageway i asked more and more startled luck plus logic professor and logic even more than luck captain i hear you but i can't believe my ears oh sir the old saying still holds good aris abon et non audient editor's note latin they have ears but hear not not only does this passageway exist but i've taken advantage of it on several occasions without it i wouldn't have ventured today into such a blind alley as the red sea is it indiscreet to ask how you discovered this tunnel sir the captain answered me there can be no secrets between men who will never leave each other i ignored this innuendo and waited for captain nemo's explanation professor he told me the simple logic of the naturalist led me to discover this passageway and i alone am familiar with it i'd noted that in the red sea and the mediterranean there exist a number of absolutely identical species of fish eels butterfish greenfish bass jewelfish flying fish certain of this fact i wondered if there weren't a connection between the two seas if there were its underground current had to go from the red sea to the mediterranean simply because of their difference in level so i caught a large number of fish in the vicinity of suez i slipped copper rings around their tails and tossed them back into the sea a few months later off the coast of syria i recaptured a few specimens of my fish adorned with their telltale rings so this proved to me that some connection existed between the two seas i searched for it with my nautilus i discovered it i ventured into it and soon professor you also will have cleared my arabic tunnel end of part two chapter four part two chapter five of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne chapter five arabian tunnel the same day i reported to conseil and ned land that part of the foregoing conversation directly concerning them when i told them we would be lying in mediterranean waters within two days conseil clapped his hands but the canadian shrugged his shoulders an underwater tunnel he exclaimed a connection between two seas who ever heard of such malarkey ned my friend conseil replied had you ever heard of the nautilus no yet here it is so don't shrug your shoulders so blithely and don't discount something with the feeble excuse that you've never heard of it we'll soon see ned land shot back shaking his head after all i'd like nothing better than to believe in your captain's little passageway and may heaven grant it really does take us to the mediterranean the same evening at latitude twenty one degrees thirty minutes north the nautilus was afloat on the surface of the sea and drawing nearer to the arab coast i spotted jidda 
an important financial center for egypt, syria, turkey, and the east indies. I could distinguish with reasonable clarity the overall effect of its buildings, the ships made fast along its wharves, and those bigger vessels whose draft of water required them to drop anchor at the port's offshore mooring. The sun, fairly low on the horizon, struck full force on the houses in this town, accenting their whiteness. Outside the city limits, some wood or reed huts indicated the quarter where the Bedouins lived. Soon, Jidda faded into the shadows of evening, and the Nautilus went back beneath the mildly phosphorescent waters. The next day, February 10, several ships appeared, running on our opposite tack. The Nautilus resumed its underwater navigating, but at the moment of our noon sights, the sea was deserted and the ship rose again to its waterline. With Ned and Conseil, I went to sit on the platform. The coast to the east looked like a slightly blurred mass in a damp fog. Leaning against the sides of the skiff, we were chatting of one thing and another when Ned Land stretched his hand toward a point in the water, saying to me, See anything out there, Professor? No, Ned, I replied, but you know I don't have your eyes. Take a good look, Ned went on. There, ahead to starboard, almost level with the beacon. Don't you see a mass that seems to be moving around? Right, I said, after observing carefully. I can make out something like a long, blackish object on the surface of the water. A second nautilus? Conseil said. No, the Canadian replied. Unless I'm badly mistaken, that's some marine animal. Are there whales in the Red Sea? Conseil asked. Yes, my boy, I replied. They're sometimes found here. That's no whale, continued Ned Land, whose eyes never strayed from the object they had sighted. We're old chums, whales and I, and I couldn't mistake their little ways. Let's wait and see, Conseil said. The Nautilus is heading that direction, and we'll soon know what we're in for. In fact, that blackish object was soon only a mile away from us. It looked like a huge reef stranded in mid-ocean. What was it? I still couldn't make up my mind. Oh, it's moving off. It's diving, Ned Land exclaimed. Damnation! What can that animal be? It doesn't have a forked tail like baleen whales or sperm whales, and its fins look like sawed-off limbs. But in that case, I put in. Good Lord, the Canadian went on. It's rolled over on its back, and it's raising its breasts in the air. It's a siren, Conseil exclaimed. With all due respect to Master, it's an actual mermaid. That word siren put me back on track, and I realized that the animal belonged to the order Sirenia, marine creatures that legends have turned into mermaids, half woman, half fish. No, I told Conseil, that's no mermaid. It's an unusual creature of which only a few specimens are left in the Red Sea. That's a dugong. Order Sirenia, group Pisciforma, subclass Monodelphia, Class Mammalia, Branch Vertebrata, Conseil replied. And when Conseil has spoken, there is nothing else to be said. Meanwhile, Ned Land kept staring. His eyes were gleaming with desire at the sight of that animal. His hands were ready to hurl a harpoon. You would have thought he was waiting for the right moment to jump overboard and attack the creature in its own element. Oh, sir, he told me in a voice trembling with excitement, I've never killed anything like that. His whole being was concentrated in this last word. Just then, Captain Nemo appeared on the platform. He spotted the dugong. He understood the Canadian's frame of mind and addressed him directly. If you held a harpoon, Mr. Land, wouldn't your hands be itching to put it to work? Positively, sir. And just for one day... Would it displease you to return to your fisherman's trade and add this cetacean to the list of those you've already hunted down? It wouldn't displease me one bit. All right, you can try your luck. Thank you, sir, Ned Land replied, his eyes ablaze. Only, 
the captain went on i urge you to aim carefully at this animal in your own personal interest is the dugong dangerous to attack i asked despite the canadian's shrug of the shoulders yes sometimes the captain replied these animals have been known to turn on their assailants and capsize their longboats but with mr land that danger isn't to be feared his eye is sharp his arm is sure if i recommend that he aim carefully at this dugong it's because the animal is justly regarded as fine game and i know mr land doesn't despise a choice morsel aha the canadian put in this beast offers the added luxury of being good to eat yes mr land its flesh is actual red meat highly prized and is set aside throughout malaysia for the tables of aristocrats accordingly this excellent animal has been hunted so bloodthirstily that like its manatee relatives it has become more and more scarce in that case captain conseil said in all seriousness on the off chance that this creature might be the last of its line wouldn't it be advisable to spare its life in the interests of science maybe the canadian answered it would be better to hunt it down in the interests of meal time then proceed mr land captain nemo replied just then as mute and emotionless as ever seven crewmen climbed onto the platform one carried a harpoon and line similar to those used in whale fishing its deck paneling opened the skiff was wrenched from its socket and launched to sea six rowers sat on the thwarts and the coxswain took the tiller ned conseil and i found seats in the stern aren't you coming captain i asked no sir but i wish you happy hunting the skiff pulled clear and carried off by its six oars it headed swiftly toward the dugong which by then was floating two miles from the nautilus arriving within a few cable lengths of the cetacean our longboat slowed down and the skulls dipped noiselessly into the tranquil waters harpoon in hand ned land went to take his stand in the skiff's bow harpoons used for hunting whales are usually attached to a very long rope that pays out quickly when the wounded animal drags it with him but this rope measured no more than about ten fathoms and its end had simply been fastened to a small barrel that while floating would indicate the dugong's movements beneath the waters i stood up and could clearly observe the canadian's adversary this dugong which also boasts the name halicor closely resembled a manatee its oblong body ended in a very long caudal fin and its lateral fins in actual fingers it differs from the manatee in that its upper jaw is armed with two long pointed teeth that form diverging tusks on either side this dugong that ned land was preparing to attack was of colossal dimensions easily exceeding seven meters in length it didn't stir and seemed to be sleeping on the surface of the waves a circumstance that should have made it easier to capture the skiff approached cautiously to within three fathoms of the animal the oars hung suspended over their rowlocks i was crouching his body leaning slightly back ned land brandished his harpoon with expert hands suddenly a hissing sound was audible and the dugong disappeared although the harpoon had been forcefully hurled it apparently had hit only water damn nation exclaimed the furious canadian i missed it no i said the animal's wounded there's its blood but your weapon didn't stick in its body my harpoon get my harpoon ned land exclaimed the sailors went back to their sculling and the coxswain steered the longboat toward the floating barrel we fished up the harpoon and the skiff started off in pursuit of the animal the latter returned from time to time to breathe at the surface of the sea its wound hadn't weakened it because it went with tremendous speed driven by energetic arms the longboat flew on its trail several times we got within a few fathoms of it and the canadian hovered in readiness to strike but then the dugong would steal away with a sudden dive and it proved impossible to overtake the beast
i'll let you assess the degree of anger consuming our impatient ned land he hurled at the hapless animal the most potent swear words in the english language for my part i was simply distressed to see this dugong outwit our every scheme we chased it unflaggingly for a full hour and i'd begun to think it would prove too difficult to capture when the animal got the untimely idea of taking revenge on us a notion it would soon have cause to regret it wheeled on the skiff to assault us in its turn this maneuver did not escape the canadian watch out he said the coxswain pronounced a few words in his bizarre language and no doubt he alerted his men to keep on their guard arriving within twenty feet of the skiff the dugong stopped sharply sniffing the air with its huge nostrils pierced not at the tip of its muzzle but on its top side then it gathered itself and sprang at us the skiff couldn't avoid the collision half overturned it shipped a ton or two of water that we had to bail out but thanks to our skillful coxswain we were fouled on the bias rather than broadside so we didn't capsize clinging to the stem post ned land thrust his harpoon again and again into the gigantic animal which embedded its teeth in our gunwale and lifted the longboat out of the water as a lion would lift a deer we were thrown on top of each other and i have no idea how the venture would have ended had not the canadian still thirsting for the beast's blood finally pierced it to the heart i heard its teeth grind on sheet iron and the dugong disappeared taking our harpoon along with it but the barrel soon popped up on the surface and a few moments later the animal's body appeared and rolled over on its back our skiff rejoined it took it in tow and headed to the nautilus it took pulleys of great strength to hoist this dugong onto the platform the beast weighed five thousand kilograms it was carved up in sight of the canadian who remained to watch every detail of the operation at dinner the same day my steward served me some slices of this flesh skillfully dressed by the ship's cook i found it excellent even better than veal if not beef the next morning february eleventh the nautilus's pantry was enriched by more dainty game a covey of terns alighted on the nautilus they were a species of sterna nilotica unique to egypt beak black head gray and stippled eyes surrounded by white dots back wings and tail grayish belly and throat white feet red also caught were a couple dozen nile duck superior tasting wild fowl whose neck and crown of the head are white speckled with black by then the nautilus had reduced speed it moved ahead at a saunter so to speak i observed that the red sea's water was becoming less salty the closer we got to suez near five o'clock in the afternoon we sighted cape ras mohammed to the north this cape forms the tip of arabia petraea which lies between the gulf of suez and the gulf of aqaba the nautilus entered the strait of jubal which leads to the gulf of suez I could clearly make out a high mountain crowning Ras Muhammad between the two gulfs. It was Mount Horeb, that biblical Mount Sinai on whose summit Moses met God face to face, that summit the mind's eye always pictures as wreathed in lightning. At six o'clock, sometimes afloat and sometimes submerged, the Nautilus passed well out from El Tour, which sat at the far end of a bay whose waters seemed to be dyed red, as Captain Nemo had already mentioned. Then night fell in the midst of a heavy silence, occasionally broken by the calls of pelicans and nocturnal birds, by the sound of surf chafing against rocks, or by the distant moan of a steamer churning the waves of the gulf with noisy blades. From eight o'clock to nine o'clock, the nautilus stayed a few meters beneath the waters according to my calculations we had to be quite close to suez through the panels in the lounge i spotted rocky bottoms brightly lit by our electric rays it seemed to me that the strait was getting narrower and narrower at nine fifteen when our boat returned to the surface i climbed onto the platform i was quite impatient to clear captain nemo's tunnel couldn't sit still and wanted to breathe the fresh night air soon in the shadows i spotted a pale signal light glimmering a mile away half discolored by mist 
a floating lighthouse said someone next to me i turned and discovered the captain that's the floating signal light of suez he went on it won't be long before we reach the entrance to the tunnel it can't be very easy to enter it no sir accordingly i'm in the habit of staying in the pilot house and directing maneuvers myself and now if you'll kindly go below professor aronnax the nautilus is about to sink beneath the waves and it will only return to the surface after we've cleared the arabian tunnel i followed captain nemo the hatch closed the ballast tanks filled with water and the submersible sank some ten meters down just as i was about to repair to my stateroom the captain stopped me professor he said to me would you like to go with me to the wheelhouse i was afraid to ask i replied come along then this way and you'll learn the full story about this combination underwater and underground navigating captain nemo led me to the central companionway in mid-stair he opened a door went along the upper gangways and arrived at the wheelhouse which as you know stands at one end of the platform it was a cabin measuring six feet square and closely resembling those occupied by the helmsmen of steamboats on the mississippi or hudson rivers in the center stood an upright wheel geared to rudder cables running to the nautilus's stern set in the cabin walls were four deadlights windows of biconvex glass that enabled the man at the helm to see in every direction the cabin was dark but my eyes soon grew accustomed to its darkness and i saw the pilot a muscular man whose hands rested on the pegs of the wheel outside the sea was brightly lit by the beacon shining behind the cabin at the other end of the platform now captain nemo said let's look for our passageway electric wires linked the pilot house with the engine room and from this cabin the captain could simultaneously signal heading and speed to his nautilus he pressed a metal button and at once the propeller slowed down significantly i stared in silence at the high sheer wall we were skirting just then the firm base of the sandy mountains on the coast for an hour we went along it in this fashion staying only a few meters away captain nemo never took his eyes off the two concentric circles of the compass hanging in the cabin at a mere gesture from him the helmsman would instantly change the nautilus's heading standing by the port deadlight i spotted magnificent coral substructures zoophytes algae and crustaceans with enormous quivering claws that stretched forth from crevices in the rock at ten fifteen captain nemo himself took the helm dark and deep a wide gallery opened ahead of us the nautilus was brazenly swallowed up strange rumblings were audible along our sides it was the water of the red sea hurled toward the mediterranean by the tunnel's slope our engines tried to offer resistance by churning the waves with propeller in reverse but the nautilus went with the torrent as swift as an arrow along the narrow walls of this passageway i saw only brilliant streaks hard lines fiery furrows all scrawled by our speeding electric light with my hand i tried to curb the pounding of my heart at ten thirty five captain nemo left the steering wheel and turned to me the mediterranean he told me in less than twenty minutes swept along by the torrent the Nautilus had just cleared the Isthmus of Suez. End of Part 2, Chapter 5。Part 2, Chapter 6 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea。An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne。Chapter 6 。The Greek Islands。at sunrise the next morning february twelve the nautilus rose to the surface of the waves i rushed onto the platform the hazy silhouette of pelusium was outlined three miles to the south a torrent had carried us from one sea to the other 
but although that tunnel was easy to descend going back up must have been impossible near seven o'clock ned and conseil joined me those two inseparable companions had slept serenely utterly unaware of the nautilus's feet well mr naturalist the canadian asked in a gently mocking tone and how about that mediterranean we're floating on its surface ned my friend what conseil put in last night yes last night in a matter of minutes we cleared that insuperable isthmus i don't believe a word of it the canadian replied and you're in the wrong mr land i went on that flat coastline curving southward is the coast of egypt tell it to the marines sir answered the stubborn canadian but if master says so conseil told him then so be it what's more ned i said captain nemo himself did the honors in his tunnel and i stood beside him in the pilot house while he steered the nautilus through that narrow passageway you hear ned conseil said and you ned who have such good eyes i added you can spot the jetties of port said stretching out to sea the canadian looked carefully correct he said you're right professor and your captain's a superman we're in the mediterranean fine so now let's have a chat about our little doings if you please but in such a way that nobody overhears i could easily see what the canadian was driving at in any event i thought it best to let him have his chat and we all three went to sit next to the beacon where we were less exposed to the damp spray from the billows now ned we're all ears i said what have you to tell us what i've got to tell you is very simple the canadian replied we're in europe and before captain nemo's whims take us deep into the polar seas or back to oceania i say we should leave this nautilus i confess that such discussions with the canadian always baffled me i didn't want to restrict my companion's freedom in any way and yet i had no desire to leave captain nemo thanks to him and his submersible i was finishing my undersea research by the day and i was rewriting my book on the great ocean depths in the midst of its very element would i ever again have such an opportunity to observe the ocean's wonders absolutely not so i couldn't entertain this idea of leaving the nautilus before completing our course of inquiry ned my friend i said answer me honestly are you bored with this ship are you sorry that fate has cast you into captain nemo's hands the canadian paused for a short while before replying then crossing his arms honestly he said i'm not sorry about this voyage under the seas i'll be glad to have done it but in order to have done it it has to finish that's my feeling it will finish ned where and when where i don't know when i can't say or rather i suppose it will be over when these seas have nothing more to teach us everything that begins in this world must inevitably come to an end i think as master does conseil replied and it's extremely possible that after crossing every sea on the globe captain nemo will bid the three of us a fond farewell bid us a fond farewell the canadian exclaimed you mean beat us to a fairly well let's not exaggerate mr land i went on we have nothing to fear from the captain but neither do i share conseil's views we are privy to the nautilus's secrets and i don't expect that its commander just to set us free will meekly stand by while we spread those secrets all over the world but in that case what do you expect the canadian asked that we'll encounter advantageous conditions for escaping just as readily in six months as now great scott ned land put in and where if you please will we be in six months mr naturalist perhaps here perhaps in china you know how quickly the nautilus moves it crosses oceans like swallows cross the air or express trains continents it doesn't fear heavily traveled seas who can say it won't hug the coasts of france england or america where an escape attempt could be carried out just as effectively as here 
professor aronnax the canadian replied your arguments are rotten to the core you talk way off in the future we'll be here we'll be there me i'm talking about right now we are here and we must take advantage of it i was hard pressed by ned land's common sense and i felt myself losing ground i no longer knew what arguments to put forward on my behalf sir ned went on let's suppose that by some impossibility captain nemo offered your freedom to you this very day would you accept i don't know i replied and suppose he adds that this offer he's making you today won't ever be repeated then would you accept i did not reply and what thinks our friend conseil ned land asked your friend conseil the fine lad replied serenely has nothing to say for himself he's a completely disinterested party on this question like his master like his comrade ned he's a bachelor neither wife parents nor children are waiting for him back home he's in master's employ he thinks like master he speaks like master and much to his regret he can't be counted on to form a majority only two persons face each other here master on one side ned land on the other that said your friend conseil is listening and he's ready to keep score i couldn't help smiling as conseil wiped himself out of existence deep down the canadian must have been overjoyed at not having to contend with him then sir ned land said since conseil is no more we'll have this discussion between just the two of us i've talked you've listened what's your reply it was obvious that the matter had to be settled and evasions were distasteful to me ned my friend i said here's my reply you have right on your side and my arguments can't stand up to yours it will never do to count on captain nemo's benevolence the most ordinary good sense would forbid him to set us free on the other hand good sense decrees that we take advantage of our first opportunity to leave the nautilus fine professor aronnax that's wisely said but one proviso i said just one the opportunity must be the real thing our first attempt to escape must succeed because if it misfires we won't get a second chance and captain nemo will never forgive us that's also well put the canadian replied but your proviso applies to any escape attempt whether it happens in two years or two days so this is still the question if a promising opportunity comes up we have to grab it agreed and now ned will you tell me what you mean by a promising opportunity one that leads the nautilus on a cloudy night within a short distance of some european coast and you'll try to get away by swimming yes if we're close enough to shore and the ships afloat on the surface no if we're well out and the ships navigating under the waters and in that event in that event i'll try to get hold of the skiff i know how to handle it we'll stick ourselves inside undo the bolts and rise to the surface without the helmsman in the bows seeing a thing fine ned stay on the lookout for such an opportunity but don't forget one slip up will finish us i won't forget sir and now ned would you like to know my overall thinking on your plan gladly professor aronnax well then i think and i don't mean i hope that your promising opportunity won't ever arise why not because captain nemo recognizes that we haven't given up all hope of recovering our freedom and he'll keep on his guard above all in seas within sight of the coasts of europe i'm of master's opinion conseil said we'll soon see ned land replied shaking his head with a determined expression and now ned land i added let's leave it at that not another word on any of this the day you're ready alert us and we're with you i turn it all over to you that's how we ended this conversation which later was to have such serious consequences at first i must say events seemed to confirm my forecasts much to the canadian's despair did captain nemo view us with distrust in these heavily traveled seas or did he simply want to hide from the sight of those ships of every nation that plowed the mediterranean i have no idea but usually he stayed in midwater and well out from any coast 
either the nautilus surfaced only enough to let its pilot house emerge or it slipped away to the lower depths although between the greek islands and asia minor we didn't find bottom even at two thousand meters down accordingly i became aware of the isle of carpathos one of the sporides islands only when captain nemo placed his finger over a spot on the world map and quoted me this verse from virgil esta in carpathio neptuni gorgitavats carilius proteus editor's note latin for there in king neptune's domain by carpathos his spokesman is azure hued proteus it was indeed that bygone abode of proteus the old shepherd of king neptune's flocks an island located between rhodes and crete which greeks now call carpathos italians scarpanto through the lounge window i could only see its granite bedrock the next day february fourteen i decided to spend a few hours studying the fish of this island group but for whatever reason the panels remained hermetically sealed after determining the nautilus's heading i noted that it was proceeding toward the ancient island of crete also called candia at the time i had shipped aboard the abraham lincoln this whole island was in rebellion against its tyrannical rulers the ottoman empire of turkey but since then i had absolutely no idea what happened to this revolution and captain nemo deprived of all contact with the shore was hardly the man to keep me informed so i didn't allude to this event when that evening i chanced to be alone with the captain in the lounge besides he seemed silent and preoccupied then contrary to custom he ordered that both panels in the lounge be opened and going from the one to the other he carefully observed the watery mass for what purpose i hadn't a guess and for my part i spent my time studying the fish that passed before my eyes among others i noted that sand goby mentioned by aristotle and commonly known by the name sea loach which is encountered exclusively in the salty waters next to the nile delta near them some semi-phosphorescent red porgy rolled by a variety of gilthead that the egyptians ranked among their sacred animals lauding them in religious ceremonies when their arrival in the river's waters announced the fertile flood season i also noticed some wrasses known as the tapiro three decimeters long bony fish with transparent scales whose bluish-gray color is mixed with red spots they are enthusiastic eaters of marine vegetables which gives them an exquisite flavor hence these depira were much in demand by the epicures of ancient rome and their entrails were dressed with brains of peacock tongue of flamingo and testes of moray to make that divine platter that so enraptured the roman emperor vitilius another resident of these seas caught my attention and revived all my memories of antiquity this was the remora which travels attached to the bellies of sharks as the ancients tell it when these little fish cling to the undersides of a ship they can bring it to a halt and by so impeding mark antony's vessel during the battle of actium one of them facilitated the victory of augustus caesar from such slender threads hang the destinies of nations i also observed some wonderful snappers belonging to the order lutianida sacred fish for the greeks who claimed they could drive off sea monsters from the waters they frequent their greek name antheus means flower and they live up to it in the play of their colors and in those fleeting reflections that turn their dorsal fins into watered silk their hues are confined to a gamut of reds from the pallor of pink to the glow of ruby i couldn't take my eyes off these marine wonders when i was suddenly jolted by an unexpected apparition in the midst of the waters a man appeared a diver carrying a little leather bag at his belt it was no corpse lost in the waves it was a living man swimming vigorously sometimes disappearing to breathe at the surface then instantly diving again i turned to captain nemo and in an agitated voice a man a castaway i exclaimed we must rescue him at all cost the captain didn't reply but went to lean against the window the man drew near and gluing his face to the panel he stared at us 
to my deep astonishment captain nemo gave him a signal the diver answered with his hand immediately swam up to the surface of the sea and didn't reappear don't be alarmed the captain told me that's nicholas from cape matapan nicknamed il pesce editor's note italian for the fish he's well known throughout the cyclades islands a bold diver water is his true element and he lives in the sea more than on shore going constantly from one island to another even to crete you know him captain why not professor aronnax this said captain nemo went to a cabinet standing near the lounge's left panel next to this cabinet i saw a chest bound with hoops of iron its lid bearing a copper plaque that displayed the nautilus's monogram with its motto mobilis in mobili just then ignoring my presence the captain opened this cabinet a sort of safe that contained a large number of ingots they were gold ingots and they represented an enormous sum of money where had this precious metal come from how had the captain amassed this gold and what was he about to do with it i didn't pronounce a word i gaped captain nemo took out the ingots one by one and arranged them methodically inside the chest filling it to the top at which point i estimate that it held more than one thousand kilograms of gold in other words close to five million francs after securely fastening the chest captain nemo wrote an address on its lid in characters that must have been modern greek this done the captain pressed a button whose wiring was in communication with the crew's quarters four men appeared and not without difficulty pushed the chest out of the lounge then i heard them hoist it up the iron companionway by means of pulleys just then captain nemo turned to me you were saying professor he asked me i wasn't saying a thing captain then sir with your permission i'll bid you good evening and with that captain nemo left the lounge i re-entered my stateroom very puzzled as you can imagine i tried in vain to fall asleep i kept searching for a relationship between the appearance of the diver and that chest filled with gold soon from certain rolling and pitching movements i sensed that the nautilus had left the lower strata and was back on the surface of the water then i heard the sound of footsteps on the platform i realized that the skiff was being detached and launched to sea for an instant it bumped the nautilus's side then all sounds ceased two hours later the same noises the same comings and goings were repeated hoisted on board the longboat was readjusted into its socket and the nautilus plunged back beneath the waves so those millions had been delivered to their address at what spot on the continent who was the recipient of captain nemo's gold the next day i related the night's events to conseil and the canadian events that had aroused my curiosity to a fever pitch my companions were as startled as i was but where does he get those millions ned land asked to this no reply was possible after breakfast i made my way to the lounge and went about my work i wrote up my notes until five o'clock in the afternoon just then was it due to some personal indisposition i felt extremely hot and had to take off my jacket made of fan muscle fabric a perplexing circumstance because we weren't in the low latitudes and besides once the nautilus was submerged it shouldn't be subject to any rise in temperature i looked at the pressure gauge it marked a depth of 60 feet a depth beyond the reach of atmospheric heat i kept on working but the temperature rose to the point of becoming unbearable could there be a fire on board i wondered i was about to leave the lounge when captain nemo entered he approached the thermometer consulted it and turned to me 42 degrees centigrade he said i've detected as much captain i replied and if it gets even slightly hotter we won't be able to stand it oh professor it won't get any hotter unless we want it to you mean you can control this heat no but i can back away from the fireplace producing it so it's outside 
surely we're cruising in a current of boiling water it can't be i exclaimed look the panels had opened and i could see a completely white sea around the nautilus steaming sulfurous fumes uncoiled in the midst of waves bubbling like water in a boiler i leaned my hand against one of the windows but the heat was so great i had to snatch it back where are we i asked near the island of santorini professor the captain answered me and right in the channel that separates the volcanic islets of nia kamini and palia kamini i wanted to offer you the unusual sight of an underwater eruption i thought i said that the formation of such new islands had come to an end nothing ever comes to an end in these volcanic waterways captain nemo replied and thanks to its underground fires our globe is continually under construction in these regions according to the latin historians cassiodorus and pliny by the year 19 of the christian era a new island the divine thera had already appeared in the very place these islets have more recently formed then thera sank under the waves only to rise and sink once more in the year 69 a.d from that day to this such plutonic construction work has been in abeyance but on february third eighteen sixty six a new islet named george island emerged in the midst of sulfurous steam near nia kamina and was fused to it on the sixth of the same month seven days later on february thirteenth the islet of aphraisa appeared leaving a ten meter channel between itself and nia kamina i was in these seas when that phenomenon occurred and i was able to observe its every phase the islet of aphraisa was circular in shape measuring three hundred feet in diameter and thirty feet in height it was made of black glassy lava mixed with bits of feldspar finally on march ten a smaller islet called rica appeared next to nia kamina and since then these three islets have fused to form one single self-same island what about this channel we're in right now i asked here it is captain nemo replied showing me a chart of the greek islands you observe that i've entered the new islets in their place but will this channel fill up one day very likely professor aronnax because since 1866 eight little lava islets have surged up in front of the port of st nicholas on palia camina so it's obvious that nia and palia will join in days to come in the middle of the pacific tiny infusoria build continents but here they're built by volcanic phenomena look sir look at the construction work going on under these waves i returned to the window the nautilus was no longer moving the heat had become unbearable from the white it had recently been the sea was turning red a coloration caused by the presence of iron salts although the lounge was hermetically sealed it was filling with an intolerable stink of sulphur and i could see scarlet flames of such brightness they overpowered our electric light i was swimming in perspiration i was stifling i was about to be cooked yes i felt myself cooking in actual fact we can't stay here any longer in this boiling water i told the captain no it wouldn't be advisable replied nemo the emotionless he gave an order the nautilus tacked about and retreated from this furnace it couldn't brave with impunity a quarter of an hour later we were breathing fresh air on the surface of the waves it then occurred to me that if ned had chosen these waterways for our escape attempt we wouldn't have come out alive from this sea of fire the next day february sixteen we left this basin which tallies depths of three thousand meters between rhodes and alexandria and passing well out from cerigo island after doubling cape matapan the nautilus left the greek islands behind End of Part 2, Chapter 6
Part 2, Chapter 7 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. Chapter 7, The Mediterranean in 48 Hours. The Mediterranean, your ideal blue sea, to Greeks simply the sea, to Hebrews the great sea, to Romans Mare Nostrum, editor's note, Latin for our sea, bordered by orange trees, aloes, cactus, and maritime pine trees, perfumed with the scent of myrtle, framed by rugged mountains, saturated with clean, transparent air, but continuously under construction by fires in the earth, this sea is a genuine battlefield where Neptune and Pluto still struggle for world domination. Here on these beaches and waters, says the French historian Michelet, a man is revived by one of the most invigorating climates in the world. But as beautiful as it was, I could get only a quick look at this basin whose surface area comprises two million square kilometers. Even Captain Nemo's personal insights were denied me, because that mystifying individual didn't appear one single time during our high-speed crossing. I estimate that the Nautilus covered a track of some 600 leagues under the waves of this sea. And this voyage was accomplished in just 24 hours, times two. Departing from the waterways of Greece on the morning of February 16, we cleared the Strait of Gibraltar by sunrise on the 18th. It was obvious to me that this Mediterranean, pinned in the middle of those shores he wanted to avoid, gave Captain Nemo no pleasure. Its waves and breezes brought back too many memories, if not too many regrets. Here he no longer had the ease of movement and freedom of maneuver that the oceans allowed him, and the Nautilus felt cramped so close to the coasts of both Africa and Europe. Accordingly, our speed was 25 miles, that is, 12 four-kilometer leagues per hour. Needless to say, Ned Land had to give up his escape plans, much to his distress. Swept along at the rate of 12 to 13 meters per second, he could barely make use of the skiff. Leaving the Nautilus under these conditions would have been like jumping off a train racing at this speed, a rash move if there ever was one. Moreover, to renew our air supply, the submersible rose to the surface of the waves only at night, and relying solely on compass and log, it steered by dead reckoning. Inside the Mediterranean, then, I could catch no more of its fast-passing scenery than a traveler might see from an express train. In other words, I could view only the distant horizons, because the foregrounds flashed by like lightning. But Conseil and I were able to observe those Mediterranean fish whose powerful fins kept pace for a while in the Nautilus's waters. We stayed on watch before the lounge windows, and our notes enabled me to reconstruct, in a few words, the ichthyology of this sea. Among the various fish inhabiting it, some I viewed, others I glimpsed, and the rest I missed completely because of the Nautilus's speed. Kindly allow me to sort them out using this whimsical system of classification. It will at least convey the quickness of my observations. In the midst of the watery mass, Brightly lit by our electric beams, there snaked past those one-meter lampreys that are common to nearly every climb. A type of ray from the genus Oxyrhynchus, five feet wide, had a white belly with a spotted ash-gray back and was carried along by the currents like a huge, wide-open shawl. Other rays passed by so quickly I couldn't tell if they deserved the name Eagle Ray, coined by the ancient Greeks, or those designations of rat ray, bat ray, and toad ray that modern fishermen have inflicted on them. Dogfish, known as topes, 12 feet long and especially feared by divers, were racing with each other. Looking like big bluish shadows, thresher sharks went by, 8 feet long and gifted with an extremely acute sense of smell. Dorados from the genus Sparus, some measuring up to 13 decimeters, appeared in silver and azure costumes encircled with ribbons, which contrasted with the dark color of their fins. Fish sacred to the goddess Venus, their eyes set in brows of gold, a valuable species that patronizes all waters, fresh or salt, equally at home in rivers, lakes, and oceans, 
living in every clime, tolerating any temperature, their line dating back to prehistoric times on this earth, yet preserving all its beauty from those far-off days. Magnificent sturgeons, nine to ten meters long and extremely fast, banged their powerful tails against the glass of our panels, showing bluish backs with small brown spots. They resemble sharks without equaling their strength, and are encountered in every sea. In the spring they delight in swimming up the great rivers, fighting the currents of the Volga, Danube, Po, Rhine, Loire, and Oder, while feeding on herring, mackerel, salmon, and codfish. Although they belong to the class of cartilaginous fish, they rate as a delicacy. They are eaten fresh, dried, marinated, or salt-preserved, and in olden times they were borne in triumph to the table of the Roman epicure, Lucullus. But whenever the Nautilus drew near the surface, those denizens of the Mediterranean I could observe most productively belonged to the 63rd genus of bony fish. These were tuna from the genus Scomber, blue-black on top, silver on the belly armor, their dorsal stripes giving off a golden gleam. They are said to follow ships in search of refreshing shade from the hot tropical sun, and they did just that with the Nautilus, as they had once done with the vessels of the Count de la Perouse. For long hours they competed in speed with our submersible. I couldn't stop marveling at these animals so perfectly cut out for racing, their heads small, their bodies sleek, spindle-shaped, and in some cases over three meters long, their pectoral fins gifted with remarkable strength, their caudal fins forked. Like certain flocks of birds whose speed they equal, these tuna swim in triangle formation, which prompted the ancients to say they'd boned up on geometry and military strategy. And yet they can't escape the Provencal fishermen, who prized them as highly as did the ancient inhabitants of Turkey and Italy. And these valuable animals, as oblivious as if they were deaf and blind, leap right into the Marseilles tuna nets and perish by the thousands. Just for the record, I'll mention those Mediterranean fish that Conseil and I barely glimpsed. There were whitish eels of the species Gymnotus fasciatus that passed like elusive wisps of steam. Conger eels, three or four meters long, that were tricked out in green, blue, and yellow. Three-foot hake with a liver that makes a dainty morsel. Worm fish drifting like thin seaweed. Sea robins that poets call lyre fish and seamen pipers whose snouts have two jagged triangular plates shaped like old homer's lyre swallowfish swimming as fast as the bird they're named after red-headed groupers whose dorsal fins are trimmed with filaments some shad spotted with black gray brown blue yellow and green that actually respond to tinkling handbells splendid diamond-shaped turbot that were like aquatic pheasants with yellowish fins stippled in brown and the left top side mostly marbled in brown and yellow finally schools of wonderful red mullet real oceanic birds of paradise that ancient romans bought for as much as ten thousand sesteres apiece and which they killed at the table so they could heartlessly watch it change color from cinnabar red when alive to pallid white when dead as for the other fish common to the Atlantic and Mediterranean, I was unable to observe miralets, triggerfish, puffers, seahorses, jewelfish, trumpetfish, blennies, gray mullet, wrasse, smelt, flying fish, anchovies, sea bream, porgies, garfish, or any of the chief representatives of the order Pleuronecta, such as sole, flounder, plaice, dab, and brill, simply because of the dizzying speed with which the Nautilus hustled through these opulent waters. As for marine mammals, on passing by the mouth of the Adriatic Sea, I thought I recognized two or three sperm whales equipped with a single dorsal fin denoting the genus Physeter some pilot whales from the genus globocephalus exclusive to the mediterranean the forepart of the head striped with small distinct lines and also a dozen seals with white bellies and black coats known by the name monk seals and just as solemn as if they were three-meter dominicans for his part Conseil thought he spotted a turtle six feet wide and adorned with three protruding ridges that ran lengthwise I was sorry to miss this reptile, because from Conseil's description, I believe I recognized the leatherback turtle, a pretty rare species. 
for my part, i noted only some loggerhead turtles with long carapaces as for zoophytes, for a few moments i was able to marvel at a wonderful orange-hued hydra from the genus garialaria that clung to the glass of our port panel it consisted of a long lean filament that spread out into countless branches and ended in the most delicate lace ever spun by the followers of arachne unfortunately i couldn't fish up this wonderful specimen and surely no other mediterranean zoophytes would have been offered to my gaze if on the evening of the sixteenth the nautilus hadn't slowed down in an odd fashion this was the situation by then we were passing between sicily and the coast of tunisia in the cramped space between cape bon and the strait of messina the sea bottom rises almost all at once it forms an actual ridge with only seventeen meters of water remaining above it while the depth on either side is one hundred and seventy meters consequently the nautilus had to maneuver with caution so as not to bump into this underwater barrier I showed Conseil the position of this long reef on our chart of the Mediterranean. But with all due respect to Master, Conseil ventured to observe, it's like an actual isthmus connecting Europe to Africa. Yes, my boy, I replied, it cuts across the whole strait of Sicily, and Smith's soundings prove that in the past these two continents were genuinely connected between Cape Boeo and Cape Farina. I can easily believe it, Conseil said. I might add, I went on, that there's a similar barrier between Gibraltar and Ceuta, and in prehistoric times it closed off the Mediterranean completely. Gracious, Conseil put in, suppose one day some volcanic upheaval raises these two barriers back above the waves. That's most unlikely, Conseil. If Master will allow me to finish, I mean, that if this phenomenon occurs it might prove distressing to mr deliceps who has gone to such pains to cut through his isthmus agreed but i repeat conseil such a phenomenon won't occur the intensity of these underground forces continues to diminish volcanoes were quite numerous in the world's early days but they're going extinct one by one the heat inside the earth is growing weaker the temperature in the globe's lower strata is cooling appreciably every century and to our globe's detriment because its heat is its life but the sun the sun isn't enough conseil can it restore heat to a corpse not that i've heard well my friend some day the earth will be just such a cold corpse like the moon which long ago lost its vital heat our globe will become lifeless and unlivable in how many centuries conseil asked in hundreds of thousands of years my boy then we have ample time to finish our voyage conseil replied if ned land doesn't mess things up thus reassured conseil went back to studying the shallows that the nautilus was skimming at moderate speed on the rocky volcanic seafloor there bloomed quite a collection of moving flora sponges sea cucumbers jellyfish called sea gooseberries that were adorned with reddish tendrils and gave off a subtle phosphorescence members of the genus baroe that are commonly known by the name melon jellyfish and are bathed in the shimmer of the whole solar spectrum free-swimming crinoids one meter wide that reddened the waters with their crimson hue tree-like basket stars of the greatest beauty sea fans from the genus pavanacea with long stems numerous edible sea urchins of various species plus green sea anemones with a grayish trunk and a brown disc lost beneath the olive-colored tresses of their tentacles conseil kept especially busy observing mollusks and articulates and although his catalog is a little dry i wouldn't want to wrong the gallant lad by leaving out his personal observations from the branch mollusca he mentions numerous comb-shaped scallops hoof-like spiny oysters piled on top of each other triangular coquina three-pronged glass snails with yellow fins and transparent shells 
orange snails from the genus pleurobranchus that looked like eggs spotted or speckled with greenish dots members of the genus ellipsia also known by the name sea hares other sea hares from the genus dolabera plump paper bubble shells umbrella shells exclusive to the mediterranean abalone whose shell produces a mother of pearl much in demand pilgrim scallops saddle shells that diners in the french province of laguedoc are said to like better than oysters some of those cockle shells so dear to the citizens of marseilles fat white venus shells that are among the clams so abundant off the coasts of north america and eaten in such quantity by new yorkers variously colored comb shells with gill covers burrowing date mussels with a peppery flavor i relish farrowed hard cockles whose shells have rib-like ridges on their arching summits trident shells pocked with scarlet bumps carniaria snails with backward curving tips that make them resemble flimsy gondolas crowned ferona snails atlantis snails with spiral shells gray nudibranches from the genus tithius that were spotted with white and covered by fringed mantles nudibranches from the suborder eolidia that looked like small slugs sea butterflies crawling on their backs seashells from the genus auricula including the oval-shaped auricula myosotis tan wentle trap snails common periwinkles violet snails cinerera snails rock borers ear shells cabochon snails pandora shells etc as for the articulates in his notes conseil has very appropriately divided them into six classes three of which belong to the marine world these classes are the crustacea cirripedia and annelida crustaceans are subdivided into nine orders and the first of these consists of the decapods in other words animals whose head and thorax are usually fused whose cheek and mouth mechanism is made up of several pairs of appendages and whose thorax has four five or six pairs of walking legs conseil used the methods of our mentor professor milne edwards who puts the decapods in three divisions brachiura macrura and animura these names may look a tad fierce but they're accurate and appropriate among the brachiura conseil mentioned some amanthia crabs whose fronts were armed with two big diverging tips those anaceous scorpions that lord knows why symbolized wisdom to the ancient greeks spider crabs of the messina and spinomane varieties that had probably gone astray in these shallows because they usually live in the lower depths xanthid crabs palumna crabs rhomboid crabs granular box crabs easy on the digestion as conseil ventured to observe toothless masked crabs ebalia crabs cymopolia crabs woolly-handed crabs etc among the macrura which are subdivided into five families hard shells burrowers crayfish prawns and ghost crabs conseil mentions some common spiny lobsters whose females supply a meat highly prized slipper lobsters or common shrimp waterside gibia shrimp and all sorts of edible species but he says nothing of the crayfish subdivision that includes the true lobster because spiny lobsters are the only type in the mediterranean finally among the anamura he saw common drachna crabs dwelling inside whatever abandoned seashells they could take over homala crabs with spiny fronts hermit crabs hairy porcelain crabs etc there conseil's work came to a halt he didn't have time to finish off the class crustacea through an examination of its stomatopods amphipods homopods isopods trilobites branchiopods ostracods and entomostracians and in order to complete his study of marine articulates he needed to mention the class cirripedia which contains water fleas and carp lice plus the class annelida which he would have divided without fail into tubifex worms and dorsibranchian worms but having gone past the shallows of the strait of sicily the nautilus resumed its usual deep-water speed from then on no more mollusks 
no more zoophytes no more articulates just a few large fish sweeping by like shadows during the night of february sixteen seventeen we entered the second mediterranean basin whose maximum depth we found at three thousand meters the nautilus driven downward by its propeller and slanting fins descended to the lower strata of this sea there in place of natural wonders the watery mass offered some thrilling and dreadful scenes to my eyes in essence we were then crossing that part of the whole mediterranean so fertile in casualties from the coast of algiers to the beaches of provence how many ships have wrecked how many vessels have vanished compared to the vast liquid plains of the pacific the mediterranean is a mere lake but it's an unpredictable lake with fickle waves today kindly affectionate to those frail single masters drifting between a double ultramarine of sky and water tomorrow bad-tempered and turbulent agitated by the winds demolishing the strongest ships beneath sudden waves that smash down with a headlong wallop so in our swift cruise through these deep strata how many vessels i saw lying on the seafloor some already caked with coral others clad only in a layer of rust plus anchors cannons shells iron fittings propeller blades parts of engines cracked cylinders staved in boilers then hulls floating in mid-water here upright there overturned some of these wrecked ships had perished in collisions others from hitting granite reefs i saw a few that had sunk straight down their masts still upright their rigging stiffened by the water they looked like they were at anchor by some immense open offshore mooring where they were waiting for their departure time when the nautilus passed between them covering them with sheets of electricity they seemed ready to salute us with their colors and send us their serial numbers but no nothing but silence and death filled this field of catastrophes i observed that these mediterranean depths became more and more cluttered with such gruesome wreckage as the nautilus drew nearer to the strait of gibraltar by then the shores of africa and europe were converging and in this narrow space collisions were commonplace there i saw numerous iron undersides the phantasmagoric ruins of the steamers some lying down others rearing up like fearsome animals one of these boats made a dreadful first impression sides torn open funnel bent paddle wheels stripped to the mountings rudder separated from the stem post and still hanging from an iron chain the board of its stern eaten away by marine salts how many lives were dashed in this shipwreck how many victims were swept under the waves had some sailor on board lived to tell the story of this dreadful disaster or do the waves still keep this casualty a secret it occurred to me lord knows why that this boat buried under the sea might have been the atlas lost with all hands some twenty years ago and never heard from again oh what a gruesome tale these mediterranean depths could tell this huge boneyard where so much wealth has been lost where so many victims have met their deaths meanwhile briskly unconcerned the nautilus ran at full propeller through the midst of these ruins on february eighteen near three o'clock in the morning it hove before the entrance to the strait of gibraltar there are two currents here an upper current long known to exist that carries the ocean's waters into the mediterranean basin then a lower countercurrent the only present-day proof of its existence being logic in essence the mediterranean receives a continual influx of water not only from the atlantic but from rivers emptying into it since local evaporation isn't enough to restore the balance the total amount of added water should make this sea's level higher every year yet this isn't the case and we're naturally forced to believe in the existence of some lower current that carries the mediterranean's surplus through the strait of gibraltar and into the atlantic basin and so it turned out the nautilus took full advantage of this countercurrent it advanced swiftly through this narrow passageway for an instant i could glimpse the wonderful ruins of the temple of hercules 
buried undersea as pliny and avianus have mentioned together with the flat island they stand on and a few minutes later we were floating on the waves of the atlantic end of part two chapter seven part two chapter eight of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne chapter eight the bay of vigo the atlantic a vast expanse of water whose surface area is twenty five million square miles with a length of nine thousand miles and an average width of two thousand seven hundred miles a major sea nearly unknown to the ancients except perhaps the carthaginians those dutchmen of antiquity who went along the west coasts of europe and africa on their commercial junkets an ocean whose parallel winding shores form an immense perimeter fed by the world's greatest rivers the st lawrence mississippi amazon plata orinoco niger senegal elbe loire and rhine which bring its waters from the most civilized countries as well as the most undeveloped areas a magnificent plain of waves ploughed continuously by ships of every nation shaded by every flag in the world and ending in those two dreadful headlands so feared by navigators cape horn and the cape of tempests the nautilus broke these waters with the edge of its spur after doing nearly ten thousand leagues in three and a half months a track longer than a great circle of the earth where were we heading now and what did the future have in store for us emerging from the strait of gibraltar the nautilus took to the high seas it returned to the surface of the waves so our daily strolls on the platform were restored to us i climbed onto it instantly ned land and conseil along with me twelve miles away cape st vincent was hazily visible the southwestern tip of the hispanic peninsula the wind was blowing a pretty strong gust from the south the sea was swelling and surging its waves made the nautilus roll and jerk violently it was nearly impossible to stand up on the platform which was continuously buffeted by this enormously heavy sea after inhaling a few breaths of air we went below once more i repaired to my stateroom conseil returned to his cabin but the canadian looking rather worried followed me our quick trip through the mediterranean hadn't allowed him to put his plans into execution and he could barely conceal his disappointment after the door to my stateroom was closed he sat and stared at me silently ned my friend i told him i know how you feel but you mustn't blame yourself given the way the nautilus was navigating it would have been sheer insanity to think of escaping ned land didn't reply his pursed lips and frowning brow indicated that he was in the grip of his monomania look here i went on as yet there's no cause for despair we're going up the coast of portugal france and england aren't far off and there we'll easily find refuge oh i grant you if the nautilus had emerged from the strait of gibraltar and made for that cape in the south if it were taking us toward those regions that have no continents then i'd share your alarm but we now know that captain nemo doesn't avoid the seas of civilization and in a few days i think we can safely take action ned land stared at me still more intently and finally unpursed his lips we'll do it this evening he said i straightened suddenly i admit that i was less than ready for this announcement i wanted to reply to the canadian but words failed me we agreed to wait for the right circumstances ned land went on now we've got those circumstances this evening will be just a few miles off the coast of spain it'll be cloudy tonight the wind's blowing toward shore you gave me your promise professor aronnax and i'm counting on you since i didn't say anything the canadian stood up and approached me we'll do it this evening at nine o'clock he said i've alerted conseil by that time captain nemo will be locked in his room and probably in bed neither the mechanics or the crewmen will be able to see us 
conseil and i will go to the central companionway as for you professor aronnax you'll stay in the library two steps away and wait for my signal the oars mast and sail are in the skiff i've even managed to stow some provisions inside i've gotten hold of a monkey wrench to unscrew the nuts bolting the skiff to the nautilus's hull so everything's ready i'll see you this evening the sea is rough i said admitted the canadian replied but we've got to risk it freedom is worth paying for besides the longboat's solidly built and a few miles with the wind behind us is no big deal by tomorrow who knows if this ship won't be a hundred leagues out to sea if circumstances are in our favor between ten and eleven this evening we'll be landing on some piece of solid ground or we'll be dead so we're in god's hands and i'll see you this evening this said the canadian withdrew leaving me close to dumbfounded i had imagined that if it came to this i would have time to think about it to talk it over my stubborn companion hadn't granted me this courtesy but after all what would i have said to him ned land was right a hundred times over these were near ideal circumstances and he was taking full advantage of them in my selfish personal interests could i go back on my word and be responsible for ruining the future lives of my companions tomorrow might not captain nemo take us far away from any shore just then a fairly loud hissing told me that the ballast tanks were filling and the nautilus sank beneath the waves of the atlantic i stayed in my stateroom i wanted to avoid the captain to hide from his eyes the agitation overwhelming me what an agonizing day i spent torn between my desire to regain my free will and my regret at abandoning this marvelous nautilus leaving my underwater research incomplete how could i relinquish this ocean my own atlantic as i liked to call it without observing its lower strata without wresting from it the kinds of secrets that had been revealed to me by the seas of the east indies and the pacific i was putting down my novel half read i was waking up as my dream neared its climax how painfully the hours passed as i sometimes envisioned myself safe on shore with my companions or despite my better judgment as i sometimes wished that some unforeseen circumstances would prevent ned land from carrying out his plans twice i went to the lounge i wanted to consult the compass i wanted to see if the nautilus's heading was actually taking us closer to the coast or spiriting us farther away but no the nautilus was still in portuguese waters heading north it was cruising along the ocean's beaches so i had to resign myself to my fate and get ready to escape my baggage wasn't heavy my notes nothing more as for captain nemo i wondered what he would make of our escaping what concern or perhaps what distress it might cause him and what he would do in the twofold event of our attempt either failing or being found out certainly i had no complaints to register with him on the contrary never was hospitality more whole-hearted than his yet in leaving him i couldn't be accused of ingratitude no solemn promises bound us to him in order to keep us captive he had counted only on the force of circumstances and not on our word of honor but his vowed intention to imprison us forever on his ship justified our every effort i hadn't seen the captain since our visit to the island of santorini would fate bring me into his presence before our departure i both desired and dreaded it i listened for footsteps in the stateroom adjoining mine not a sound reached my ear his stateroom had to be deserted then i began to wonder if this eccentric individual was even on board since that night when the skiff had left the nautilus on some mysterious mission my ideas about him had subtly changed in spite of everything i thought that captain nemo must have kept up some type of relationship with the shore did he himself never leave the nautilus whole weeks had often gone by without my encountering him what was he doing all the while during all those times i thought he was convalescing in the grip of some misanthropic fit was he instead far away from the ship involved in some secret activity whose nature still eluded me all these ideas and a thousand others assaulted me at the same time in these strange circumstances the scope for conjecture was unlimited i felt an unbearable queasiness 
this day of waiting seemed endless the hours struck too slowly to keep up with my impatience as usual dinner was served me in my stateroom full of anxiety i ate little i left the table at seven o'clock one hundred and twenty minutes i was keeping track of them still separated me from the moment i was to rejoin ned land my agitation increased my pulse was throbbing violently i couldn't stand still i walked up and down hoping to calm my troubled mind with movement the possibility of perishing in our reckless undertaking was the least of my worries my heart was pounding at the thought that our plans might be discovered before we had left the nautilus at the thought of being hauled in front of captain nemo and finding him angered or worse saddened by my deserting him i wanted to see the lounge one last time i went down the gangways and arrived at the museum where i had spent so many pleasant and productive hours i stared at all its wealth all its treasures like a man on the eve of his eternal exile a man departing to return no more for so many days now these natural wonders and artistic masterworks had been central to my life and i was about to leave them behind forever i wanted to plunge my eyes through the lounge window and into these atlantic waters but the panels were hermetically sealed and a mantle of sheet iron separated me from this ocean with which i was still unfamiliar crossing through the lounge i arrived at the door contrived in one of those canted corners that opened into the captain's stateroom much to my astonishment this door was ajar i instinctively recoiled if captain nemo was in his stateroom he might see me but not hearing any sounds i approached the stateroom was deserted i pushed the door open i took a few steps inside still the same austere monastic appearance just then my eye was caught by some etchings hanging on the wall which i hadn't noticed during my first visit they were portraits of great men of history who had spent their lives in perpetual devotion to a great human ideal thaddeus kosciusko the hero whose dying words had been fidis polania editor's note latin for save poland's borders marcos bozaris for modern greece the reincarnation of sparta's king leonidas daniel o'connell ireland's defender george washington founder of the american union danielle manin the italian patriot abraham lincoln dead from the bullet of a believer in slavery and finally that martyr for the redemption of the black race john brown hanging from his gallows as victor hugo's pencil has so terrifyingly depicted what was the bond between these heroic souls and the soul of captain nemo from this collection of portraits could i finally unravel the mystery of his existence was he a fighter for oppressed peoples a liberator of enslaved races had he figured in the recent political or social upheavals of this century was he a hero of that dreadful civil war in america a war lamentable yet forever glorious suddenly the clock struck eight the first stroke of its hammer on the chime snapped me out of my musings i shuddered as if some invisible eye had plunged into my innermost thoughts and i rushed outside the stateroom there my eyes fell on the compass our heading was still northerly the log indicated a moderate speed the pressure gauge a depth of about sixty feet so circumstances were in favor of the canadian's plans i stayed in my stateroom i dressed warmly fishing boots otter cap coat of fan muscle fabric lined with sealskin i was ready i was waiting only the propeller's vibrations disturbed the deep silence reigning on board i cocked an ear and listened would a sudden outburst of voices tell me that ned land's escape plans had just been detected a ghastly uneasiness stole through me i tried in vain to recover my composure a few minutes before nine o'clock i glued my ear to the captain's door not a sound i left my stateroom and returned to the lounge which was deserted and plunged in near darkness i opened the door leading to the library the same inadequate light the same solitude 
i went to man my post near the door opening into the well of the central companionway i waited for ned land's signal at this point the propeller's vibrations slowed down appreciably then they died out altogether why was the nautilus stopping whether this layover would help or hinder ned land's schemes i couldn't have said the silence was further disturbed only by the pounding of my heart suddenly i felt a mild jolt i realized the nautilus had come to rest on the ocean floor my alarm increased the canadian's signal hadn't reached me i longed to rejoin ned land and urge him to postpone his attempt i sensed that we were no longer navigating under normal conditions just then the door to the main lounge opened and captain nemo appeared he saw me and without further preamble ah professor he said in an affable tone i've been looking for you do you know your spanish history even if he knew it by heart a man in my disturbed befuddled condition couldn't have quoted a syllable of his own country's history well captain nemo went on did you hear my question do you know the history of spain very little of it i replied the most learned men the captain said still have much to learn have a seat he added and i'll tell you about an unusual episode in this body of history the captain stretched out on a couch and i mechanically took a seat near him but half in the shadows professor he said listen carefully this piece of history concerns you in one definite respect because it will answer a question you've no doubt been unable to resolve i'm listening captain i said not knowing what my partner in this dialogue was driving at and wondering if this incident related to our escape plans professor captain nemo went on if you're amenable we'll go back in time to 1702 you're aware of the fact that in those days your king louis the fourteenth thought an imperial gesture would suffice to humble the pyrenees in the dust so he inflicted his grandson the duke of anjou on the spaniards reigning more or less poorly under the name king philip v this aristocrat had to deal with mighty opponents abroad in essence the year before the royal houses of holland austria and england had signed a treaty of alliance at the hague aiming to wrest the spanish crown from king philip v and to place it on the head of an archduke whom they prematurely dubbed king charles the third spain had to withstand these allies but the country had practically no army or navy yet it wasn't short of money provided that its galleons laden with gold and silver from america could enter its ports now then late in 1702 spain was expecting a rich convoy which france ventured to escort with a fleet of twenty-three vessels under the command of admiral de chateau renault because by that time the allied navies were roving the atlantic this convoy was supposed to put into cadiz but after learning that the english fleet lay across those waterways the admiral decided to make for a french port the spanish commanders in the convoy objected to this decision they wanted to be taken to a spanish port if not to cadiz then to the bay of vigo located on spain's northwest coast and not blockaded admiral de chateau renault was so indecisive as to obey this directive and the galleons entered the bay of vigo unfortunately this bay forms an open offshore mooring that's impossible to defend so it was essential to hurry and empty the galleons before the allied fleets arrived and there would have been ample time for this unloading if a wretched question of trade agreements hadn't suddenly come up are you clear on the chain of events captain nemo asked me perfectly clear i said not yet knowing why i was being given this history lesson then i'll continue here's what came to pass the tradesmen of cadiz had negotiated a charter whereby they were to receive all merchandise coming from the west indies now then unloading the ingots from those galleons at the port of vigo would have been a violation of their rights so they lodged a complaint in madrid 
and they obtained an order from the indecisive king philip v without unloading the convoy would stay in custody at the offshore mooring of vigo until the enemy fleets had retreated now then just as this decision was being handed down english vessels arrived in the bay of vigo on october twenty second seventeen o two despite his inferior forces admiral de chateau renault fought courageously but when he saw that the convoy's wealth was about to fall into enemy hands he burned and scuttled the galleons which went to the bottom with their immense treasures captain nemo stopped i admit it I still couldn't see how this piece of history concerned me. Well, I asked him. Well, Professor Aronnax, Captain Nemo answered me, we're actually in that Bay of Vigo, and all that's left is for you to probe the mysteries of the place. The captain stood up and invited me to follow him. I'd had time to collect myself. I did so. The lounge was dark, but the sea's waves sparkled through the transparent windows. I stared. Around the Nautilus for a half-mile radius, the waters seemed saturated with electric light. The sandy bottom was clear and bright. Dressed in diving suits, crewmen were busy clearing away half-rotted barrels and disemboweled trunks in the midst of the dingy hulks of ships. Out of these trunks and kegs spilled ingots of gold and silver, cascades of jewels pieces of eight the sand was heaped with them then laden with these valuable spoils the men returned to the nautilus dropped off their burdens inside and went to resume this inexhaustible fishing for silver and gold i understood this was the setting of that battle on october twenty second seventeen o two here in this very place those galleons carrying treasure to the Spanish government had gone to the bottom. Here, whenever he needed, Captain Nemo came to withdraw these millions to ballast his Nautilus. It was for him, for him alone, that America had yielded up its precious metals. He was the direct, sole heir to these treasures wrested from the Incas and those peoples conquered by Hernando Cortez. Did you know, Professor? he asked me with a smile that the sea contained such wealth i know it's estimated i replied that there are two million metric tons of silver held in suspension in sea water surely but in extracting that silver your expenses would outweigh your profits here by contrast i have only to pick up what other men have lost and not only in this bay of vigo but at a thousand other sites where ships have gone down whose positions are marked on my underwater chart. Do you understand now that I'm rich to the tune of billions? I understand, Captain. Nevertheless, allow me to inform you that by harvesting this very Bay of Vigo, you're simply forestalling the efforts of a rival organization. What organization? A company chartered by the Spanish government to search for these sunken galleons. The company's investors were lured by the bait of enormous gains, because this scuttled treasure is estimated to be worth 500 million francs. It was 500 million francs, Captain Nemo replied, but no more. Right, I said. Hence, a timely warning to those investors would be an act of charity. Yet, who knows if it would be well received? Usually, what gamblers regret the most isn't the loss of their money so much as the loss of their insane hopes. But, ultimately, I feel less sorry for them than for the thousands of unfortunate people who would have benefited from a fair distribution of this wealth, whereas now it will be of no help to them. No sooner had I voiced this regret than I felt I must have wounded Captain Nemo. No help, he replied with growing animation. Sir, what makes you assume this wealth goes to waste when I'm the one amassing it? Do you think I toil to gather this treasure out of selfishness? Who says I don't put it to good use? Do you think I'm unaware of the suffering beings and oppressed races living on this earth? Poor people to comfort, victims to avenge? Don't you understand? Captain Nemo stopped on these last words, perhaps sorry that he had said too much. But I had guessed. 
whatever motives had driven him to seek independence under the seas he remained a human being before all else his heart still throbbed for suffering humanity and his immense philanthropy went out both to downtrodden races and to individuals and now i knew where captain nemo had delivered those millions when the nautilus navigated the waters where crete was in rebellion against the ottoman empire End of Part 2, Chapter 8 Part 2, Chapter 9 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne Chapter 9, A Lost Continent the next morning, February 19, I beheld the Canadian entering my stateroom. I was expecting this visit. He wore an expression of great disappointment. "'Well, sir,' he said to me. "'Well, Ned, the fates were against us yesterday.' "'Yes, that damned captain had to call a halt just as we were going to escape from his boat.' "'Yes, Ned, he had business with his bankers.' his bankers or rather his bank vaults by which i mean this ocean where his wealth is safer than in any national treasury i then related the evening's incidents to the canadian secretly hoping he would come around to the idea of not deserting the captain but my narrative had no result other than ned's voicing deep regret that he hadn't strolled across the vigo battlefield on his own behalf anyhow he said it's not over yet my first harpoon missed that's all we'll succeed the next time and as soon as this evening if need be what's the nautilus's heading i asked i've no idea ned replied all right at noon we'll find out what our position is the canadian returned to conseil's side as soon as i was dressed i went into the lounge the compass wasn't encouraging the Nautilus's course was south-southwest. We were turning our backs on Europe. I could hardly wait until our position was reported on the chart. Near 11.30, the ballast tanks emptied, and the submersible rose to the surface of the ocean. I leaped onto the platform. Ned Land was already there. No more shore in sight. Nothing but the immenseness of the sea. A few sails were on the horizon, no doubt ships going as far as Cape Sauroque to find favorable winds for doubling the Cape of Good Hope. The sky was overcast. A squall was on the way. Furious, Ned Land tried to see through the mists on the horizon. He still hoped that behind all that fog there lay those shores he longed for. At noon, the sun made a momentary appearance. Taking advantage of this rift in the clouds, the chief officer took the orb's altitude then the sea grew turbulent we went below again and the hatch closed once more when i consulted the chart an hour later i saw that the nautilus's position was marked at longitude sixteen degrees seventeen minutes and latitude thirty two degrees twenty two minutes a good one hundred and fifty leagues from the nearest coast it wouldn't do to even dream of escaping, and I'll let the reader decide how promptly the Canadian threw a tantrum when I ventured to tell him our situation. As for me, I wasn't exactly grief-stricken. I felt as if a heavy weight had been lifted from me, and I was able to resume my regular tasks in a state of comparative calm. Near eleven o'clock in the evening, I received a most unexpected visit from Captain Nemo. He asked me very graciously if I felt exhausted from our vigil the night before. I said no. Then, Professor Aronnax, I propose an unusual excursion. Propose away, Captain. So far, you've visited the ocean depths only by day and under sunlight. Would you like to see these depths on a dark night? Very much. I warn you, this will be an exhausting stroll. We'll need to walk long hours and scale a mountain. The roads aren't terribly well kept up. Everything you say, Captain, just increases my curiosity. I'm ready to go with you. Then come along, Professor, and we'll go put on our diving suits. 
arriving at the wardrobe, i saw that neither my companions nor any crewmen would be coming with us on this excursion captain nemo hadn't even suggested my fetching ned or conseil in a few moments we had put on our equipment air tanks abundantly charged were placed on our backs but the electric lamps were not in readiness i commented on this to the captain they'll be useless to us he replied i thought i hadn't heard him right but i couldn't repeat my comment because the captain's head had already disappeared into its metal covering i finished harnessing myself i felt an alpenstock being placed in my hand and a few minutes later after the usual procedures we set foot on the floor of the atlantic three hundred meters down midnight was approaching the waters were profoundly dark but captain nemo pointed to a reddish spot in the distance a sort of wide glow shimmering about two miles from the nautilus what this fire was what substances fed it how and why it kept burning in the liquid mass i couldn't say anyhow it lit our way although hazily but i soon grew accustomed to this unique gloom and in these circumstances i understood the uselessness of the rumkorff device side by side captain nemo and i walked directly toward this conspicuous flame the level seafloor rose imperceptibly we took long strides helped by our alpenstocks but in general our progress was slow because our feet kept sinking into a kind of slimy mud mixed with seaweed and assorted flat stones as we moved forward i heard a kind of pitter-patter above my head sometimes this noise increased and became a continuous crackle i soon realized the cause it was a heavy rainfall rattling on the surface of the waves instinctively i worried that i might get soaked by water in the midst of water i couldn't help smiling at this outlandish notion but to tell the truth wearing these heavy diving suits you no longer feel the liquid element you simply think you're in the midst of air a little denser than air on land that's all after half an hour of walking the seafloor grew rocky jellyfish microscopic crustaceans and sea pen coral lit it faintly with their phosphorescent glimmers i glimpsed piles of stones covered by a couple million zoophytes and tangles of algae my feet often slipped on this viscous seaweed carpet and without my alpenstock i would have fallen more than once when i turned around i could still see the nautilus's whitish beacon which was starting to grow pale in the distance those piles of stones just mentioned were laid out on the ocean floor with a distinct but inexplicable symmetry i spotted gigantic furrows trailing off into the distant darkness their length incalculable there also were other peculiarities i couldn't make sense of it seemed to me that my heavy lead soles were crushing a litter of bones that made a dry crackling noise so what were these vast plains we were now crossing I wanted to ask the captain, but I still didn't grasp that sign language that allowed him to chat with his companions when they went with him on underwater excursions. Meanwhile, the reddish light guiding us had expanded and inflamed the horizon. The presence of this furnace under the waters had me extremely puzzled. Was it some sort of electrical discharge? Was I approaching some natural phenomenon still unknown to scientists on shore? or rather and this thought did cross my mind had the hand of man intervened in that blaze had human beings fanned those flames in these deep strata would i meet up with more of captain nemo's companions friends he was about to visit who led lives as strange as his own would i find a whole colony of exiles down here men tired of the world's woes men who had sought and found independence in the ocean's lower depths all these insane inadmissible ideas dogged me and in this frame of mind continually excited by the series of wonders passing before my eyes i wouldn't have been surprised to find on this sea bottom one of those underwater towns captain nemo dreamed about in the midst of the stone mazes furrowing the atlantic seafloor captain nemo moved forward without hesitation he knew this dark path no doubt he had often traveled it and was incapable of losing his way 
i followed him with unshakable confidence he seemed like some spirit of the sea and as he walked ahead of me i marveled at his tall figure which stood out in black against the glowing background of the horizon it was one o'clock in the morning we arrived at the mountains lower gradients but in grappling with them we had to venture up difficult trails through a huge thicket yes a thicket of dead trees trees without leaves without sap turned to stone by the action of the waters and crowned here and there by gigantic pines it was like a still erect coal field its roots clutching broken soil its boughs clearly outlined against the ceiling of the waters like thin black paper cutouts picture a forest clinging to the sides of a peak in the harz mountains but a submerged forest the trails were cluttered with algae and fucus plants hosts of crustaceans swarming among them i plunged on scaling rocks straddling fallen tree trunks snapping marine creatures that swayed from one tree to another startling the fish that flitted from branch to branch carried away i didn't feel exhausted any more i followed a guide who was immune to exhaustion what a sight how can i describe it how can i portray these woods and rocks in this liquid setting their lower parts dark and sullen their upper parts tinted red in this light whose intensity was doubled by the reflecting power of the waters we scaled rocks that crumbled behind us collapsing in enormous sections with the hollow rumble of an avalanche to our right and left there were carved gloomy galleries where the eye lost its way huge glades opened up seemingly cleared by the hand of man and i sometimes wondered whether some residents of these underwater regions would suddenly appear before me but captain nemo kept climbing i didn't want to fall behind i followed him boldly my alpenstock was a great help one wrong step would have been disastrous on the narrow paths cut into the sides of these chasms but i walked along with a firm tread and without the slightest feeling of dizziness sometimes i leaped over a crevasse whose depth would have made me recoil had i been in the midst of glaciers on shore sometimes i ventured out on a wobbling tree trunk fallen across a gorge without looking down having eyes only for marveling at the wild scenery of this region there leaning on erratically cut foundations monumental rocks seemed to defy the laws of balance from between their stony knees trees sprang up like jets under fearsome pressure supporting other trees that supported them in turn next natural towers with wide steeply carved battlements leaned at angles that on dry land the laws of gravity would never have authorized and i too could feel the difference created by the water's powerful density despite my heavy clothing copper headpiece and metal soles i climbed the most impossibly steep gradients with all the nimbleness i swear it of a chamois or a pyrenees mountain goat as for my account of this excursion under the waters i'm well aware that it sounds incredible i'm the chronicler of deeds seemingly impossible and yet incontestably real this was no fantasy this was what i saw and felt two hours after leaving the nautilus we had cleared the timber line and one hundred feet above our heads stood the mountain peak forming a dark silhouette against the brilliant glare that came from its far slope petrified shrubs rambled here and there in sprawling zigzags fish rose in a body at our feet like birds startled in tall grass the rocky mass was gorged with impenetrable crevices deep caves unfathomable holes at whose far ends i could hear fearsome things moving around my blood would curdle as i watched some enormous antenna bar my path or saw some frightful pincer snap shut in the shadow of some cavity a thousand specks of light glittered in the midst of the gloom they were the eyes of gigantic crustaceans crouching in their lairs giant lobsters rearing up like spear carriers and moving their claws with a scrap iron clanking 
titanic crabs aiming their bodies like cannons on their carriages and hideous devilfish intertwining their tentacles like bushes of writhing snakes what was this astounding world that i didn't yet know in what order did these articulates belong these creatures for which the rocks provided a second carapace where had nature learned the secret of their vegetating existence and for how many centuries had they lived in the ocean's lower strata but i couldn't linger captain nemo on familiar terms with these dreadful animals no longer minded them we arrived at a preliminary plateau where still other surprises were waiting for me there picturesque ruins took shape betraying the hand of man not our creator they were huge stacks of stones in which you could distinguish the indistinct forms of palaces and temples now arrayed in hosts of blossoming zoophytes and over it all not ivy but a heavy mantle of algae and fucus plants but what part of this globe could this be this land swallowed by cataclysms who had set up these rocks and stones like the dolmens of prehistoric times where was i where had captain nemo's fancies taken me i wanted to ask him unable to i stopped him i seized his arm but he shook his head pointed to the mountain's topmost peak and seemed to tell me come on come with me come higher i followed him with one last burst of energy and in a few minutes i had scaled the peak which crowned the whole rocky mass by some ten meters i looked back down the side we had just cleared there the mountain rose only seven hundred to eight hundred feet above the plains but on its far slope it crowned the receding bottom of this part of the atlantic by a height twice that my eyes scanned the distance and took in a vast area lit by intense flashes of light in essence this mountain was a volcano fifty feet below its peak amid a shower of stones and slag a wide crater vomited torrents of lava that were dispersed in fiery cascades into the heart of the liquid mass so situated this volcano was an immense torch that lit up the lower plains all the way to the horizon as i said this underwater crater spewed lava but not flames flames need oxygen from the air and are unable to spread under water but a lava flow which contains in itself the principle of its incandescence can rise to a white heat overpower the liquid element and turn it into steam on contact swift currents swept away all this diffuse gas and torrents of lava slid to the foot of the mountain like the disgorgings of a mount vesuvius over the city limits of a second torre del greco in fact there beneath my eyes was a town in ruins demolished overwhelmed laid low its roofs caved in its temples pulled down its arches dislocated its columns stretching over the earth in these ruins you could still detect the solid proportions of a sort of tuscan architecture farther off the remains of a gigantic aqueduct here the caked heights of an acropolis along with the fluid forms of a parthenon there the remnants of a wharf as if some bygone port had long ago harbored merchant vessels and triple-tiered war galleys on the shores of some lost ocean still farther off long rows of collapsing walls deserted thoroughfares a whole pompeii buried under the waters which captain nemo had resurrected before my eyes where was i where was i i had to find out at all cost i wanted to speak i wanted to rip off the copper sphere imprisoning my head but captain nemo came over and stopped me with a gesture then picking up a piece of chalky stone he advanced to a black basaltic rock and scrawled this one word atlantis what lightning flashed through my mind atlantis 
that ancient land of meropus mentioned by the historian theopompus plato's atlantis the continent whose very existence has been denied by such philosophers and scientists as origen porphyry iamblichus de anville malte bruin and humboldt who entered its disappearance in the ledger of myths and folk tales the country whose reality has nevertheless been accepted by such other thinkers as Poseidonius, Pliny, Ammianus, Marcellinus, Tertullian, Ingle, Scherer, Tournefort, Buffon, and Diabazac. I had this land right under my eyes, furnishing its own unimpeachable evidence of the catastrophe that had overtaken it so this was the submerged region that had existed outside europe asia and libya beyond the pillars of hercules home of those powerful atlantean people against whom ancient greece had waged its earliest wars the writer whose narratives record the lofty deeds of these heroic times is plato himself his dialogues timaeus and critias were drafted with the poet and legislator solon as their inspiration as it were one day solon was conversing with some elderly wise men in the egyptian capital of sais a town already eight thousand years of age as documented by the annals engraved on the sacred walls of its temples one of these elders related the history of another town one thousand years older still this original city of athens ninety centuries old had been invaded and partly destroyed by the atlanteans these atlanteans he said resided on an immense continent greater than africa and asia combined taking in an area that lay between latitude twelve degrees and forty degrees north their dominion extended even to egypt they tried to enforce their rule as far as greece but they had to retreat before the indomitable resistance of the hellenic people centuries passed a cataclysm occurred floods earthquakes a single night and day were enough to obliterate this atlantis whose highest peaks madeira the azores the canaries the cape verde islands still emerge above the waves these were the historical memories that captain nemo's scrawl sent rushing through my mind thus led by the strangest of fates i was treading underfoot one of the mountains of that continent my hands were touching ruins many thousands of years old contemporary with prehistoric times i was walking in the very place where contemporaries of early man had walked my heavy souls were crushing the skeletons of animals from the age of fable animals that used to take cover in the shade of these trees now turned to stone oh why was i so short of time i would have gone down the steep slopes of this mountain crossed this entire immense continent which surely connects africa with america and visited its great prehistoric cities under my eyes there perhaps lay the warlike town of Macamos or the pious village of Eusebes, whose gigantic inhabitants lived for whole centuries and had the strength to raise blocks of stone that still withstood the action of the waters. One day, perhaps, some volcanic phenomenon will bring these sunken ruins back to the surface of the waves. Numerous underwater volcanoes have been sighted in this part of the ocean, and many ships have felt terrific tremors when passing over these turbulent depths a few have heard hollow noises that announced some struggle of the elements far below others have hauled in volcanic ash hurled above the waves as far as the equator this whole sea floor is still under construction by plutonic forces and in some remote epoch built up by volcanic disgorgings and successive layers of lava who knows whether the peaks of these fire-belching mountains may reappear above the surface of the atlantic as i mused in this way trying to establish in my memory every detail of this impressive landscape captain nemo was leaning his elbows on a moss-covered monument motionless as if petrified in some mute trance
was he dreaming of those lost generations asking them for the secret of human destiny was it here that this strange man came to revive himself basking in historical memories reliving that bygone life he who had no desire for our modern one i would have given anything to know his thoughts to share them understand them we stayed in this place an entire hour contemplating its vast plains in the lava's glow which sometimes took on a startling intensity inner boilings sent quick shivers running through the mountain's crust noises from deep underneath clearly transmitted by the liquid medium reverberated with majestic amplitude just then the moon appeared for an instant through the watery mass casting a few pale rays over this submerged continent it was only a fleeting glimmer but its effect was indescribable the captain stood up and took one last look at these immense plains then his hand signaled me to follow him we went swiftly down the mountain once past the petrified forest i could see the nautilus's beacon twinkling like a star the captain walked straight toward it and we were back on board just as the first glimmers of dawn were whitening the surface of the ocean end of part two chapter nine part two chapter ten of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne chapter ten the underwater coal fields the next day february twenty i overslept i was so exhausted from the night before i didn't get up until eleven o'clock i dressed quickly i hurried to find out the nautilus's heading the instruments indicated that it was running southward at a speed of twenty miles per hour and a depth of one hundred meters conseil entered i described our nocturnal excursion to him and since the panels were open he could still catch a glimpse of this submerged continent in fact the nautilus was skimming only ten meters over the soil of these atlantis plains the ship scudded along like an air balloon borne by the wind over some prairie on land but it would be more accurate to say that we sat in the lounge as if we were riding in a coach on an express train as for the foregrounds passing before our eyes they were fantastically carved rocks forests of trees that had crossed over from the vegetable kingdom into the mineral kingdom their motionless silhouettes sprawling beneath the waves there also were stony masses buried beneath carpets of axidia and sea anemone bristling with long vertical water plants then strangely contoured blocks of lava that testified to all the fury of those plutonic developments while this bizarre scenery was glittering under our electric beams i told conseil the story of the atlanteans who had inspired the old french scientist jean bailey to write so many entertaining albeit utterly fictitious pages editor's note bailey believed that atlantis was located at the north pole i told the lad about the wars of these heroic people i discussed the question of atlantis with the fervor of a man who no longer had any doubts but conseil was so distracted he barely heard me and his lack of interest in any commentary on this historical topic was soon explained in essence numerous fish had caught his eye and when fish pass by conseil vanishes into his world of classifying and leaves real life behind in which case i could only tag along and resume our ichthyological research even so these atlantic fish were not noticeably different from those we had observed earlier there were rays of gigantic size five meters long and with muscles so powerful they could leap above the waves sharks of various species including a fifteen-foot glaucus shark with sharp triangular teeth and so transparent it was almost invisible amid the waters brown lantern sharks prism-shaped humanton sharks armored with protuberant hides sturgeons resembling their relatives in the mediterranean 
trumpet-snouted pipefish a foot and a half long yellowish-brown with small gray fins and no teeth or tongue unreeling like slim supple snakes among bony fish conseil noticed some blackish marlin three meters long with a sharp sword jutting from the upper jaw bright colored weavers known in aristotle's day as sea dragons and whose dorsal stingers make them quite dangerous to pick up then dolphin fish with brown backs striped in blue and edged in gold handsome dorados moon-like ophas that look like azure disks but which the sun's rays turn into spots of silver finally eight meter swordfish from the genus xiphaeus swimming in schools sporting yellowish sickle-shaped fins and six-foot broadswords stalwart animals plant eaters rather than fish eaters obeying the tiniest signals from their females like hen-pecked husbands but while observing these different species of marine fauna i didn't stop examining the long plains of atlantis sometimes an unpredictable irregularity in the seafloor would force the nautilus to slow down and then it would glide into the narrow channels between the hills with a cetacean's dexterity if the labyrinth became hopelessly tangled the submersible would rise above it like an airship and after clearing the obstacle it would resume its speedy course just a few meters above the ocean floor it was an enjoyable and impressive way of navigating that did indeed recall the maneuvers of an airship ride with the major difference that the nautilus faithfully obeyed the hands of its helmsman the terrain consisted mostly of thick slime mixed with petrified branches but it changed little by little near four o'clock in the afternoon it grew rockier and seemed to be strewn with pudding stones and a basaltic gravel called tuff together with bits of lava and sulfurous obsidian i expected these long plains to change into mountain regions and in fact as the nautilus was executing certain turns i noticed that the southerly horizon was blocked by a high wall that seemed to close off every exit its summit obviously poked above the level of the ocean it had to be a continent or at least an island either one of the canaries or one of the cape verde islands our bearings hadn't been marked on the chart perhaps deliberately and i had no idea what our position was in any case this wall seemed to signal the end of atlantis of which all in all we had crossed only a small part nightfall didn't interrupt my observations i was left to myself conseil had repaired to his cabin the nautilus slowed down hovering above the muddled masses on the seafloor sometimes grazing them as if wanting to come to rest sometimes rising unpredictably to the surface of the waves then i glimpsed a few bright constellations through the crystal waters specifically five or six of those zodiacal stars trailing from the tail end of orion i would have stayed longer at my window marveling at these beauties of sea and sky but the panels closed just then the nautilus had arrived at the perpendicular face of that high wall how the ship would maneuver i hadn't to guess i repaired to my stateroom the nautilus did not stir i fell asleep with the firm intention of waking up in just a few hours but it was eight o'clock the next day when i returned to the lounge i stared at the pressure gauge it told me that the nautilus was afloat on the surface of the ocean furthermore i heard the sound of footsteps on the platform yet there were no rolling movements to indicate the presence of waves undulating above me i climbed as far as the hatch it was open but instead of the broad daylight i was expecting i found that i was surrounded by total darkness where were we had i been mistaken was it still night no not one star was twinkling and nighttime is never so utterly black i wasn't sure what to think when a voice said to me is that you professor ah captain nemo i replied where are we underground professor 
underground i exclaimed and the nautilus is still floating it always floats but i don't understand wait a little while our beacon is about to go on and if you want some light on the subject you'll be satisfied i set foot on the platform and waited the darkness was so profound i couldn't see even captain nemo however looking at the zenith directly overhead i thought i caught sight of a feeble glimmer a sort of twilight filtering through a circular hole just then the beacon suddenly went on and its intense brightness made that hazy light vanish this stream of electricity dazzled my eyes and after momentarily shutting them i looked around the nautilus was stationary it was floating next to an embankment shaped like a wharf as for the water now buoying the ship it was a lake completely encircled by an inner wall about two miles in diameter hence six miles around its level as indicated by the pressure gauge would be the same as the outside level because some connection had to exist between this lake and the sea slanting inward over their base these high walls converged to form a vault shaped like an immense upside-down funnel that measured five hundred or six hundred meters in height at its summit there gaped the circular opening through which i had detected that faint glimmer obviously daylight before more carefully examining the interior features of this enormous cavern and before deciding if it was the work of nature or humankind i went over to captain nemo where are we i said in the very heart of an extinct volcano the captain answered me a volcano whose interior was invaded by the sea after some convulsion in the earth while you were sleeping professor the nautilus entered this lagoon through a natural channel that opens ten meters below the surface of the ocean this is our home port secure convenient secret and sheltered against winds from any direction along the coasts of your continents or islands show me any offshore mooring that can equal this safe refuge for withstanding the fury of hurricanes indeed i replied here you're in perfect safety captain nemo who could reach you in the heart of a volcano but don't i see an opening at its summit yes it's a crater a crater formerly filled with lava steam and flames but which now lets in this life-giving air we're breathing but which volcanic mountain is this i asked it's one of the many islets with which this sea is strewn for ships a mere reef for us an immense cavern i discovered it by chance and chance served me well but couldn't someone enter through the mouth of its crater no more than i could exit through it you can climb about a hundred feet up the inner base of this mountain but then the walls overhang they lean too far in to be scaled i can see captain that nature is your obedient servant any time or any place you're safe on this lake and nobody else can visit its waters but what's the purpose of this refuge the nautilus doesn't need a harbor no professor but it needs electricity to run batteries to generate its electricity sodium to feed its batteries coal to make its sodium and coal fields from which to dig its coal now then right at this spot the sea covers entire forests that sank under water in prehistoric times today turned to stone transformed into carbon fuel they offer me inexhaustible coal mines so captain your men practice the trade of miners here precisely these mines extend under the waves like the coal fields at newcastle here dressed in diving suits pick and mattock in hand my men go out and dig this carbon fuel for which i don't need a single mine on land when i burn this combustible to produce sodium the smoke escaping from the mountain's crater gives it the appearance of a still active volcano and will we see your companions at work no at least not this time because i'm eager to continue our underwater tour of the world 
accordingly i'll rest content with drawing on my reserve stock of sodium we'll stay here long enough to load it on board in other words a single workday then we'll resume our voyage so professor aronnax if you'd like to explore this cavern and circle its lagoon seize the day i thanked the captain and went to look for my two companions who hadn't yet left their cabin i invited them to follow me not telling them where we were they climbed onto the platform conseil whom nothing could startle saw it as a perfectly natural thing to fall asleep under the waves and wake up under a mountain but ned land had no idea in his head other than to see if this cavern offered some way out after breakfast near ten o'clock we went down onto the embankment so here we are back on shore conseil said i hardly call this shore the canadian replied and besides we aren't on it but under it a sandy beach unfolded before us measuring five hundred feet at its widest point between the waters of the lake and the foot of the mountain's walls via this strand you could easily circle the lake but the base of these high walls consisted of broken soil over which there lay picturesque piles of volcanic blocks and enormous pumice stones all these crumbling masses were covered with an enamel polished by the action of underground fires and they glistened under the stream of electric light from our beacon stirred up by our footsteps the mica-rich dust on this beach flew into the air like a cloud of sparks the ground rose appreciably as it moved away from the sand flats by the waves and we soon arrived at some long winding gradients genuinely steep paths that allowed us to climb little by little but we had to tread cautiously in the midst of pudding stones that weren't cemented together and our feet kept skidding on glassy trachyte made of feldspar and quartz crystals the volcanic nature of this enormous pit was apparent all around us i ventured to comment on it to my companions can you picture i asked them what this funnel must have been like when it was filled with boiling lava and the level of that incandescent liquid rose right to the mountain's mouth like cast iron up the insides of a furnace i can picture it perfectly conseil replied but will master tell me why this huge smelter suspended operations and how it is that an oven was replaced by the tranquil waters of a lake in all likelihood conseil because some convulsion created an opening below the surface of the ocean the opening that serves as a passageway for the nautilus then the waters of the atlantic rushed inside the mountain there ensued a dreadful struggle between the elements of fire and water a struggle ending in king neptune's favor but many centuries have passed since then and this submerged volcano has changed into a peaceful cavern that's fine ned land answered i accept the explanation but in our personal interests i'm sorry this opening the professor mentioned wasn't made above sea level but ned my friend conseil answered if it weren't an underwater passageway the nautilus couldn't enter it and i might add mr land i said that the waters wouldn't have rushed under the mountain and the volcano would still be a volcano so you have nothing to be sorry about our climb continued the gradients got steeper and narrower sometimes they were cut across by deep pits that had to be cleared masses of overhanging rock had to be gotten around you slid on your knees you crept on your belly but helped by the canadian's strength and conseil's dexterity we overcame every obstacle at an elevation of about thirty meters the nature of the terrain changed without becoming any easier pudding stones and trachyte gave way to black basaltic rock here lying in slabs all swollen with blisters there shaped like actual prisms and arranged into a series of columns that supported the springings of this immense vault a wonderful sample of natural architecture then among this basaltic rock there snaked long hardened lava flows inlaid with veins of bituminous coal and in places covered by wide carpets of sulphur 
the sunshine coming through the crater had grown stronger shedding a hazy light over all the volcanic waste forever buried in the hearts of this extinct mountain but when we had ascended to an elevation of about two hundred and fifty feet we were stopped by insurmountable obstacles the converging inside walls changed into overhangs and our climb into a circular stroll at this topmost level the vegetable kingdom began to challenge the mineral kingdom shrubs and even a few trees emerged from crevices in the walls i recognized some spurges that let their caustic purgative sap trickle out there were heliotropes very remiss at living up to their sun-worshipping reputations since no sunlight ever reached them their clusters of flowers drooped sadly their colors and scents were faded here and there chrysanthemums sprouted timidly at the feet of aloes with long sad sickly leaves but between these lava flows i spotted little violets that still gave off a subtle fragrance and i confess that i inhaled it with delight the soul of a flower is its scent and those splendid water plants flowers of the sea have no souls we had arrived at the foot of a sturdy clump of dragon trees which were splitting the rocks with exertions of their muscular roots when ned land exclaimed oh sir a hive a hive i answered with a gesture of utter disbelief yes a hive the canadian repeated with bees buzzing around i went closer and was forced to recognize the obvious at the mouth of a hole cut in the trunk of a dragon tree there swarmed thousands of these ingenious insects so common to all the canary islands where their output is especially prized naturally enough the canadian wanted to lay in a supply of honey and it would have been ill-mannered of me to say no he mixed sulphur with some dry leaves set them on fire with a spark from his tinder box and proceeded to smoke the bees out little by little the buzzing died down and the disemboweled hive yielded several pounds of sweet honey ned land stuffed his haversack with it when i've mixed this honey with our breadfruit batter he told us i'll be ready to serve you a delectable piece of cake but of course conseil put in it will be gingerbread i'm all for gingerbread i said but let's resume this fascinating stroll at certain turns in the trail we were going along the lake appeared in its full expanse the ship's beacon lit up that whole placid surface which experienced neither ripples nor undulations the nautilus lay perfectly still on its platform and on the embankment crewmen were bustling around black shadows that stood out clearly in the midst of the luminous air just then we went around the highest ridge of these rocky foothills that supported the vault then i saw that bees weren't the animal kingdom's only representatives inside this volcano here and in the shadows birds of prey soared and whirled flying away from nests perched on tips of rocks there were sparrow hawks with white bellies and screeching kestrels with all the speed their stilt-like legs could muster fine fat bustards scampered over the slopes i'll let the reader decide whether the canadian's appetite was aroused by the sight of this tasty game and whether he regretted having no rifle in his hands he tried to make stones do the work of bullets and after several fruitless attempts he managed to wound one of these magnificent bustards to say he risked his life twenty times in order to capture this bird is simply the unadulterated truth but he fared so well the animal went into his sack to join the honeycombs by then we were forced to go back down to the beach because the ridge had become impossible above us the yawning crater looked like the wide mouth of a well from where we stood the sky was pretty easy to see and i watched clouds race by disheveled by the west wind letting tatters of mist trail over the mountain's summit proof positive that those clouds kept at a moderate altitude because this volcano didn't rise more than eighteen hundred feet above the level of the ocean half an hour after the canadian's latest exploits we were back on the inner beach there the local flora was represented by a wide carpet of samphire a small umbelliferous plant that keeps quite nicely which also boasts the names glasswort saxifrage and sea fennel conseil picked a couple bunches 
as for the local fauna it included thousands of crustaceans of every type lobsters hermit crabs prawns mice and shrimps daddy longlegs rock crabs and a prodigious number of seashells such as cowries murex snails and limpets in this locality there gaped the mouth of a magnificent cave my companions and i took great pleasure in stretching out on its fine-grained sand fire had polished the sparkling enamel of its inner walls sprinkled all over with mica-rich dust ned land tapped these walls and tried to probe their thickness i couldn't help smiling our conversation then turned to his everlasting escape plans and without going too far i felt i could offer him this hope captain nemo had gone down south only to replenish his sodium supplies so i hoped he would now hug the coasts of europe and america which would allow the canadian to try again with a greater chance of success we were stretched out in this delightful cave for an hour our conversation lively at the outset then languished a definite drowsiness overcame us since i saw no good reason to resist the call of sleep i fell into a heavy doze i dreamed one doesn't choose his dreams that my life had been reduced to the vegetating existence of a simple mollusk it seemed to me that this cave made up my double valved shell suddenly conseil's voice startled me awake get up get up shouted the fine lad what is it i asked in a sitting position the water's coming up to us i got back on my feet like a torrent the sea was rushing into our retreat and since we definitely were not mollusks we had to clear out in a few seconds we were safe on top of the cave what happened conseil asked some new phenomenon not quite my friends i replied it was the tide merely the tide which well nigh caught us by surprise just as it did sir walter scott's hero the ocean outside is rising and by a perfectly natural law of balance the level of this lake is also rising we've gotten off with a mild dunking let's go change clothes on the nautilus three-quarters of an hour later we had completed our circular stroll and were back on board just then the crewmen finished loading the sodium supplies and the nautilus could have departed immediately but captain nemo gave no orders would he wait for nightfall and exit through his underwater passageway in secrecy perhaps be that as it may by the next day the nautilus had left its home port and was navigating well out from any shore a few meters beneath the waves of the atlantic End of Part 2, Chapter 10。Part 2, Chapter 11 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. Chapter 11, The Sargasso Sea. The Nautilus didn't change direction. For the time being, then, we had to set aside any hope of returning to European seas. Captain Nemo kept his prow pointing south. Where was he taking us? I was afraid to guess. That day the Nautilus crossed an odd part of the Atlantic Ocean. No one is unaware of the existence of that great warm-water current known by name as the Gulf Stream after emerging from channels off florida it heads towards spitzbergen but before entering the gulf of mexico near latitude forty four degrees north this current divides into two arms its chief arm makes for the shores of ireland and norway while the second flexes southward at the level of the azores then it hits the coast of africa sweeps in a long oval and returns to the caribbean sea now then this second arm more accurately a collar forms a ring of warm water around a section of cool tranquil motionless ocean called the sargasso sea this is an actual lake in the open atlantic and the great current's waters take at least three years to circle it properly speaking the sargasso sea covers every submerged part of atlantis certain authors have even held that the many weeds strewn over this sea were torn loose from the prairies of that ancient continent 
but it's more likely that these grasses algae and fucus plants were carried off from the beaches of europe and america then taken as far as this zone by the gulf stream this is one of the reasons why christopher columbus assumed the existence of a new world when the ships of that bold investigator arrived in the sargasso sea they had great difficulty navigating in the midst of these weeds which much to their crew's dismay slowed them down to a halt and they wasted three long weeks crossing this sector such was the region our nautilus was visiting just then a genuine prairie a tightly woven carpet of algae gulf weed and bladder rack so dense and compact a craft's stem post couldn't tear through it without difficulty accordingly not wanting to entangle his propeller in this weed choked mass captain nemo stayed at a depth some meters below the surface of the waves the name sargasso comes from the spanish word sargazo meaning gulf weed this gulf weed the swimming gulf weed or berry carrier is the chief substance making up this immense shoal and here's why these water plants collect in this placid atlantic basin according to the expert on the subject commander maori author of the physical geography of the sea the explanation he gives seems to entail a set of conditions that everybody knows now maori says if bits of cork or chafe or any floating substance be put into a basin and a circular motion be given to the water all the light substances will be found crowding together near the center of the pool where there is the least motion just such a basin is the atlantic ocean to the gulf stream and the sargasso sea is the center of the whirl i share maori's view and i was able to study the phenomenon in this exclusive setting where ships rarely go above us huddled among the brown weeds there floated objects originating from all over tree trunks ripped from the rocky mountains or the andes and sent floating down the amazon or the mississippi numerous pieces of wreckage remnants of keels or undersides bulwarks staved in and so weighed down with seashells and barnacles they couldn't rise to the surface of the ocean and the passing years will some day bear out maori's other view that by collecting in this way over the centuries these substances will be turned to stone by the action of the waters and will then form inexhaustible coal fields valuable reserves prepared by far-seeing nature for that time when man will have exhausted his mines on the continents in the midst of this hopelessly tangled fabric of weeds and fucus plants i noted some delightful pink-colored star-shaped alcyon coral sea anemone trailing the long tresses of their tentacles some green red and blue jellyfish and especially those big rhizome jellyfish that cuvier described whose bluish parasols are trimmed with violet festoons we spent the whole day of february twenty second in the sargasso sea where fish that dote on marine plants and crustaceans find plenty to eat the next day the ocean resumed its usual appearance from this moment on for nineteen days from february twenty three to march twelve the nautilus stayed in the middle of the atlantic hustling us along at a constant speed of one hundred leagues every twenty four hours it was obvious that captain nemo wanted to carry out his underwater program and i had no doubt that he intended after doubling cape horn to return to the pacific south seas so ned land had good reason to worry in these wide seas empty of islands it was no longer feasible to jump ship nor did we have any way to counter captain nemo's whims we had no choice but to acquiesce but if we couldn't attain our end through force or cunning i liked to think that we might achieve it through persuasion once this voyage was over might not captain nemo consent to set us free in return for our promise never to reveal his existence our word of honor which we sincerely would have kept however this delicate question would have to be negotiated with the captain but how would he receive our demands for freedom at the very outset and in no uncertain terms hadn't he declared that the secret of his life required that we be permanently imprisoned on board the nautilus 
wouldn't he see my four-month silence as a tacit acceptance of this situation would my returning to this subject arouse suspicions that could jeopardize our escape plans if we had promising circumstances for trying again later on i weighed all these considerations turned them over in my mind submitted them to conseil but he was as baffled as i was in short although i'm not easily discouraged i realized that my chances of ever seeing my fellow men again were shrinking by the day especially at a time when captain nemo was recklessly racing toward the south atlantic during those nineteen days just mentioned no unique incidents distinguished our voyage i saw little of the captain he was at work in the library i often found books he had left open especially books on natural history he had thumbed through my work on the great ocean depths and the margins were covered with his notes which sometimes contradicted my theories and formulations but the captain remained content with this method of refining my work and he rarely discussed it with me sometimes i heard melancholy sounds reverberating from the organ which he played very expressively but only at night in the midst of the most secretive darkness while the nautilus slumbered in the wilderness of the ocean during this part of our voyage we navigated on the surface of the waves for entire days the sea was nearly deserted a few sailing ships laden for the east indies were heading toward the cape of good hope one day we were chased by the longboats of a whaling vessel which undoubtedly viewed us as some enormous baleen whale of great value but captain nemo didn't want these gallant gentlemen wasting their time and energy so he ended the hunt by diving beneath the waves this incident seemed to fascinate ned land intensely i'm sure the canadian was sorry that these fishermen couldn't harpoon our sheet-iron cetacean and mortally wound it during this period the fish conseil and i observed differed little from those we had already studied in other latitudes chief among them were specimens of that dreadful cartilaginous genus that's divided into three subgenera numbering at least thirty-two species striped sharks five meters long the head squat and wider than the body the caudal fin curved the back with seven big black parallel lines running lengthwise then purlon sharks ash gray pierced with seven gill openings furnished with a single dorsal fin placed almost exactly in the middle of the body some big dogfish also passed by a voracious species of shark if there ever was one with some justice fishermen's yarns aren't to be trusted but here's what a few of them relate inside the corpse of one of these animals there were found a buffalo head and a whole calf in another two tuna and a sailor in uniform in yet another a soldier with his saber in another finally a horse with its rider in candor none of these sounds like divinely inspired truth but the fact remains that not a single dogfish let itself get caught in the nautilus's nets so i can't vouch for their veracity schools of elegant playful dolphins swam along for entire days they went in groups of five or six hunting in packs like wolves over the countryside moreover they're just as voracious as dogfish if i can believe a certain copenhagen professor who says that from one dolphin's stomach he removed thirteen porpoises and fifteen seals true it was a killer whale belonging to the biggest known species whose length sometimes exceeds twenty-four feet the family delphinia numbers ten genera and the dolphins i saw were akin to the genus delphinorynchius remarkable for an extremely narrow muzzle four times as long as the cranium measuring three meters their bodies were black on top underneath a pinkish white strewn with small very scattered spots from these seas i'll also mention some unusual specimens of croakers fish from the order acanthopterygia family cyanidea some authors more artistic than scientific claim that these fish are melodious singers that their voices in unison put on concerts unmatched by human choristers i don't say nay but to my regret these croakers didn't serenade us as we passed finally to conclude conseil classified a large number of flying fish nothing could have made a more unusual sight than the marvelous timing with which dolphins hunt these fish 
whatever the range of its flight however evasive its trajectory even up and over the nautilus the hapless flying fish always found a dolphin to welcome it with open mouth these were either flying gurnards or kite-like sea robins whose lips glowed in the dark at night scrawling fiery streaks in the air before plunging into the murky waters like so many shooting stars our navigating continued under these conditions until march thirteenth that day the nautilus was put to work in some depth-sounding experiments that fascinated me deeply by then we had fared nearly thirteen thousand leagues from our starting point in the pacific high seas our position fix placed us in latitude forty five degrees thirty seven minutes south and longitude thirty seven degrees fifty three minutes west these were the same waterways where captain denham aboard the herald paid out fourteen thousand meters of sounding line without finding bottom it was here too that lieutenant parker aboard the american frigate congress was unable to reach the underwater soil at fifteen thousand one hundred and forty nine meters captain nemo decided to take his nautilus down to the lowest depths in order to double check these different soundings i got ready to record the results of this experiment the panels in the lounge opened and maneuvers began for reaching those strata so prodigiously far removed it was apparently considered out of the question to dive by filling the ballast tanks perhaps they wouldn't sufficiently increase the nautilus's specific gravity moreover in order to come back up it would be necessary to expel the excess water and our pumps might not have been strong enough to overcome the outside pressure captain nemo decided to make for the ocean floor by submerging on an appropriately gradual diagonal with the help of his side fins which were set at a forty five degree angle to the nautilus's water line then the propeller was brought to its maximum speed and its four blades churned the waves with indescribable violence under this powerful thrust the nautilus's hull quivered like a resonating cord and the ship sank steadily under the waters stationed in the lounge the captain and i watched the needle swerving swiftly over the pressure gauge soon we had gone below the livable zone where most fish reside some of these animals can thrive only at the surface of seas or rivers but a minority can dwell at fairly great depths among the latter i observed a species of dogfish called the cow shark that's equipped with six respiratory slits a telescope fish with its enormous eyes the armored grenard with gray thoracic fins plus black pectoral fins and a breastplate protected by pale red slabs of bone then finally the grenadier living at a depth of twelve hundred meters by that point tolerating a pressure of one hundred and twenty atmospheres i asked captain nemo if he had observed any fish at more considerable depths fish rarely he answered me but given the current state of marine science who are we to presume what do we really know of these depths just this captain in going toward the ocean's lower strata we know that vegetable life disappears more quickly than animal life we know that moving creatures can still be encountered where water plants no longer grow we know that oysters and pilgrim scallops live in two thousand meters of water and that admiral mcclintock england's hero of the polar seas pulled in a live sea star from a depth of twenty five hundred meters we know that the crew of the royal navy's bulldog fished up a starfish from two thousand six hundred and twenty fathoms hence from a depth of more than one vertical league would you still say captain nemo that we really know nothing no professor the captain replied i wouldn't be so discourteous yet i will ask you to explain how these creatures can live at such depths i explained it on two grounds i replied in the first place because vertical currents which are caused by differences in the water's salinity and density can produce enough motion to sustain the rudimentary lifestyles of sea lilies and starfish true the captain put in in the second place because oxygen is the basis of life and we know that the amount of oxygen dissolved in salt water increases rather than decreases with depth that the pressure in these lower strata helps to concentrate their oxygen content oh we know that do we captain nemo replied in a tone of mild surprise 
well, professor, we have good reason to know it, because it's the truth. I might add, in fact, that the air bladders of fish contain more nitrogen than oxygen when these animals are caught at the surface of the water, and conversely, more oxygen than nitrogen when they're pulled up from the lower depths, which bears out your formulation. But let's continue our observations. My eyes flew back to the pressure gauge. The instrument indicated a depth of 6,000 meters. Our submergence had been going on for an hour. The Nautilus slid downward on its slanting fins, still sinking. These deserted waters were wonderfully clear, with a transparency impossible to convey. An hour later, we were at 13,000 meters, about three and a quarter vertical leagues, and the ocean floor was nowhere in sight. However, at 14,000 meters, I saw blackish peaks rising in the midst of the waters, but these summits could have belonged to mountains as high or even higher than the Himalayas or Mont Blanc, and the extent of these depths remained incalculable. Despite the powerful pressures it was undergoing, the Nautilus sank still deeper. I could feel its sheet-iron plates trembling down to their riveted joins, metal bars arched bulkheads groaned the lounge windows seemed to be warping inward under the water's pressure and this whole sturdy mechanism would surely have given way if as its captain had said it weren't capable of resisting like a solid block while grazing these rocky slopes lost under the waters i still spotted some seashells tube worms lively annelid worms from the genus spirorbis and certain starfish specimens but soon these last representatives of animal life vanished, and three vertical leagues down, the Nautilus passed below the limits of underwater existence just as an air balloon rises above the breathable zones in the sky. We reached a depth of 16,000 meters, four vertical leagues, and by then the Nautilus's plating was tolerating a pressure of 1,600 atmospheres, in other words, 1,600 kilograms per each square centimeter on its surface. What an experience, I exclaimed, traveling these deep regions where no man has ever ventured before. Look, Captain, look at these magnificent rocks, these uninhabited caves, these last global haunts where life is no longer possible. What unheard of scenery, and why are we reduced to preserving it only as a memory? would you like captain nemo asked me to bring back more than just a memory what do you mean i mean that nothing could be easier than taking a photograph of this underwater region before i had time to express the surprise this new proposition caused me a camera was carried into the lounge at captain nemo's request the liquid setting, electrically lit, unfolded with perfect clarity through the wide-open panels. No shadows, no blurs, thanks to our artificial light. Not even sunshine could have been better for our purposes. With the thrust of its propeller curved by the slant of its fins, the Nautilus stood still. The camera was aimed at the scenery on the ocean floor, and in a few seconds we had a perfect negative. I attach a print of the positive. In it, you can view these primordial rocks that have never seen the light of day. This nether granite that forms the powerful foundation of our globe. The deep caves cut into the stony mass. The outlines of incomparable distinctness whose far edges stand out in black, as if from the brush of certain Flemish painters. In the distance is a mountainous horizon, a wondrously undulating line that makes up the background of this landscape. The general effect of these smooth rocks is indescribable. Black, polished, without moss or other blemish, carved into strange shapes, sitting firmly on a carpet of sand that sparkled beneath our streams of electric light. Meanwhile, his photographic operations over, Captain Nemo told me, Let's go back up, Professor. We mustn't push our luck and expose the Nautilus too long to these pressures. Let's go back up, I replied. Hold on tight. Before I had time to realize why the captain made this recommendation, I was hurled to the carpet. Its fins set vertically, its propeller thrown in gear at the captain's signal, the Nautilus rose with lightning speed, shooting upward like an air balloon into the sky. 
vibrating resonantly it knifed through the watery mass not a single detail was visible in four minutes it had cleared the four vertical leagues separating it from the surface of the ocean and after emerging like a flying fish it fell back into the sea making the waves leap to prodigious heights end of part two chapter eleven Part 2, Chapter 12 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. Chapter 12 Sperm Whales and Baleen Whales. During the night of March 13 14, the Nautilus resumed its southward heading. Once it was abreast of Cape Horn, I thought it would strike west of the Cape, make for Pacific seas, and complete its tour of the world. It did nothing of the sort, and kept moving toward the southernmost regions. So where was it bound? The Pole? That was insanity. I was beginning to think that the captain's recklessness more than justified Ned Land's worst fears. For a good while, the Canadian had said nothing more to me about his escape plans. He had become less sociable, almost sullen. I could see how heavily this protracted imprisonment was weighing on him. I could feel the anger building in him. Whenever he encountered the captain, his eyes would flicker with dark fire, and I was in constant dread that his natural vehemence would cause him to do something rash. That day, March 14, he and Conseil managed to find me in the stateroom. I asked them the purpose of their visit. "'To put a simple question to you, sir,' the Canadian answered me. "'Go on, Ned.' "'How many men do you think are on board the Nautilus?' I'm unable to say, my friend. It seems to me, Ned Land went on, that it wouldn't take much of a crew to run a ship like this one. Correct, I replied. Under existing conditions, some ten men at the most should be enough to operate it. All right, the Canadian said. Then why should there be any more than that? Why? I answered. I stared at Ned Land, whose motives were easy to guess. Because, I said, if I can trust my hunches, if I truly understand the captain's way of life, his Nautilus isn't simply a ship. It's meant to be a refuge for people like its commander, people who have severed all ties with the shore. Perhaps, Conseil said, but in a nutshell, the Nautilus can hold only a certain number of men, so couldn't Master estimate their maximum? How, Conseil? by calculating it master is familiar with the ship's capacity hence the amount of air it contains on the other hand master knows how much air each man consumes in the act of breathing and he can compare this data with the fact that the nautilus must rise to the surface every twenty-four hours conseil didn't finish his sentence but i could easily see what he was driving at i follow you i said but while they're simple to do, such calculations can give only a very uncertain figure. No problem, the Canadian went on insistently. Then here's how I calculate it, I replied. In one hour, each man consumes the oxygen contained in 100 liters of air. Hence, during 24 hours, the oxygen contained in 2,400 liters. Therefore, we must look for the multiple of 2,400 liters of air that gives us the amount found in the Nautilus. Precisely, Conseil said. Now then, I went on, the Nautilus's capacity is 1,500 metric tons, and that of a ton is 1,000 liters, so the Nautilus holds 1,500,000 liters of air, which divided by 2,400, I did a quick pencil calculation, gives us the quotient of 625, which is tantamount to saying that the air contained in the Nautilus would be exactly enough for 625 men over 24 hours. 625, Ned repeated. But rest assured, I added, that between passengers, seamen, or officers, we don't total one-tenth of that figure. Which is still too many for three men, Conseil muttered. So, my poor Ned, I can only counsel patience. And, Conseil replied, even more than patience, resignation. Conseil had said the true word. 
even so he went on captain nemo can't go south forever he'll surely have to stop if only at the ice bank and he'll return to the seas of civilization then it will be time to resume ned land's plans the canadian shook his head passed his hand over his brow made no reply and left us with master's permission i'll make an observation to him conseil then told me our poor ned broods about all the things he can't have he's haunted by his former life he seems to miss everything that's denied us he's obsessed by his old memories and it's breaking his heart we must understand him what does he have to occupy him here nothing he isn't a scientist like master and he doesn't share our enthusiasm for the sea's wonders he would risk anything just to enter a tavern in his own country to be sure the monotony of life on board must have seemed unbearable to the canadian who was accustomed to freedom and activity it was a rare event that could excite him that day however a development occurred that reminded him of his happy years as a harpooner near eleven o'clock in the morning while on the surface of the ocean the nautilus fell in with a herd of baleen whales this encounter didn't surprise me because i knew these animals were being hunted so relentlessly that they took refuge in the ocean basins of the high latitudes in the maritime world and in the realm of geographic exploration whales have played a major role this is the animal that first dragged the basques in its wake then the asturian spaniards englishmen and dutchmen emboldening them against the ocean's perils and leading them to the ends of the earth baleen whales like to frequent the southernmost and northernmost seas old legends even claim that these cetaceans led fishermen to within a mere seven leagues of the north pole although this feat is fictitious it will some day come true because it's likely that by hunting whales in the arctic and antarctic regions man will finally reach this unknown spot on the globe we were seated on the platform next to a tranquil sea the month of march since it's the equivalent of october in these latitudes was giving us some fine autumn days it was the canadian on this topic he was never mistaken who sighted a baleen whale on the eastern horizon if you looked carefully you could see its blackish back alternately rise and fall above the waves five miles from the nautilus wow ned land exclaimed if i were on board a whaler that's an encounter that would be great fun that's one big animal look how high its blowholes are spouting all that air and steam damnation why am i changed to this hunk of sheet iron why ned i replied you still aren't over your old fishing urges how could a whale fisherman forget his old trade sir who could ever get tired of such exciting hunting you've never fished these seas ned never sir just the northernmost seas equally in the bering strait and the davis strait so the southern right whale is still unknown to you until now it's the bowhead whale you've hunted and it won't risk going past the warm waters of the equator oh professor what are you feeding me the canadian answered in a tolerably skeptical tone i'm feeding you the facts by thunder in sixty-five just two and a half years ago i to whom you speak i myself stepped onto the carcass of a whale near greenland and its flank still carried the marked harpoon of a whaling ship from the bering sea now i ask you after it had been wounded west of america how could this animal be killed in the east unless it had cleared the equator and doubled cape horn or the cape of good hope i agree with our friend ned conseil said and i'm waiting to hear how master will reply to him master will reply my friends that baleen whales are localized according to species within certain seas that they never leave and if one of these animals went from the bering strait to the davis strait it's quite simply because there's some passageway from one sea to the other either along the coasts of canada or siberia you expect us to fall for that the canadian asked tipping me a wink if master says so conseil replied which means the canadian went on since i've never fished these waterways i don't know the whales that frequent them that's what i've been telling you ned all the more reason to get to know them 
conseil answered look look the canadian exclaimed his voice full of excitement it's approaching it's coming toward us it's thumbing its nose at me it knows i can't do a blessed thing to it ned stamped his foot brandishing an imaginary harpoon his hands positively trembled these cetaceans he asked are they as big as the ones in the northernmost seas pretty nearly ned because i've seen big baleen whales sir whales measuring up to a hundred feet long i've even heard that those rorqual whales off the aleuthian islands sometimes get over a hundred and fifty feet that strikes me as exaggerated i replied those animals are only members of the genus balaenoptera furnished with dorsal fins like the sperm whales they're generally smaller than the bowhead whale oh exclaimed the canadian whose eyes hadn't left the ocean it's getting closer it's coming into the nautilus's waters then going on with his conversation you talk about sperm whales he said as if they were little beasts but there are stories of gigantic sperm whales they're shrewd cetaceans i hear that some will cover themselves with algae and fucus plants people mistake them for islets they pitch camp on top make themselves at home light a fire build houses conseil said yes funny man ned land replied then one fine day the animal dives and drags all its occupants down into the depths like in the voyages of sinbad the sailor i answered laughing oh mr land you're addicted to tall tales what sperm whales you're handing us i hope you don't really believe in them mr naturalist the canadian replied in all seriousness when it comes to whales you can believe anything look at that one move look at it stealing away people claim these animals can circle around the world in just fifteen days i don't say nay but what you undoubtedly don't know professor aronnax is that at the beginning of the world whales traveled even quicker oh really ned and why so because in those days their tails moved side to side like those on fish in other words their tails were straight up thrashing the water from left to right right to left but spotting that they swam too fast our creator twisted their tails and ever since they've been thrashing the waves up and down at the expense of their speed fine ned i said then resurrected one of the canadian's expressions you expect us to fall for that not too terribly ned land replied and no more than if i told you there are whales that are three hundred feet long and weigh a million pounds that's indeed considerable i said but you must admit that certain cetaceans do grow to significant size since they're said to supply as much as a hundred and twenty metric tons of oil that i've seen the canadian said i can easily believe it ned just as i can believe that certain baleen whales equal one hundred elephants in bulk imagine the impact of such a mass if it were launched at full speed is it true conseil asked that they can sink ships ships i doubt it i replied however they say that in eighteen twenty right in these southern seas a baleen whale rushed at the essex and pushed it backward at a speed of four meters per second its stern was flooded and the essex went down fast ned looked at me with a bantering expression speaking for myself he said i once got walloped by a whale's tail in my longboat needless to say my companions and i were launched to an altitude of six meters but next to the professor's whale mine was just a baby do these animals live a long time conseil asked a thousand years the canadian replied without hesitation and how ned i asked do you know that's so because people say so and why do people say so because people know so no ned people don't know so they suppose so and here's the logic with which they back up their beliefs when fishermen first hunted whales four hundred years ago these animals grew to bigger sizes than they do today reasonably enough it's assumed that today's whales are smaller because they haven't had time to reach their full growth that's why the count de buffoon's encyclopedia says that cetaceans can live and even must live for a thousand years you understand ned land didn't understand he no longer even heard me that baleen whale kept coming closer his eyes devoured it oh he exclaimed it's not just one whale it's ten twenty 
a whole gam! And I can't do a thing! I'm tied hand and foot!" "But Ned, my friend," Conseil said, "why not ask Captain Nemo for permission to hunt?" Before Conseil could finish his sentence, Ned Land scooted down the hatch and ran to look for the captain. A few moments later, the two of them reappeared on the platform. Captain Nemo observed the herd of cetaceans cavorting on the waters a mile from the Nautilus. "They're southern right whales," he said. "There goes the fortune of a whole whaling fleet." "Well, sir," the Canadian asked, "couldn't I hunt them, just so I don't forget my old harpooning trade?" "Hunt them? What for?" Captain Nemo replied. "Simply to destroy them. We have no use for whale oil on this ship." "But, sir," the Canadian went on, "in the Red Sea you authorized us to chase a dugong." There it was an issue of obtaining fresh meat for my crew. Here it would be killing for the sake of killing. I'm well aware that's a privilege reserved for mankind, but I don't allow such murderous pastimes. When your peers, Mr. Land, destroy decent, harmless creatures like the southern right whale or the bowhead whale, they commit a reprehensible offense. Thus, they've already dispopulated all of Baffin Bay, and they'll wipe out a whole class of useful animals. So leave these poor cetaceans alone. They have quite enough natural enemies, such as sperm whales, swordfish, and sawfish, without you meddling with them. I'll let the reader decide what faces the Canadian made during this lecture on hunting ethics. Furnishing such arguments to a professional harpooner was a waste of words. Ned Land stared at Captain Nemo and obviously missed his meaning, but the captain was right. Thanks to the mindless, barbaric bloodthirstiness of fishermen, the last baleen whale will some day disappear from the ocean. Ned Land whistled Yankee Doodle between his teeth, stuffed his hands in his pockets, and turned his back on us. Meanwhile, Captain Nemo studied the herd of cetaceans, then addressed me. I was right to claim that baleen whales have enough natural enemies without counting man. These specimens will soon have to deal with mighty opponents. Eight miles to leeward, Professor Aronnax. Can you see those blackish specks moving about? Yes, Captain, I replied. Those are sperm whales, dreadful animals that I've sometimes encountered in herds of two hundred or three hundred. As for them, they are cruel, destructive beasts, and they deserve to be exterminated. The Canadian turned swiftly at these last words. Well, Captain, I said, on behalf of the baleen whales, there's still time. It's pointless to run any risks, Professor. The Nautilus will suffice to disperse these sperm whales. It's armed with a steel spur quite equal to Mr. Land's harpoon, I imagine. The Canadian didn't bother shrugging his shoulders. Attacking cetaceans with thrusts from a spur? Who ever heard of such malarkey? Wait and see, Professor Aronnax. Captain Nemo said. We'll show you a style of hunting with which you aren't yet familiar. We'll take no pity on these ferocious cetaceans. They are merely mouth and teeth. Mouth and teeth. There's no better way to describe the long-skulled sperm whale, whose length sometimes exceeds 25 meters. The enormous head of this cetacean occupies about a third of its body. Better armed than a baleen whale, whose upper jaw is adorned solely with whalebone, the sperm whale is equipped with twenty-five huge teeth that are twenty centimeters high, have cylindrical, conical summits, and weigh two pounds each. In the top part of this enormous head, inside big cavities separated by cartilage, you'll find three hundred to four hundred kilograms of that valuable oil called spermaceti. The sperm whale is an awkward animal more tadpole than fish, as Professor Fredal has noted. It's poorly constructed, being defective, so to speak, over the whole left side of its frame, with good eyesight only in its right eye. Meanwhile, the monstrous herd kept coming closer. It had seen the baleen whales and was preparing to attack. You could tell in advance that the sperm whales would be victorious, not only because they were better built for fighting than their harmless adversaries, but also because they could stay longer under water before returning to breathe at the surface. There was just time to run to the rescue of the baleen whales. The Nautilus proceeded to mid-water. Conseil, Ned, and I sat in front of the lounge windows. 
captain nemo made his way to the helmsman's side to operate his submersible as an engine of destruction soon i felt the beats of our propeller getting faster and we picked up speed the battle between sperm whales and baleen whales had already begun when the nautilus arrived it maneuvered to cut into the herd of long-skulled predators at first the latter showed little concern at the sight of this new monster meddling in the battle but they soon had to sidestep its thrusts what a struggle ned land quickly grew enthusiastic and even ended up applauding brandished in its captain's hands the nautilus was simply a fearsome harpoon he hurled it at those fleshy masses and ran them clean through leaving behind two squirming animal halves as for those daunting strokes of the tail hitting our sides the ship never felt them no more than the collisions it caused one sperm whale exterminated it ran at another tacked on the spot so as not to miss its prey went ahead or astern obeyed its rudder dived when the cetacean sank to deeper strata rose when it returned to the surface struck it head-on or slantwise hacked at it or tore it and from every direction and at any speed skewered it with its dreadful spur what bloodshed what a hubbub on the surface of the waves what sharp hisses and snorts unique to these frightened animals their tails churned that normally peaceful strata into actual billows this homeric slaughter dragged on for an hour and the long-skulled predators couldn't get away several times ten or twelve of them teamed up trying to crush the nautilus with their sheer mass through the windows you could see their enormous mouths paved with teeth their fearsome eyes losing all self-control ned land hurled threats and insults at them you could feel them clinging to the submersible like hounds atop a wild boar in the underbrush but by forcing the pace of its propeller the nautilus carried them off dragged them under or brought them back to the upper levels of the waters untroubled by their enormous weight or their powerful grip finally this mass of sperm whales thinned out the waves grew tranquil again i felt us rising to the surface of the ocean the hatch opened and we rushed onto the platform the sea was covered with mutilated corpses a fearsome explosion couldn't have slashed torn or shredded these fleshy masses with greater violence we were floating in the midst of gigantic bodies bluish on the back whitish on the belly and all deformed by enormous protuberances a few frightened sperm whales were fleeing toward the horizon the waves were dyed red over an area of several miles and the nautilus was floating in the middle of a sea of blood captain nemo rejoined us well mr land he said well sir replied the canadian whose enthusiasm had subsided it's a dreadful sight for sure but i'm a hunter not a butcher and this is plain butchery it was a slaughter of destructive animals the captain replied and the nautilus is no butcher knife i prefer my harpoon the canadian answered to each his own the captain replied staring intently at ned land i was in dread the latter would give way to some violent outburst that might have had deplorable consequences but his anger was diverted by the sight of a baleen whale that the nautilus had pulled alongside of just then this animal had been unable to escape the teeth of those sperm whales i recognized the southern right whale its head squat its body dark all over anatomically it's distinguished from the white whale and the black right whale by the fusion of its seven cervical vertebra and it numbers two more ribs than its relatives floating on its side its belly riddled with bites the poor cetacean was dead still hanging from the tip of its mutilated fin was a little baby whale that it had been unable to rescue from the slaughter its open mouth let water flow through its whalebone like a murmuring surf captain nemo guided the nautilus next to the animal's corpse two of his men climbed onto the whale's flank and to my astonishment i saw them draw from its udders all the milk they held in other words enough to fill two or three casks the captain offered me a cup of this still warm milk I couldn't help showing my distaste for such a beverage he assured me that this milk was excellent no different from cow's milk i sampled it and agreed so this milk was a worthwhile reserve ration for us because in the form of salt butter or cheese it would provide a pleasant change of pace from our standard fare 
from that day on, I noted with some uneasiness that Ned Land's attitudes toward Captain Nemo grew worse and worse, and I decided to keep a close watch on the Canadian's movements and activities. End of Part 2, Chapter 12《Part Two, Chapter Thirteen of Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. Chapter Thirteen, The Ice Bank. The Nautilus resumed its unruffled southbound heading. It went along the fiftieth meridian with considerable speed. Would it go to the pole? I didn't think so, because every previous attempt to reach this spot on the globe had failed. Besides, the season was already quite advanced, since March 13 on Antarctic shores corresponds with September 13 in the northernmost regions, which marks the beginning of the equinoctial period. On March 14, at latitude 55 degrees, I spotted floating ice, plain pale bits of rubble 20 to 25 feet long, which formed reefs over which the sea burst into foam. The Nautilus stayed on the surface of the ocean. Having fished in the Arctic seas, Ned Land was already familiar with the sight of icebergs. Conseil and I were marveling at them for the first time. In the sky, toward the southern horizon, there stretched a dazzling white band. English whalers have given this the name Ice Blink. No matter how heavy the clouds may be, they can't obscure this phenomenon. It announces the presence of a pack or shoal of ice indeed larger blocks of ice soon appeared their brilliance varying at the whim of the mists some of these masses displayed green veins as if scrawled with undulating lines of copper sulfate others looked like enormous amethysts letting the light penetrate their insides the latter reflected the sun's rays from a thousand facets of their crystals the former, tinted with a bright limestone sheen, would have supplied enough building material to make a whole marble town. The farther down south we went, the more these floating islands grew in numbers and prominence. Polar birds nested on them by the thousands. These were petrels, cape pigeons, or puffins, and their calls were deafening. Mistaking the Nautilus for the corpse of a whale, some of them alighted on it and prodded its resonant sheet iron with pecks of their beaks. During this navigating in the midst of the ice, Captain Nemo often stayed on the platform. He observed these deserted waterways carefully. I saw his calm eyes sometimes perk up. In these polar seas forbidden to man, did he feel right at home, the lord of these unreachable regions? perhaps but he didn't say he stood still reviving only when his pilot's instincts took over then steering his nautilus with consummate dexterity he skillfully dodged the masses of ice some of which measured several miles in length their heights varying from seventy to eighty meters often the horizon seemed completely closed off abreast of latitude sixty degrees every passageway had disappeared Searching with care, Captain Nemo soon found a narrow opening into which he brazenly slipped, well aware, however, that it would close behind him. Guided by his skillful hands, the Nautilus passed by all these different masses of ice, which are classified by size and shape with a precision that enraptured Conseil. Icebergs, or mountains, ice fields, or smooth, limitless tracts, drift ice, or floating flows, packs or broken tracts called patches when they're circular and streams when they form long strips the temperature was fairly low exposed to the outside air the thermometer marked minus two degrees to minus three degrees centigrade but we were warmly dressed in furs for which seals and aquatic bears had paid the price evenly heated by all its electric equipment the nautilus's interior defied the most intense cold Moreover, to find a bearable temperature, the ship had only to sink just a few meters beneath the waves. 
two months earlier we would have enjoyed perpetual daylight in this latitude but night already fell for three or four hours and later it would cast six months of shadow over these circumpolar regions on march fifteen we passed beyond the latitude of the south shetland and south orkney islands the captain told me that many tribes of seals used to inhabit these shores but english and american whalers in a frenzy of destruction slaughtered all the adults including pregnant females and where life and activity once existed those fishermen left behind only silence and death going along the fifty-fifth meridian the nautilus cut the antarctic circle on march sixteenth near eight o'clock in the morning ice completely surrounded us and closed off the horizon nevertheless captain nemo went from passageway to passageway always proceeding south but where is he going i asked straight ahead conseil replied ultimately when he can't go any farther he'll stop i wouldn't bet on it i replied and in all honesty i confess that this venturesome excursion was far from displeasing to me i can't express the intensity of my amazement at the beauties of these new regions the ice struck superb poses here its general effect suggested an oriental town with countless minarets and mosques there a city in ruins flung to the ground by convulsions in the earth these views were varied continuously by the sun's oblique rays or were completely swallowed up by gray mists in the middle of blizzards then explosions cave-ins and great iceberg somersaults would occur all around us altering the scenery like the changing landscape in a diorama if the nautilus was submerged during these losses of balance we heard the resulting noises spread under the waters with frightful intensity and the collapse of these masses created daunting eddies down to the ocean's lower strata the nautilus then rolled and pitched like a ship left to the fury of the elements often no longer seeing any way out i thought we were imprisoned for good but captain nemo guided by his instincts discovered new passageways from the tiniest indications he was never wrong when he observed slender threads of bluish water streaking through these ice fields accordingly i was sure that he had already risked his nautilus in the midst of the antarctic seas however during the day of march sixteen these tracts of ice completely barred our path it wasn't the ice bank as yet just huge ice fields cemented together by the cold this obstacle couldn't stop captain nemo and he launched his ship against the ice fields with hideous violence the nautilus went into these brittle masses like a wedge splitting them with dreadful cracklings it was an old-fashioned battering ram propelled with infinite power hurled aloft ice rubble fell back around us like hail through brute force alone the submersible carved out a channel for itself carried away by its momentum the ship sometimes mounted on top of these tracts of ice and crushed them with its weight or at other times when cooped up beneath the ice fields it split them with simple pitching movements creating wide punctures violent squalls assaulted us during the daytime thanks to certain heavy mists we couldn't see from one end of the platform to the other the wind shifted abruptly to every point on the compass the snow was piling up in such packed layers it had to be chipped loose with blows from picks even in a temperature of merely minus five degrees centigrade every outside part of the nautilus was covered with ice a ship's rigging would have been unusable because all its tackle would have jammed in the grooves of the pulleys only a craft without sails driven by an electric motor that needed no coal could face such high latitudes under these conditions the barometer generally stayed quite low it fell as far as seventy three point five centimeters our compass indications no longer offered any guarantees the deranged needles would mark contradictory directions as we approached the southern magnetic pole which doesn't coincide with the south pole proper in fact according to the astronomer hastin this magnetic pole is located fairly close to latitude seventy degrees and longitude one hundred and thirty degrees or abiding by the observations of louis isidore du perret in longitude one thirty five degrees and latitude seventy degrees thirty minutes 
hence we had to transport compasses to different parts of the ship take many readings and strike an average often we would chart our course only by guesswork a less than satisfactory method in the midst of these winding passageways whose landmarks change continuously at last on march eighteen after twenty futile assaults the nautilus was decisively held in check no longer was it an ice stream patch or field it was an endless immovable barrier formed by ice mountains fused to each other the ice bank the canadian told me for ned land as well as for every navigator before us i knew that this was the great insurmountable obstacle when the sun appeared for an instant near noon captain nemo took a reasonably accurate sight that gave our position as longitude fifty one degrees thirty minutes and latitude sixty seven degrees thirty nine minutes south this was a position already well along in these antarctic regions as for the liquid surface of the sea there was no longer any semblance of it before our eyes before the nautilus's spur there lay vast broken plains a tangle of confused chunks with all the helter-skelter unpredictability typical of a river's surface a short while before its ice break-up but in this case the proportions were gigantic here and there stood sharp peaks lean spires that rose as high as two hundred feet farther off a succession of steeply cut cliffs sporting a grayish tint huge mirrors that reflected the sparse rays of the sun half drowned in mist beyond a stark silence reigned in this desolate natural setting a silence barely broken by the flapping wings of petrels or puffins by this point everything was frozen even sound so the nautilus had to halt in its venturesome course among these tracts of ice sir ned land told me that day if your captain goes any farther yes he'll be a superman how so ned because nobody can clear the ice bank your captain's a powerful man but damnation he isn't more powerful than nature if she draws a boundary line there you stop like it or not correct ned land but i still want to know what's behind this ice bank behold my greatest source of irritation a wall master is right conseil said walls were invented simply to frustrate scientists all walls should be banned fine the canadian put in but we already know what's behind this ice bank what i asked ice ice and more ice you may be sure of that ned i answered but i'm not that's why i want to see for myself well professor the canadian replied you could just drop that idea you've made it to the ice bank which is already far enough but you won't get any farther neither your captain nemo nor his nautilus and whether he wants to or not we'll head north again in other words to the land of sensible people i had to agree that ned land was right and until ships are built to navigate over tracts of ice they'll have to stop at the ice bank indeed despite its efforts despite the powerful methods it used to split this ice the nautilus was reduced to immobility ordinarily when someone can't go any farther he still has the option of returning in his tracks but here it was just as impossible to turn back as to go forward because every passageway had closed behind us and if our submersible remained even slightly stationary it would be frozen in without delay which is exactly what happened near two o'clock in the afternoon and fresh ice kept forming over the ship's sides with astonishing speed i had to admit that captain nemo's leadership had been most injudicious just then i was on the platform observing the situation for a while the captain said to me well professor what think you i think we're trapped captain trapped what do you mean i mean we can't go forward backward or sideways i think that's the standard definition of trapped at least in the civilized world so professor aronnax you think the nautilus won't be able to float clear only with the greatest difficulty captain since the season is already too advanced for you to depend on an ice breakup oh professor captain nemo replied in an ironic tone you never change 
you see only impediments and obstacles i promise you not only will the nautilus float clear it will go farther still farther south i asked gaping at the captain yes sir it will go to the pole to the pole i exclaimed unable to keep back a movement of disbelief yes the captain replied coolly the antarctic pole that unknown spot crossed by every meridian on the globe as you know i do whatever i like with my nautilus yes i did know that i knew this man was daring to the point of being foolhardy but to overcome all the obstacles around the south pole even more unattainable than the north pole which still hadn't been reached by the boldest navigators wasn't this an absolutely insane undertaking one that could occur only in the brain of a madman it then dawned on me to ask captain nemo if he had already discovered this pole which no human being had ever trod underfoot no sir he answered me but we'll discover it together where others have failed i'll succeed never before has my nautilus cruised so far into these southernmost seas but i repeat it will go farther still i'd like to believe you captain i went on in a tone of some sarcasm oh i do believe you let's forge ahead there are no obstacles for us let's shatter this ice bank let's blow it up and if it still resists let's put wings on the nautilus and fly over it over it professor captain nemo replied serenely no not over it but under it under it i exclaimed a sudden insight into captain nemo's plans had just flashed through my mind i understood the marvelous talents of his nautilus would be put to work once again in this superhuman undertaking i can see we're starting to understand each other professor captain nemo told me with a half smile you already glimpse the potential myself i'd say the success of this attempt maneuvers that aren't feasible for an ordinary ship are easy for the nautilus if a continent emerges at the pole we'll stop at that continent but on the other hand if open sea washes the pole we'll go to that very place right i said carried away by the captain's logic even though the surface of the sea has solidified into ice its lower strata are still open thanks to that divine justice that puts the maximum density of salt water one degree above its freezing point and if i'm not mistaken the submerged part of this ice bank is in a four to one ratio to its emerging part very nearly professor for each foot of iceberg above the sea there are three more below now then since these ice mountains don't exceed a height of one hundred meters they sink only to a depth of three hundred meters and what are three hundred meters to the nautilus a mere nothing sir we could even go to greater depths and find that temperature layer common to all ocean water and there we'd brave with impunity the minus thirty degrees or minus forty degrees cold on the surface true sir very true i replied with growing excitement our sole difficulty captain nemo went on lies in our staying submerged for several days without renewing our air supply that's all i answered the nautilus has huge air tanks we'll fill them up and they'll supply all the oxygen we need good thinking professor aronnax the captain replied with a smile but since i don't want to be accused of foolhardiness i'm giving you all my objections in advance you have more just one if a sea exists at the south pole it's possible this sea may be completely frozen over so we couldn't come up to the surface my dear sir have you forgotten that the nautilus is armed with a fearsome spur couldn't it be launched diagonally against those tracts of ice which would break open from the impact ah professor you're full of ideas today besides captain i added with still greater enthusiasm why wouldn't we find open sea at the south pole just as at the north pole the cold temperature poles and the geographical poles don't coincide in either the northern or southern hemispheres and until proof to the contrary we can assume these two spots on the earth feature either a continent or an ice-free ocean i think as you do professor aronnax captain nemo replied 
i'll only point out that after raising so many objections against my plan you're now crushing me under arguments in its favor captain nemo was right i was outdoing him in daring it was i who was sweeping him to the pole i was leading the way i was out in front but no you silly fool captain nemo already knew the pros and cons of this question and it amused him to see you flying off into impossible fantasies nevertheless he didn't waste an instant at his signal the chief officer appeared the two men held a quick exchange in their incomprehensible language and either the chief officer had been alerted previously or he found the plan feasible because he showed no surprise but as unemotional as he was he couldn't have been more impeccably emotionless than conseil when i told the fine lad our intention of pushing on to the south pole he greeted my announcement with the usual as master wishes and i had to be content with that as for ned land no human shoulders ever executed a higher shrug than the pair belonging to our canadian honestly sir he told me you and your captain nemo i pity you both but we will go to the pole mr land maybe but you won't come back and ned land re-entered his cabin to keep from doing something desperate he said as he left me meanwhile preparations for this daring attempt were getting under way the nautilus's powerful pumps forced air down into the tanks and stored it under high pressure near four o'clock captain nemo informed me that the platform hatches were about to be closed i took a last look at the dense ice bank we were going to conquer the weather was fair the skies reasonably clear the cold quite brisk namely minus twelve degrees centigrade but after the wind had lulled this temperature didn't seem too unbearable equipped with picks some ten men climbed onto the nautilus's sides and cracked loose the ice around the ship's lower plating which was soon set free this operation was swiftly executed because the fresh ice was still thin we all re-entered the interior the main ballast tanks were filled with the water that hadn't yet congealed at our line of flotation the nautilus submerged without delay i took a seat in the lounge with conseil through the open window we stared at the lower strata of this southernmost ocean the thermometer rose again the needle on the pressure gauge swerved over its dial about three hundred meters down just as captain nemo had predicted we cruised beneath the undulating surface of the ice bank but the nautilus sank deeper still it reached a depth of eight hundred meters at the surface this water gave a temperature of minus twelve degrees centigrade but now it gave no more than minus ten degrees centigrade two degrees had already been gained thanks to its heating equipment the nautilus's temperature needless to say stayed at a much higher degree every maneuver was accomplished with extraordinary precision with all due respect to master conseil told me we'll pass it by i fully expect to i replied in a tone of deep conviction now in open water the nautilus took a direct course to the pole without veering from the fifty-second meridian from sixty seven degrees thirty minutes to ninety degrees twenty two and a half degrees of latitude were left to cross in other words slightly more than five hundred leagues the nautilus adopted an average speed of twenty six miles per hour the speed of an express train if it kept up this pace forty hours would do it for reaching the pole for part of the night the novelty of our circumstances kept conseil and me at the lounge window the sea was lit by our beacon's electric rays but the depths were deserted fish didn't linger in these imprisoned waters here they found merely a passageway for going from the antarctic ocean to open sea at the pole our progress was swift you could feel it in the vibrations of the long steel hull near two o'clock in the morning i went to snatch a few hours of sleep conseil did likewise i didn't encounter captain nemo while going down the gangways i assumed that he was keeping to the pilot house the next day march nineteen at five o'clock in the morning i was back at my post in the lounge the electric log indicated that the nautilus had reduced speed by then it was rising to the surface but cautiously while slowly emptying its ballast tanks my heart was pounding would we emerge into the open and find the polar air again 
no a jolt told me that the nautilus had bumped the underbelly of the ice bank still quite thick to judge from the hollowness of the accompanying noise indeed we had struck bottom to use nautical terminology but in the opposite direction and at a depth of three thousand feet that gave us four thousand feet of ice overhead of which one thousand feet emerged above water so the ice bank was higher here than we had found it on the outskirts a circumstance less than encouraging several times that day the nautilus repeated the same experiment and always it bumped against this surface that formed a ceiling above it at certain moments the ship encountered ice at a depth of nine hundred meters denoting a thickness of twelve hundred meters of which three hundred meters rose above the level of the ocean this height had tripled since the moment the nautilus had dived beneath the waves I meticulously noted these different depths, obtaining the underwater profile of this upside-down mountain chain that stretched beneath the sea. By evening, there was still no improvement in our situation. The ice stayed between 400 and 500 meters deep. It was obviously shrinking, but what a barrier still lay between us and the surface of the ocean. By then, it was 8 o'clock. The air inside the Nautilus should have been renewed four hours earlier, following daily practice on board. But I didn't suffer very much, although Captain Nemo hadn't yet made demands on the supplementary oxygen in his air tanks. That night my sleep was fitful. Hope and fear besieged me by turns. I got up several times. The Nautilus continued groping. Near three o'clock in the morning, I observed that we encountered the ice bank's underbelly at a depth of only fifty meters, so only one hundred and fifty feet separated us from the surface of the water. Little by little, the ice bank was turning into an ice field again. The mountains were changing back into plains. My eyes didn't leave the pressure gauge. We kept rising on a diagonal, going along the shiny surface that sparkled beneath our electric rays. Above and below, the ice bank was subsiding in long gradients. Mile after mile, it was growing thinner. Finally, at six o'clock in the morning on that memorable day of March 19, the lounge door opened. Captain Nemo appeared. Open sea, he told me. End of Part 2, Chapter 13Part 2, Chapter 14 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne Chapter 14, The South Pole I rushed up onto the platform. Yes, open sea! Barely a few sparse flows, some moving icebergs, a sea stretching into the distance, hosts of birds in the air, and myriads of fish under the waters, which varied from intense blue to olive green, depending on the depth. The thermometer marked three degrees centigrade. It was as if a comparative springtime had been locked up behind that ice bank, whose distant masses were outlined on the northern horizon. Are we at the pole? I asked the captain, my heart pounding. I've no idea, he answered me. At noon we'll fix our position. But will the sun show through this mist? I said, staring at the grayish sky. No matter how faintly it shines, it will be enough for me, the captain replied. To the south, ten miles from the Nautilus, a solitary islet rose to a height of two hundred meters. We proceeded toward it but cautiously, because this sea could have been strewn with reefs. In an hour we had reached the islet. Two hours later we had completed a full circle around it. It measured four to five miles in circumference. A narrow channel separated it from a considerable shore, perhaps a continent whose limits we couldn't see. The existence of this shore seemed to bear out Commander Maori's hypotheses. In essence, this ingenious American had noted that between the South Pole and the 60th parallel, the sea is covered with floating ice of dimensions much greater than any found in the North Atlantic. From this fact, he drew the conclusion that the Antarctic Circle must contain considerable shores, since icebergs can't form on the high seas, but only along coastlines. 
according to his calculations this frozen mass enclosing the southernmost pole forms a vast ice cap whose width must reach four thousand kilometers meanwhile to avoid running aground the nautilus halted three cable lengths from a strand crowned by superb piles of rocks the skiff was launched to sea two crewmen carrying instruments the captain conseil and i were on board it was ten o'clock in the morning i hadn't seen ned land no doubt in the presence of the south pole the canadian hated having to eat his words a few strokes of the oar brought the skiff to the sand where it ran aground just as conseil was about to jump ashore i held him back sir i told captain nemo to you belongs the honor of first setting foot on this shore yes sir the captain replied and if i have no hesitation in treading this polar soil it's because no human being until now has left a footprint here so saying he leaped lightly onto the sand his heart must have been throbbing with intense excitement he scaled an overhanging rock that ended in a small promontory and there mute and motionless with crossed arms and blazing eyes he seemed to be laying claim to these southernmost regions after spending five minutes in this trance he turned to us whenever you're ready sir he called to me i got out conseil at my heels leaving the two men in the skiff over an extensive area the soil consisted of that igneous gravel called tuff reddish in color as if made from crushed bricks the ground was covered with slag lava flows and pumice stones its volcanic origin was unmistakable in certain localities thin smoke holes gave off a sulfurous odor showing that the inner fires still kept their wide-ranging power nevertheless when i scaled a high escarpment i could see no volcanoes within a radius of several miles in these antarctic districts as is well known sir james clark ross had found the craters of mount erebus and mount terror in fully active condition on the one hundred and sixty seventh meridian at latitude seventy seven degrees thirty two minutes the vegetation on this desolate continent struck me as quite limited a few lichens of the species eusnea melanoxanthrea sprawled over the black rocks the whole meager flora of this region consisted of certain microscopic buds rudimentary diatoms made up of a type of cell positioned between two quartz rich shells plus long purple and crimson fucus plants buoyed by small air bladders and washed up on the coast by the surf the beach was strewn with mollusks small mussels limpets smooth heart-shaped cockles and especially some sea butterflies with oblong membrane filled bodies whose heads are formed from two rounded lobes i also saw myriads of those northernmost sea butterflies three centimeters long which a baleen whale can swallow by the thousands in one gulp the open waters at the shoreline were alive with these delightful pteropods true butterflies of the sea among other zoophytes present in these shallows there were a few coral tree forms that according to sir james clark ross live in these antarctic seas at depths as great as one thousand meters then small alcyon coral belonging to the species procellaria pelagica also a large number of starfish unique to these climes plus some feather stars spangling the sand but it was in the air that life was superabundant there various species of birds flew and fluttered by the thousands deafening us with their calls crowding the rocks other fowl watched without fear as we passed and pressed familiarly against our feet these were auks as agile and supple in water where they are sometimes mistaken for fast bonito as they are clumsy and heavy on land they uttered outlandish calls and participated in numerous public assemblies that featured much noise but little action among other fowl i noted some sheath bills from the wading bird family the size of pigeons white in color the beak short and conical the eyes framed by red circles conseil laid in a supply of them because when they're properly cooked these winged creatures make a pleasant dish in the air there passed sooty albatross in four-meter wingspans birds aptly dubbed vultures of the ocean 
also gigantic petrels including several with arching wings enthusiastic eaters of seal that are known as quebrantahusis editor's note spanish for ospreys and cape pigeons a sort of small duck the tops of their bodies black and white in short a whole series of petrels some whitish with wings trimmed in brown others blue and exclusive to these antarctic seas the former so oily i told conseil that inhabitants of the faroe islands simply fit the bird with a wick then light it up with that minor addition conseil replied these fowl would make perfect lamps after this we should insist that nature equip them with wicks in advance half a mile farther on the ground was completely riddled with penguin nests egg-laying burrows from which numerous birds emerged later captain nemo had hundreds of them hunted because their black flesh is highly edible they brayed like donkeys the size of a goose with slate-colored bodies white undersides and lemon-colored neck bands these animals let themselves be stoned to death without making any effort to get away meanwhile the mists didn't clear and by eleven o'clock the sun still hadn't made an appearance its absence disturbed me without it no sights were possible then how could we tell whether we had reached the pole when i rejoined captain nemo i found him leaning silently against a piece of rock and staring at the sky he seemed impatient baffled but what could we do this daring and powerful man couldn't control the sun as he did the sea noon arrived without the orb of day appearing for a single instant you couldn't even find its hiding place behind the curtain of mist and soon this mist began to condense into snow until tomorrow the captain said simply and we went back to the nautilus amid flurries in the air during our absence the nets had been spread and i observed with fascination the fish just hauled on board the antarctic seas serve as a refuge for an extremely large number of migratory fish that flee from storms in the subpolar zones in truth only to slide down the gullets of porpoises and seals i noted some one decimeter southern bullhead a species of whitish cartilaginous fish overrun with bluish gray stripes and armed with stings then some antarctic rabbit fish three feet long the body very slender the skin a smooth silver white the head rounded the top side furnished with three fins the snout ending in a trunk that curved back toward the mouth i sampled its flesh but found it tasteless despite conseil's views which were largely approving the blizzard lasted until the next day it was impossible to stay on the platform from the lounge where i was writing up the incidents of this excursion to the polar continent i could hear the calls of petrel and albatross cavorting in the midst of the turmoil the nautilus didn't stay idle and cruising along the coast it advanced some ten miles farther south amid the half-light left by the sun as it skimmed the edge of the horizon the next day march twenty it stopped snowing the cold was a little more brisk the thermometer marked minus two degrees centigrade the mist had cleared and on that day i hoped our noon sights could be accomplished since captain nemo hadn't yet appeared only conseil and i were taken ashore by the skiff the soil's nature was still the same volcanic traces of lava slag and basaltic rock were everywhere but i couldn't find the crater that had vomited them up there as yonder myriads of birds enlivened this part of the polar continent but they had to share their dominion with huge herds of marine mammals that looked at us with gentle eyes these were seals of various species some stretched out on the ground others lying on drifting ice floes several leaving or re-entering the sea having never dealt with man they didn't run off at our approach and i counted enough of them thereabouts to provision a couple hundred ships ye gods conseil said it's fortunate that ned land didn't come with us why so conseil because that madcap hunter would kill every animal here every animal may be overstating it but in truth i doubt we could keep our canadian friend from harpooning some of these magnificent cetaceans 
which would be an affront to captain nemo since he hates to slay harmless beasts needlessly he's right certainly conseil but tell me haven't you finished classifying these superb specimens of marine fauna master is well aware conseil replied that i'm not seasoned in practical application when master has told me these animals names they're seals and walruses to genera our scholarly conseil hastened to say that belong to the family pinnipedia order carnivora group unguicolata subclass monodelphia class mammalia branch vertebrata very nice conseil i replied but these two genera of seals and walruses are each divided into species and if i'm not mistaken we now have a chance to actually look at them let's it was eight o'clock in the morning we had four hours to ourselves before the sun could be productively observed i guided our steps toward a huge bay that made a crescent-shaped incision in the granite cliffs along the beach there all about us i swear that the shores and ice floes were crowded with marine mammals as far as the eye could see and i involuntarily looked around for old proteus that mythical shepherd who guarded king neptune's immense flocks to be specific these were seals they formed distinct male and female groups the father watching over his family the mother suckling her little ones the stronger youngsters emancipated a few paces away when these mammals wanted to relocate they moved in little jumps made by contracting their bodies clumsily helped by their imperfectly developed flippers which as with their manatee relatives form actual forearms in the water their ideal element i must say these animals swim wonderfully thanks to their flexible backbones narrow pelvises close-cropped hair and webbed feet resting on shore they assumed extremely graceful positions consequently their gentle features their sensitive expressions equal to those of the loveliest women their soft limpid eyes their charming poses led the ancients to glorify them by metamorphosizing the males into sea gods and the females into mermaids i drew conseil's attention to the considerable growth of the cerebral lobes found in these intelligent cetaceans no mammal except man has more abundant cerebral matter accordingly seals are quite capable of being educated they make good pets and together with certain other naturalists i think these animals can be properly trained to perform yeoman service as hunting dogs for fishermen most of these seals were sleeping on the rocks or the sand among those properly termed seals which have no external ears unlike sea lions whose ears protrude i observed several varieties of the species stenoranchus three meters long with white hair bulldog heads and armed with ten teeth in each jaw four incisors in both the upper and lower plus two big canines shaped like a fleur-de-lis among them slithered some sea elephants a type of seal with a short flexible trunk these are the giants of the species with a circumference of twenty feet and a length of ten meters they didn't move as we approached are these animals dangerous conseil asked me only if they're attacked i replied but when these giant seals defend their little ones their fury is dreadful and it isn't rare for them to smash a fisherman's longboat to bits they're within their rights conseil answered i don't say nay two miles further on we were stopped by a promontory that screened the bay from southerly winds it dropped straight down to the sea and surf foamed against it from beyond this ridge there came fearsome bellows such as a herd of cattle might produce gracious conseil put in a choir of bulls no i said a choir of walruses are they fighting with each other either fighting or playing with all due respect to master this we must see then see it we must conseil and there we were climbing these blackish rocks amid sudden landslides and over stones slippery with ice more than once i took a tumble at the expense of my backside conseil more cautious or more stable barely faltered and would help me up saying 
if master's legs would kindly adopt a wider stance master will keep his balance arriving at the topmost ridge of this promontory i could see vast white plains covered with walruses these animals were playing among themselves they were howling not in anger but in glee walruses resemble seals in the shape of their bodies and the arrangement of their limbs but their lower jaws lack canines and incisors and as for their upper canines they consist of two tusks eighty centimeters long with a circumference of thirty three centimeters at the socket made of solid ivory without striations harder than elephant tusks and less prone to yellowing these teeth are in great demand Accordingly, walruses are the victims of a mindless hunting that will soon destroy them all, since their hunters indiscriminately slaughter pregnant females and youngsters, and over 4,000 individuals are destroyed annually. Passing near these unusual animals, I could examine them at my leisure, since they didn't stir. Their hides were rough and heavy, a tan color leaning toward a reddish-brown. Their coats were short and less than abundant some were four meters long more tranquil and less fearful than their northern relatives they posted no sentinels on guard duty at the approaches to their campsite after examining this community of walruses i decided to return in my tracks it was eleven o'clock and if captain nemo found conditions favorable for taking his sights i wanted to be present at the operation but i held no hopes that the sun would make an appearance that day it was hidden from our eyes by clouds squeezed together on the horizon apparently the jealous orb didn't want to reveal this inaccessible spot on the globe to any human being yet i decided to return to the nautilus we went along a steep narrow path that ran over the cliff's summit by eleven thirty we had arrived at our landing place the beached skiff had brought the captain ashore i spotted him standing on a chunk of basalt his instruments were beside him. His eyes were focused on the northern horizon, along which the sun was sweeping in its extended arc. I found a place near him and waited without speaking. Noon arrived, and just as on the day before, the sun didn't put in an appearance. It was sheer bad luck. Our noon sights were still lacking. If we couldn't obtain them tomorrow, we would finally have to give up any hope of fixing our position in essence it was precisely march twenty tomorrow the twenty first was the day of the equinox the sun would disappear below the horizon for six months not counting refraction and after its disappearance the long polar night would begin following the september equinox the sun had emerged above the northerly horizon rising in long spirals until december twenty one at that time the summer solstice of these southernmost districts the sun had started back down and tomorrow it would cast its last rays i shared my thoughts and fears with captain nemo you're right professor aronnax he told me if i can't take the sun's altitude tomorrow i won't be able to try again for another six months but precisely because sailor's luck has led me into these seas on march twenty one it will be easy to get our bearings if the noonday sun does appear before our eyes why easy captain because when the orb of day sweeps in such long spirals it's difficult to measure its exact altitude above the horizon and our instruments are open to committing serious errors then what can we do i use only my chronometer captain nemo answered me at noon tomorrow march twenty one if after accounting for refraction the sun's disk is cut exactly in half by the northern horizon that will mean i'm at the south pole right i said nevertheless it isn't mathematically exact proof because the equinox needn't fall precisely at noon no doubt sir but the error will be under one hundred meters and that's close enough for us until tomorrow then captain nemo went back on board Conseil and I stayed behind until five o'clock, surveying the beach, observing and studying. The only unusual object I picked up was an ox egg of remarkable size, for which a collector would have paid more than one thousand francs. Its cream-colored tint, 
plus the streaks and markings that decorated it like so many hieroglyphics made it a rare trinket i placed it in conseil's hands and holding it like precious porcelain from china that cautious sure-footed lad got it back to the nautilus in one piece there i put this rare egg inside one of the glass cases in the museum i ate supper feasting with appetite on an excellent piece of seal liver whose flavor reminded me of pork then i went to bed but not without praying like a good hindu for the favors of the radiant orb the next day march twenty one bright and early at five o'clock in the morning i climbed onto the platform i found captain nemo there the weather is clearing a bit he told me i have high hopes after breakfast we'll make our way ashore and choose an observation post this issue settled i went to find ned land i wanted to take him with me the obstinate canadian refused and i could clearly see that his tight-lipped mood and his bad temper were growing by the day under the circumstances i ultimately wasn't sorry that he refused in truth there were too many seals ashore and it would never do to expose this impulsive fisherman to such temptations breakfast over i made my way ashore the nautilus had gone a few more miles during the night it lay well out a good league from the coast which was crowned by a sharp peak four hundred to five hundred meters high in addition to me the skiff carried captain nemo two crewmen and the instruments in other words a chronometer a spyglass and a barometer during our crossing i saw numerous baleen whales belonging to the three species unique to these southernmost seas the bowhead whale or right whale according to the english which has no dorsal fin the humpback whale from the genus Balaenoptera, in other words winged whales beasts with wrinkled bellies and huge whitish fins that genus name regardless do not yet form wings and the finback whale yellowish brown the swiftest of all cetaceans this powerful animal is audible from far away when it sends up towering spouts of air and steam that resemble swirls of smoke herds of these different mammals were playing about in the tranquil waters and i could easily see that this antarctic polar basin now served as a refuge for those cetaceans too relentlessly pursued by hunters i also noted long whitish strings of salps a type of a mollusk found in clusters and some jellyfish of large size that swayed in the eddies of the billows by nine o'clock we had pulled up to shore the sky was growing brighter clouds were fleeing to the south mists were rising from the cold surface of the water captain nemo headed toward the peak which he no doubt planned to make his observatory it was an arduous climb over sharp lava and pumice stones in the midst of air often reeking with sulfurous fumes from the smoke holes for a man out of practice at treading land the captain scaled the steepest slopes with a supple agility i couldn't equal and which would have been envied by hunters of pyrenees mountain goats it took us two hours to reach the summit of this half crystal half basalt peak from there our eyes scanned a vast sea which scrawled its boundary line firmly against the background of the northern sky at our feet dazzling tracts of white over our heads a pale azure clear of mists north of us the sun's disk like a ball of fire already cut into by the edge of the horizon from the heart of the waters jets of liquid rising like hundreds of magnificent bouquets far off like a sleeping cetacean the nautilus behind us to the south and east an immense shore a chaotic heap of rocks and ice whose limits we couldn't see arriving at the summit of this peak captain nemo carefully determined its elevation by means of his barometer since he had to take this factor into account in his noon sights at eleven forty five the sun by then seen only by refraction looked like a golden disk dispersing its last rays over this deserted continent and down to the seas not yet ploughed by the ships of man captain nemo had brought a spyglass with a reticular eyepiece which corrected the sun's refraction by means of a mirror and he used it to observe the orb sinking little by little along a very extended diagonal that reached below the horizon 
I held the chronometer. My heart was pounding mightily. If the lower half of the sun's disk disappeared just as the chronometer said noon, we were right at the pole. Noon, I called. The South Pole, Captain Nemo replied in a solemn voice, handing me the spyglass, which showed the orb of day cut into two exactly equal parts by the horizon. I stared at the last rays wreathing this peak, while shadows were gradually climbing its gradients. Just then, resting his hand on my shoulder, Captain Nemo said to me, In 1600, sir, the Dutchman Garrick was swept by storms and currents, reaching latitude 64 degrees south, and discovering the South Shetland Islands. On January 17, 1773, the famous Captain Cook went along the 38th meridian, arriving at latitude 67 degrees 30 minutes, and on January 30, 1774, along the 109th meridian, he reached latitude 71 degrees 15 minutes. In 1819, the Russian Bellinghausen lay on the 69th parallel, and in 1821 on the 66th, at longitude 111 degrees west. In 1820, the Englishman Bransfield stopped at 65 degrees. That same year, the American Morel, whose reports are dubious, went along the 42nd meridian, finding open sea at latitude 70 degrees 14 minutes. In 1825, the Englishman Powell was unable to get beyond 62 degrees. That same year, a humble seal fisherman, the Englishman Weddell, went as far as latitude 72 degrees 14 minutes on the 35th meridian, and as far as 74 degrees 15 minutes on the 36th. In 1829, the Englishman Forster, commander of the Chanticleer, laid claim to the Antarctic continent in latitude 63 degrees 26 minutes and longitude 66 degrees 26 minutes. On February 1, 1831, the Englishman Biscoe discovered Enderby Land at latitude 68 degrees 50 minutes. Adelaide land at latitude 67 degrees on February 5, 1832, and Graham land at latitude 64 degrees 45 minutes on February 21. In 1838, the Frenchman Dumont d'Urville stopped at the ice bank in latitude 62 degrees 57 minutes, sighting the Louis Philippe Peninsula. On January 21, two years later, at a new southerly position of 66 degrees 30 minutes, he named the Adelaide coast, and eight days later, the Clary coast at 64 degrees 40 minutes. In 1838, the American Wilkes advanced as far as the 69th parallel on the 100th meridian. In 1839, the Englishman Balleny discovered the Sabrina coast at the edge of the polar circle. Lastly, on January 12, 1842, with his ships the Erebus and the Terror, the Englishman Sir James Clark Ross found Victoria Land in latitude 70 degrees 56 minutes and longitude 171 degrees 7 minutes east. On the 23rd of that same month, he reached the 74th parallel, a position denoting the farthest south attained until then. On the 27th, he lay at 76 degrees 8 minutes. On the 28th, at 77 degrees 32 minutes. On February 2nd, at 78 degrees 4 minutes. And late in 1842, he returned to 71 degrees, but couldn't get beyond it. Well now, in 1868, on this 21st day of March, I myself, Captain Nemo, have reached the South Pole at 90 degrees, and I hereby claim this entire part of the globe equal to one-sixth of the known continents. In the name of which sovereign, Captain? In my own name, sir. So saying, Captain Nemo unfurled a black flag bearing a gold N on its quartered bunting, then turning toward the orb of day, whose last rays were licking at the sea's horizon, Farewell, O oh son, he called.
disappear o radiant orb retire beneath this open sea and let six months of night spread their shadows over my new domains end of part two chapter fourteen Part 2, Chapter 15 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. Chapter 15, Accident or Incident. The next day, March 22nd, at 6 o'clock in the morning, preparations for departure began. The last gleams of twilight were melting into night. The cold was brisk. The constellations were glittering with startling intensity. The wonderful Southern Cross, polar star of the Antarctic regions, twinkled at its zenith. The thermometer marked minus 12 degrees centigrade, and a fresh breeze left a sharp nip in the air. Ice flows were increasing over the open water. The sea was starting to congeal everywhere. Numerous blackish patches were spreading over its surface, announcing the imminent formation of fresh ice. Obviously, this southernmost basin froze over during its six-month winter and became utterly inaccessible. What happened to the whales during this period? No doubt they went beneath the ice bank to find more feasible seas. As for seals and walruses, they were accustomed to living in the harshest climates and stayed on in these icy waterways. These animals know by instinct how to gouge holes in the ice fields and keep them continually open. They go to these holes to breathe. Once the birds have migrated northward to escape the cold, these marine mammals remain as sole lords of the polar continent. Meanwhile, the ballast tanks filled with water and the Nautilus sank slowly. At a depth of 1,000 feet, it stopped. Its propeller churned the waves and it headed due north at a speed of 15 miles per hour. Near the afternoon, it was already cruising under the immense frozen carapace of the ice bank. As a precaution, the panels in the lounge stayed closed because the Nautilus's hull could run afoul of some submerged block of ice. So I spent the day putting my notes into final form. My mind was completely wrapped up in my memories of the pole. We had reached that inaccessible spot without facing exhaustion or danger, as if our seagoing passenger carriage had glided there on railroad tracks. And now we had actually started our return journey. Did it still have comparable surprises in store for me? I felt sure it did, so inexhaustible is this series of underwater wonders. As it was, in the five and a half months since fate had brought us on board, we had cleared 14,000 leagues, and over this track, longer than the Earth's equator, so many fascinating or frightening incidents had beguiled our voyage, that hunting trip in the Crespo forests, our running aground in the Torres Strait, the Coral Cemetery, the pearl fisheries of Ceylon, the Arabic Tunnel, the fires of Santorini, those millions in the Bay of Vigo, Atlantis, the South Pole. During the night, all these memories crossed over from one dream to the next, not giving my brain a moment's rest. At three o'clock in the morning, I was awakened by a violent collision. I sat up in bed, listening in the darkness, and then was suddenly hurled into the middle of my stateroom. Apparently the Nautilus had gone aground, then heeled over sharply. Leaning against the walls, I dragged myself down the gangways to the lounge, whose ceiling lights were on. The furniture had been knocked over. Fortunately, the glass cases were solidly secured at the base and had stood fast. Since we were no longer vertical, the starboard pictures were glued to the tapestries, while those to port had their lower edges hanging a foot away from the wall. So the Nautilus was lying on its starboard side, completely stationary to boot. In its interior I heard the sound of footsteps and muffled voices, but Captain Nemo didn't appear. Just as I was about to leave the lounge, Ned Land and Conseil entered. What happened? I instantly said to them. I came to ask Master that, 
conseil replied damnation the canadian exclaimed i know full well what happened the nautilus has gone aground and judging from the way it's listing i don't think it'll pull through like that first time in the torres strait but i asked are we at least back on the surface of the sea we have no idea conseil replied it's easy to find out i answered i consulted the pressure gauge much to my surprise it indicated a depth of three hundred and sixty meters what's the meaning of this i exclaimed we must confer with captain nemo conseil said but where do we find him ned land asked follow me i told my two companions we left the lounge nobody in the library nobody by the central companionway or the crew's quarters i assumed that captain nemo was stationed in the pilot house best to wait the three of us returned to the lounge i'll skip over the canadian's complaints he had good grounds for an outburst i didn't answer him back letting him blow off all the steam he wanted we had been left to ourselves for twenty minutes trying to detect the tiniest noises inside the nautilus when captain nemo entered he didn't seem to see us his facial features usually so emotionless revealed a certain uneasiness he studied the compass and pressure gauge in silence then went and put his finger on the world map at a spot in the sector depicting the southernmost seas i hesitated to interrupt him but some moments later when he turned to me i threw back at him a phrase he had used in the tories strait an incident captain no sir he replied this time an accident serious perhaps is there any immediate danger no has the nautilus run aground yes and this accident came about through nature's unpredictability not man's incapacity no errors were committed in our maneuvers nevertheless we can't prevent a loss of balance from taking its toll one may defy human laws but no one can withstand the laws of nature captain nemo had picked an odd time to philosophize all in all this reply told me nothing may i learn sir i asked him what caused this accident an enormous block of ice an entire mountain has toppled over he answered me when an iceberg is eroded at the base by warmer waters or by repeated collisions its center of gravity rises then it somersaults it turns completely upside down that's what happened here when it overturned one of these blocks hit the nautilus as it was cruising under the waters sliding under our hull this block then raised us with irresistible power lifting us into less congested strata where we now lie on our side but can't we float the nautilus clear by emptying its ballast tanks to regain our balance that sir is being done right now you can hear the pumps working look at the needle on the pressure gauge it indicates that the nautilus is rising but this block of ice is rising with us and until some obstacle halts its upward movement our position won't change indeed the nautilus kept the same heel to starboard no doubt it would straighten up once the block came to a halt but before that happened who knew if we might not hit the underbelly of the ice bank and be hideously squeezed between two frozen surfaces i mused on all the consequences of this situation captain nemo didn't stop studying the pressure gauge since the toppling of this iceberg the nautilus had risen about one hundred and fifty feet but it still stayed at the same angle to the perpendicular suddenly a slight movement could be felt over the hull obviously the nautilus was straightening a bit objects hanging in the lounge were visibly returning to their normal positions the walls were approaching the vertical nobody said a word hearts pounding we could see and feel the ship righting itself the floor was becoming horizontal beneath our feet ten minutes went by finally we're upright i exclaimed yes captain nemo said heading to the lounge door but will we float off i asked him certainly he replied 
since the ballast tanks aren't yet empty and when they are the nautilus must rise to the surface of the sea the captain went out and soon i saw that at his orders the nautilus had halted its upward movement in fact it soon would have hit the underbelly of the ice bank but it had stopped in time and was floating in midwater that was a close call conseil then said yes we could have been crushed between these masses of ice or at least imprisoned between them and then with no way to renew our air supply yes that was a close call if it's over with ned land muttered i was unwilling to get into a pointless argument with the canadian and didn't reply moreover the panels opened just then and the outside light burst through the uncovered windows we were fully afloat as i have said but on both sides of the nautilus about ten meters away there rose dazzling walls of ice there also were walls above and below above because the ice banks underbelly spread over us like an immense ceiling below because the somersaulting block shifting little by little had found points of purchase on both side walls and had gotten jammed between them the nautilus was imprisoned in a genuine tunnel of ice about twenty meters wide and filled with quiet water so the ship could easily exit by going either ahead or astern sinking a few hundred meters deeper and then taking an open passageway beneath the ice bank the ceiling lights were off yet the lounge was still brightly lit this was due to the reflecting power of the walls of ice which threw the beams of our beacon right back at us words can't describe the effects produced by our galvanic rays on these huge whimsically sculpted blocks whose every angle ridge and facet gave off a different glow depending on the nature of the veins running inside the ice it was a dazzling mine of gems in particular sapphires and emeralds whose jets of blue and green crisscrossed here and there opaline hues of infinite subtlety raced among sparks of light that were like so many fiery diamonds their brilliance more than any eye could stand the power of our beacon was increased a hundredfold like a lamp shining through the biconvex lenses of a world-class lighthouse how beautiful conseil exclaimed yes i said it's a wonderful sight isn't it ned oh damnation yes ned land shot back it's superb i'm furious that i have to admit it nobody has ever seen the like but this sight could cost us dearly and in all honesty i think we're looking at things god never intended for human eyes ned land was right it was too beautiful all at once a yell from conseil made me turn around what is it i asked master must close his eyes master mustn't look with that conseil clapped his hands over his eyes but what's wrong my boy i've been dazzled struck blind involuntarily my eyes flew to the window but i couldn't stand the fire devouring it i realized what had happened the nautilus had just started off at great speed all the tranquil glimmers of the ice walls had then changed into blazing streaks the sparkles from these myriads of diamonds were merging with each other swept along by its propeller the nautilus was traveling through a sheath of flashing light then the panels in the lounge closed we kept our hands over our eyes which were utterly saturated with those concentric gleams that swirl before the retina when sunlight strikes too intensely it took some time to calm our troubled vision finally we lowered our hands ye gods i never would have believed it conseil said and i still don't believe it the canadian shot back when we return to shore jaded from all these natural wonders conseil added think how we'll look down on those pitiful land masses those puny works of man no the civilized world won't be good enough for us such words from the lips of this emotionless flemish boy showed that our enthusiasm was near the boiling point but the canadian didn't fail to throw his dram of cold water over us the civilized world he said shaking his head don't worry conseil my friend we are never going back to that world by this point it was five o'clock in the morning just then there was a collision in the nautilus's bow I realized that its spur had just bumped a block of ice it must have been a faulty maneuver because this underwater tunnel was obstructed by such blocks and didn't make for easy navigating 
so i had assumed that captain nemo in adjusting his course would go around each obstacle or would hug the walls and follow the windings of the tunnel in either case our forward motion wouldn't receive an absolute check nevertheless contrary to my expectations the nautilus definitely began to move backward we're going astern conseil said yes i replied apparently the tunnel has no way out at this end and so so i said our maneuvers are quite simple we'll return in our tracks and go out the southern opening that's all as i spoke i tried to sound more confident than i really felt meanwhile the nautilus accelerated its backward movement and running with propeller in reverse it swept us along at great speed this will mean a delay ned said what are a few hours more or less so long as we get out yes ned land repeated so long as we get out i strolled for a little while from the lounge into the library my companions kept their seats and didn't move soon i threw myself down on a couch and picked up a book which my eyes skimmed mechanically a quarter of an hour later conseil approached me saying is it deeply fascinating this volume master is reading tremendously fascinating i replied i believe it master is reading his own book my own book indeed my hands were holding my own book on the great ocean depths i hadn't even suspected i closed the book and resumed my strolling ned and conseil stood up to leave stay here my friends i said stopping them let's stay together until we're out of this blind alley as master wishes conseil replied the hours passed i often studied the instruments hanging on the lounge wall the pressure gauge indicated that the nautilus stayed at a constant depth of three hundred meters the compass that it kept heading south the log that it was traveling at a speed of twenty miles per hour an excessive speed in such a cramped area but captain nemo knew that by this point there was no such thing as going too fast since minutes were now worth centuries at eight twenty five a second collision took place this time astern i grew pale my companions came over i clutched conseil's hand our eyes questioned each other and more directly than if our thoughts had been translated into words just then the captain entered the lounge i went to him our path is barred to the south i asked him yes sir when it overturned that iceberg closed off every exit we're boxed in yes end of part two chapter fifteen part two chapter sixteen of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne chapter sixteen shortage of air consequently above below and around the nautilus there were impenetrable frozen walls we were the ice bank's prisoners the canadian banged the table with his fearsome fist conseil kept still i stared at the captain his face had resumed its usual emotionlessness he crossed his arms he pondered the nautilus did not stir the captain then broke into speech gentlemen he said in a calm voice there are two ways of dying under the conditions in which we're placed this inexplicable individual acted like a mathematics professor working out a problem for his pupils the first way he went on is death by crushing the second is death by asphyxiation I don't mention the possibility of death by starvation because the nautilus's provisions will certainly last longer than we will therefore let's concentrate on our chances of being crushed or asphyxiated as for asphyxiation captain i replied that isn't a cause for alarm because the air tanks are full true captain nemo went on but they'll supply air for only two days now then we've been buried beneath the waters for thirty-six hours and the nautilus's heavy atmosphere already needs renewing in another forty-eight hours our reserve air will be used up 
well then captain let's free ourselves within 48 hours we'll try to at least by cutting through one of these walls surrounding us which one i asked borings will tell us that i'm going to ground the nautilus on the lower shelf then my men will put on their diving suits and attack the thinnest of these ice walls can the panels in the lounge be left open without ill effect we're no longer in motion captain nemo went out hissing sounds soon told me that water was being admitted into the ballast tanks the nautilus slowly settled and rested on the icy bottom at a depth of three hundred and fifty meters the depth at which the lower shelf of ice lay submerged my friends i said we are in a serious predicament but i'm counting on your courage and energy sir the canadian replied this is no time to bore you with my complaints i'm ready to do anything i can for the common good excellent ned i said extending my hand to the canadian i might add he went on that i'm as handy with a pick as a harpoon if i can be helpful to the captain he can use me any way he wants he won't turn down your assistance come along ned i led the canadian to the room where the nautilus's men were putting on their diving suits i informed the captain of ned's proposition which was promptly accepted the canadian got into his underwater costume and was ready as soon as his fellow workers each of them carried on his back a roquay rawl device that the air tanks had supplied with a generous allowance of fresh oxygen a considerable but necessary drain on the nautilus's reserves as for the rumcorf lamps they were unnecessary in the midst of these brilliant waters saturated with our electric rays after ned was dressed i re-entered the lounge whose windows had been uncovered stationed next to conseil i examined the strata surrounding and supporting the nautilus some moments later we saw a dozen crewmen set foot on the shelf of ice among them ned land easily recognized by his tall figure captain nemo was with them before digging into the ice the captain had to obtain borings to ensure working in the best direction long bores were driven into the side walls but after fifteen meters the instruments were still impeded by the thickness of those walls it was futile to attack the ceiling since the surface was the ice bank itself more than four hundred meters high captain nemo then bored into the lower surface there we were separated from the sea by a ten meter barrier that's how thick the iceberg was from this point on it was an issue of cutting out a piece equal in surface area to the nautilus's water line this meant detaching about six thousand five hundred cubic meters to dig a hole through which the ship could descend below this tract of ice work began immediately and was carried on with tireless tenacity instead of digging all around the nautilus which would have entailed even greater difficulties captain nemo had an immense trench outlined on the ice eight meters from our port quarter then his men simultaneously staked it off at several points around its circumference soon their picks were vigorously attacking this compact matter and huge chunks were loosened from its mass these chunks weighed less than water and by an unusual effect of specific gravity each chunk took a wing as it were to the roof of the tunnel which thickened above by as much as it diminished below but this hardly mattered so long as the lower surface kept growing thinner after two hours of energetic work ned land re-entered exhausted he and his companions were replaced by new workmen including conseil and me the Nautilus's chief officer supervised us the water struck me as unusually cold but i warmed up promptly while wielding my pick my movements were quite free although they were executed under a pressure of thirty atmospheres after two hours of work re-entering to snatch some food and rest i found a noticeable difference between the clean elastic fluid supplied me by the roquay rail device and the nautilus's atmosphere which was already charged with carbon dioxide the air hadn't been renewed in forty-eight hours and its life-giving qualities were considerably weakened meanwhile after twelve hours had gone by we had removed from the outlined surface area a slice of ice only one meter thick hence about six hundred cubic meters 
assuming the same work would be accomplished every twelve hours it would still take five nights and four days to see the undertaking through to completion five nights and four days i told my companions and we have oxygen in the air tanks for only two days without taking into account ned answered that once we're out of this damned prison We'll still be cooped up beneath the ice bank without any possible contact with the open air. An apt remark, for who could predict the minimum time we would need to free ourselves? Before the Nautilus could return to the surface of the waves, couldn't we all die of asphyxiation? Were this ship and everyone on board doomed to perish in this tomb of ice? It was a dreadful state of affairs, but we faced it head on each one of us determined to do his duty to the end during the night in line with my forecasts a new one meter slice was removed from this immense socket but in the morning wearing my diving suit i was crossing through the liquid mass in a temperature of minus six degrees to minus seven degrees centigrade when i noted that little by little the side walls were closing in on each other the liquid strata farthest from the trench not warmed by the movements of workmen and tools were showing a tendency to solidify in the face of this imminent new danger what would happen to our chances for salvation and how could we prevent this liquid medium from solidifying than cracking the nautilus's hull like glass i didn't tell my two companions about this new danger there was no point in dampening the energy they were putting into our arduous rescue work but when I returned on board, I mentioned this serious complication to Captain Nemo. I know, he told me in that calm tone the most dreadful outlook couldn't change. It's one more danger, but I don't know any way of warding it off. Our sole chance for salvation is to work faster than the water solidifies. We've got to get there first, that's all. Get there first. By then, I should have been used to this type of talk. For several hours that day, I wielded my pick doggedly. The work kept me going. Besides, working meant leaving the Nautilus, which meant breathing the clean oxygen drawn from the air tanks and supplied by our equipment, which meant leaving the thin, foul air behind. Near evening, one more meter had been dug from the trench. When I returned on board, I was well-nigh asphyxiated by the carbon dioxide saturating the air. Oh, if only we had the chemical methods that would enable us to drive out this noxious gas. There was no lack of oxygen. All this water contained a considerable amount, and after it was decomposed by our powerful batteries, this life-giving elastic fluid could have been restored to us. I had thought it all out, but to no avail because the carbon dioxide produced by our breathing permeated every part of the ship. To absorb it, we would need to fill containers with potassium hydroxide and shake them continually. But this substance was missing on board, and nothing else could replace it. That evening, Captain Nemo was forced to open the spigots of his air tanks and shoot a few spouts of fresh oxygen through the Nautilus's interior. Without this precaution, we wouldn't have awakened the following morning. The next day, March 26, I returned to my miner's trade, working to remove the fifth meter. The ice bank's sidewalls and underbelly had visibly thickened. Obviously, they would come together before the Nautilus could break free. For an instant, I was gripped by despair. My pick nearly slipped from my hands. What was the point of this digging if I was to die smothered and crushed by this water turning to stone, a torture undreamed of by even the wildest savages? I felt like I was lying in the jaws of a fearsome monster, jaws irresistibly closing. Supervising our work, working himself, Captain Nemo passed near me just then. I touched him with my hand and pointed to the walls of our prison. The starboard wall had moved forward to a point less than four meters from the Nautilus's hull. The captain understood and gave me a signal to follow him. We returned on board. My diving suit removed, I went with him to the lounge. Professor Aranax, he told me, this calls for heroic measures, or we'll be sealed up in this solidified water as if it were cement. Yes, I said, but what can we do? Oh, he exclaimed, 
if only my nautilus were strong enough to stand that much pressure without being crushed well i asked not catching the captain's meaning don't you understand he went on that the congealing of this water could come to our rescue don't you see that by solidifying it could burst these tracts of ice imprisoning us just as its freezing can burst the hardest stones aren't you aware that this force could be the instrument of our salvation rather than our destruction yes captain maybe so but whatever resistance to crushing the nautilus may have it still couldn't stand such dreadful pressures and it would be squashed as flat as a piece of sheet iron i know it sir so we can't rely on nature to rescue us only our own efforts we must counteract this solidification we must hold it in check not only are the side walls closing in but there aren't ten feet of water ahead or astern of the nautilus all around us this freeze is gaining fast how long i asked will the oxygen in the air tanks enable us to breathe on board the captain looked me straight in the eye after tomorrow he said the air tanks will be empty i broke out in a cold sweat but why should i have been startled by this reply on march twenty two the nautilus had dived under the open waters at the pole it was now the twenty-sixth we had lived off the ship's stores for five days and all remaining breathable air had to be saved for the workmen even today as i write these lines my sensations are so intense that an involuntary terror sweeps over me and my lungs still seem short of air meanwhile motionless and silent captain nemo stood lost in thought an idea visibly crossed his mind but he seemed to brush it aside he told himself no at last these words escaped his lips boiling water he muttered boiling water i exclaimed yes sir we're shut up in a relatively confined area if the nautilus's pumps continually injected streams of boiling water into this space wouldn't that raise its temperature and delay its freezing it's worth trying i said resolutely so let's try it professor by then the thermometer gave minus seven degrees centigrade outside captain nemo led me to the galley where a huge distilling mechanism was at work supplying drinking water via evaporation the mechanism was loaded with water and the full electric heat of our batteries was thrown into coils awash in liquid in a few minutes the water reached one hundred degrees centigrade it was sent to the pumps while new water replaced it in the process the heat generated by our batteries was so intense that after simply going through the mechanism water drawn cold from the sea arrived boiling hot at the body of the pump the steaming water was injected into the icy water outside and after three hours had passed the thermometer gave the exterior temperature as minus six degrees centigrade that was one degree gained two hours later the thermometer gave only minus four degrees after i monitored the operation's progress double checking it with many inspections i told the captain it's working i think so he answered me we've escaped being crushed now we have only asphyxiation to fear during the night the water temperature rose to minus one degree centigrade the injections couldn't get it to go a single degree higher but since salt water freezes only at minus two degrees i was finally assured that there was no danger of it solidifying by the next day march twenty seven six meters of ice had been torn from the socket only four meters were left to be removed that still meant forty-eight hours of work the air couldn't be renewed in the nautilus's interior accordingly that day it kept getting worse an unbearable heaviness weighed me down near three o'clock in the afternoon this agonizing sensation affected me to an intense degree yawns dislocated my jaws my lungs were gasping in their quest for that enkindling elastic fluid required for breathing now growing scarcer and scarcer my mind was in a daze i lay outstretched strength gone nearly unconscious my gallant conseil felt the same symptoms suffered the same sufferings yet never left my side he held my hand he kept encouraging me and i even heard him mutter oh if only i didn't have to breathe to leave more air for master 
it brought tears to my eyes to hear him say these words since conditions inside were universally unbearable how eagerly how happily we put on our diving suits to take our turns working picks rang out on that bed of ice arms grew weary hands were rubbed raw but who cared about exhaustion what difference were wounds life-sustaining air reached our lungs we could breathe we could breathe and yet nobody prolonged his underwater work beyond the time allotted him his shift over each man surrendered to a gasping companion the air tank that would revive him captain nemo set the example and was foremost in submitting to this strict discipline when his time was up he yielded his equipment to another and re-entered the foul air on board always calm unflinching and uncomplaining that day the usual work was accomplished with even greater energy over the whole surface area only two meters were left to be removed only two meters separated us from the open sea but the ship's air tanks were nearly empty the little air that remained had to be saved for the workmen not an atom for the nautilus when i returned on board i felt half suffocated what a night i'm unable to depict it such sufferings are indescribable the next day i was short-winded headaches and staggering fits of dizziness made me reel like a drunk my companions were experiencing the same symptoms some crewmen were at their last gasp that day the sixth of our imprisonment captain nemo concluded that picks and maddocks were too slow to deal with the ice layer still separating us from open water and he decided to crush this layer the man had kept his energy and composure he had subdued physical pain with moral strength he could still think plan and act at his orders the craft was eased off in other words it was raised from its icy bed by a change in its specific gravity when it was afloat the crew towed it leading it right above the immense trench outlined to match the ship's water line next the ballast tanks filled with water the boat sank and was fitted into its socket just then the whole crew returned on board the double outside door was closed by this point the nautilus was resting on a bed of ice only one meter thick and drilled by bores in a thousand places the stopcocks of the ballast tanks were then opened wide and one hundred cubic meters of water rushed in increasing the nautilus's weight by one hundred thousand kilograms we waited we listened we forgot our sufferings we hoped once more we had staked our salvation on this one last gamble despite the buzzing in my head i soon could hear the vibrations under the nautilus's hull we tilted the ice cracked with an odd ripping sound like paper tearing and the nautilus began settling downward we're going through conseil muttered in my ear i couldn't answer him I clutched his hand. I squeezed it in an involuntary convulsion. All at once, carried away by its frightful excess load, the Nautilus sank into the waters like a cannonball, in other words, dropping as if in a vacuum. Our full electric power was then put on the pumps, which instantly began to expel water from the ballast tanks. After a few minutes, we had checked our fall. The pressure gauge soon indicated an ascending movement. Brought to full speed, the propeller made the sheet-iron hull tremble down to its rivets, and we sped northward. But how long would it take to navigate under the ice bank to the open sea? Another day? I would be dead first. Half lying on the couch in the library, I was suffocating. My face was purple. My lips blue my faculties in abeyance i could no longer see or hear i had lost all sense of time my muscles had no power to contract i'm unable to estimate the hours that passed in this way but i was aware that my death throes had begun i realized that i was about to die suddenly i regained consciousness a few whiffs of air had entered my lungs had we risen to the surface of the waves had we cleared the ice bank no ned and conseil my two gallant friends were sacrificing themselves to save me 
a few atoms of air were still left in the depths of one Rouquayrol device. Instead of breathing it themselves, they had saved it for me, and while they were suffocating, they poured life into me drop by drop. I tried to push the device away. They held my hands, and for a few moments I could breathe luxuriously. My eyes flew toward the clock. It was eleven in the morning. It had to be March twenty-eight. The Nautilus was traveling at a frightful speed of forty miles per hour. It was writhing in the waters. Where was Captain Nemo? Had he perished? Had his companions died with him? Just then the pressure gauge indicated we were no more than twenty feet from the surface. Separating us from the open air was a mere tract of ice. Could we break through it? Perhaps. In any event, the Nautilus was going to try. In fact, I could feel it assuming an oblique position, lowering its stern and raising its spur. The admission of additional water was enough to shift its balance. Then, driven by its powerful propeller, it attacked this ice field from below like a fearsome battering ram. It split the barrier little by little, backing up, then putting on full speed against the punctured track device, and finally, carried away by its supreme momentum, it lunged through and onto this frozen surface, crushing the ice beneath its weight. The hatches were opened, or torn off if you prefer, and waves of clean air were admitted into every part of the Nautilus. End of Part 2, Chapter 16《Part Two, Chapter Seventeen of Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea: An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. Chapter Seventeen: From Cape Horn to the Amazon. How I got onto the platform, I'm unable to say. Perhaps the Canadian transferred me there, but I could breathe. I could inhale the life-giving sea air. Next to me, my two companions were getting tipsy on the fresh oxygen particles. Poor souls who have suffered from long starvation mustn't pounce heedlessly on the first food given them. We, on the other hand, didn't have to practice such moderation. We could suck the atoms from the air by the lungful, and it was the breeze, the breeze itself, that poured into us this luxurious intoxication. Ah, Conseil was putting in. What fine oxygen! Let master have no fears about breathing. There's enough for everyone. As for Ned Land, he didn't say a word, but his wide open jaws would have scared off a shark. And what powerful inhalations! The Canadian drew like a furnace going full blast. Our strength returned promptly, and when I looked around, I saw that we were alone on the platform. No crewman, not even Captain Nemo. Those strange seamen on the Nautilus were content with the oxygen circulating inside. Not one of them had come up to enjoy the open air. The first words I pronounced were words of appreciation and gratitude to my two companions. Ned and Conseil had kept me alive during the final hours of our long death throes, but no expression of thanks could repay them fully for such devotion. Good Lord, Professor, Ned Land answered me. Don't mention it. What did we do that's so praiseworthy? Not a thing. It was a question of simple arithmetic. Your life is worth more than ours, so we had to save it. No, Ned, I replied, it isn't worth more. Nobody could be better than a kind and generous man like yourself. All right, all right, the Canadian repeated in embarrassment. And you, my gallant Conseil, you suffered a great deal. Not too much, to be candid with Master. I was lacking a few throatfuls of air, but I would have gotten by. Besides, when I saw Master fainting, it left me without the slightest desire to breathe. It took my breath away, in a manner of... Confounded by this lapse into banality, Conseil left his sentence hanging. My friends, I replied, very moved, we're bound to each other forever, and I am deeply indebted to you. We'll take advantage of that, the Canadian shot back. Eh? Conseil put in. Yes, Ned Land went on. You can repay your debt by coming with me when I leave this infernal Nautilus. By the way, Conseil said, are we going in a favorable direction? 
yes i replied because we're going in the direction of the sun and here the sun is due north sure ned land went on but it remains to be seen whether we'll make for the atlantic or the pacific in other words whether we'll end up in a well-traveled or a deserted seas i had no reply to this and i feared that captain nemo wouldn't take us homeward but rather into that huge ocean washing the shores of both asia and america in this way he would complete his underwater tour of the world going back to those seas where the nautilus enjoyed the greatest freedom but if we returned to the pacific far from every populated shore what would happen to ned land's plans we would soon settle this important point the nautilus traveled swiftly soon we had cleared the antarctic circle plus the promontory of cape horn we were abreast of the tip of south america by march thirty one at seven o'clock in the evening by then all our past sufferings were forgotten the memory of that imprisonment under the ice faded from our minds we had thoughts only of the future captain nemo no longer appeared neither in the lounge nor on the platform the positions reported each day on the world map were put there by the chief officer and they enabled me to determine the nautilus's exact heading now then that evening it became obvious much to my satisfaction that we were returning north by the atlantic route i shared the results of my observations with the canadian and conseil that's good news the canadian replied but where's the nautilus going i'm unable to say ned after the south pole does our captain want to tackle the north pole then go back to the pacific by the notorious northwest passage i wouldn't double dare him conseil replied oh well the canadian said we'll give him the slip long before then in any event conseil added he's a superman that captain nemo and we'll never regret having known him especially once we've left him ned land shot back the next day april one when the nautilus rose to the surface of the waves a few minutes before noon we raised land to the west it was tierra del fuego the land of fire a name given it by early navigators after they saw numerous curls of smoke rising from the natives huts this land of fire forms a huge cluster of islands over thirty leagues long and eighty leagues wide extending between latitude fifty three degrees and fifty six degrees south and between longitude sixty seven degrees fifty minutes and seventy seven degrees fifteen minutes west its coastline looked flat but high mountains rose in the distance i even thought i glimpsed mount sarmiento whose elevation is two thousand seventy meters above sea level a pyramid-shaped block of shale with a very sharp summit which depending on whether it's clear or veiled in vapor predicts fair weather or foul as ned land told me a first-class barometer my friend yes sir a natural barometer that didn't let me down when i navigated the narrows of the strait of magellan just then its peak appeared before us standing out distinctly against the background of the skies this forecast fair weather and so it proved going back under the waters the nautilus drew near the coast cruising along it for only a few miles through the lounge windows i could see long creepers and gigantic fucus plants bulb bearing seaweed of which the open sea at the pole has revealed a few specimens with their smooth viscous filaments they measured as much as three hundred meters long genuine cables much more than an inch thick and very tough they're often used as mooring lines for ships another weed known by the name velp and boasting four-foot leaves was crammed into the coral concretions and carpeted the ocean floor it served as both nest and nourishment for myriads of crustaceans and mollusks for crabs and cuttlefish here seals and otters could indulge in a sumptuous meal mixing meat from fish with vegetables from the sea like the english with their irish stews the nautilus passed over these lush luxuriant depths with tremendous speed near evening it approached the falkland islands whose rugged summits i recognized the next day the sea was of moderate depth so not without good reason i assumed that these two islands plus the many islets surrounding them used to be a part of the magellan coastline the falkland islands were probably discovered by the famous navigator john davis who gave them the name davis southern islands 
later sir richard hawkins called them the maiden land after the blessed virgin subsequently at the beginning of the eighteenth century they were named the malouines by fishermen from st malo in brittany then finally dubbed the falklands by the english to whom they belong today in these waterways our nets brought up fine samples of algae in particular certain fucus plants whose roots were laden with the world's best mussels geese and duck alighted by the dozens on the platform and soon took their places in the ship's pantry as for fish i specifically observed some bony fish belonging to the goby genus especially some gudgeon two decimeters long sprinkled with whitish and yellow spots i likewise marveled at the numerous medusas including the most beautiful of their breed the compass jellyfish unique to the falkland seas some of these jellyfish were shaped like very smooth semispherical parasols with russet stripes and fringes of twelve neat festoons others looked like upside-down baskets from which wide leaves and long red twigs were gracefully trailing they swam with quiverings of their four leaf-like arms letting the opulent tresses of their tentacles dangle in the drift i wanted to preserve a few specimens of these delicate zoophytes but they were merely clouds shadows illusions melting and evaporating outside their native element when the last tips of the falkland islands had disappeared below the horizon the nautilus submerged to a depth between twenty and twenty-five meters and went along the south american coast captain nemo didn't put in an appearance we didn't leave these patagonian waterways until april three sometimes cruising under the ocean sometimes on its surface the nautilus passed the wide estuary formed by the mouth of the rio de la plata and on april four we lay abreast of uruguay albeit fifty miles out keeping to its northerly heading it followed the long windings of south america by then we had fared sixteen thousand leagues since coming on board in the seas of japan near eleven o'clock in the morning we cut the tropic of capricorn on the thirty seventh meridian passing well out from cape frio much to ned land's displeasure captain nemo had no liking for the neighborhood of brazil's populous shores because he shot by with dizzying speed not even the swiftest fish or birds could keep up with us and the natural curiosities in these seas completely eluded our observation this speed was maintained for several days and on the evening of april nine we raised south america's easternmost tip cape sao roque but then the nautilus veered away again and went looking for the lowest depths of an underwater valley gouged between this cape and sierra leone on the coast of africa abreast of the west indies this valley forks into two arms and to the north it ends in an enormous depression nine thousand meters deep from this locality to the lesser antilles the ocean's geologic profile features a steeply cut cliff six kilometers high and abreast of the cape verde islands there's another wall just as imposing together these two barricades confine the whole submerged continent of atlantis the floor of this immense valley is made picturesque by mountains that furnish these underwater depths with scenic views this description is based mostly on certain hand-drawn charts kept in the nautilus's library charts obviously rendered by captain nemo himself from his own personal observations for two days we visited these deep and deserted waters by means of our slanting fins the nautilus would do long diagonal dives that took us to every level but on april eleven it rose suddenly and the shore reappeared at the mouth of the amazon river a huge estuary whose outflow is so considerable it desalts the sea over an area of several leagues we cut the equator twenty miles to the west lay guiana french territory where we could easily have taken refuge but the wind was blowing a strong gust and the furious billows would not allow us to face them in a mere skiff no doubt ned land understood this because he said nothing to me for my part i made no allusion to his escape plans because i didn't want to push him into an attempt that was certain to misfire i was readily compensated for this delay by fascinating research during those two days of april eleven twelve the nautilus didn't leave the surface of the sea and its trawl brought up a simply miraculous catch of zoophytes fish and reptiles some zoophytes were dredged up by the chain of our trawl 
most were lovely sea anemone belonging to the family actinidia including among other species the cycalus protexta native to this part of the ocean a small cylindrical trunk adorned with vertical lines mottled with red spots and crowned by a wondrous blossoming of tentacles as for mollusks they consisted of exhibits i had already observed turret snails olive shells of the tent olive species with neatly intersecting lines and russet spots standing out sharply against a flesh-colored background fanciful spider conchs that looked like petrified scorpions transparent glass snails argonauts some highly edible cuttlefish and certain species of squid that the naturalists of antiquity classified with the flying fish which are used chiefly as bait for catching cod as for the fish in these waterways i noted various species that i hadn't yet had the opportunity to study among cartilaginous fish some brook lamprey a type of eel fifteen inches long head greenish fins violet back bluish gray belly a silvery brown strewn with bright spots iris of the eye encircled in gold unusual animals that the amazon's current must have swept out to sea because their natural habitat is fresh water stingrays the snout pointed the tail long slender and armed with an extensive jagged sting small one-meter sharks with gray and whitish hides their teeth arranged in several backward curving rows fish commonly known by the name carpet shark batfish a sort of reddish isosceles triangle half a meter long whose pectoral fins are attached by fleshy extensions that make these fish look like bats although an appendage made of horn located near the nostrils earns them the nickname of sea unicorns lastly a couple species of triggerfish the cuculio whose stippled flanks glitter with a sparkling gold color and the bright purple leather jacket whose hues glisten like a pigeon's throat i'll finish up this catalogue a little dry but quite accurate with the series of bony fish i observed eels belonging to the genus apteronotus whose snow-white snout is very blunt the body painted a handsome black and armed with a very long slender fleshy whip long sardines from the genus odontognathus like three decimeter pike shining with a bright silver glow Goranian mackerel furnished with two anal fins black tinted rudderfish that you catch by using torches fish measuring two meters and boasting white firm plump meat that when fresh tastes like eel when dried like smoked salmon semi-red wrasse sporting scales only at the bases of their dorsal and anal fins grunts on which gold and silver mingle their luster with that of ruby and topaz yellow-tailed gilthead whose flesh is extremely dainty and whose phosphorescent properties give them away in the midst of the waters porgies tinted orange with slender tongues croakers with gold caudal fins black sturgeon fish four-eyed fish from suriname etc this etc won't keep me from mentioning one more fish that conseil with good reason will long remember one of our nets had hauled up a type of very flat ray that weighed some twenty kilograms with its tail cut off it would have formed a perfect disc it was white underneath and reddish on top with big round spots of deep blue encircled in black its hide quite smooth and ending in a double lobed fin laid out on the platform it kept struggling with convulsive movements trying to turn over making such efforts that its final lunge was about to flip it into the sea but conseil being very possessive of his fish rushed at it and before i could stop him he seized it with both hands instantly there he was thrown on his back legs in the air his body half paralyzed and yelling oh sir sir will you help me for once in his life the poor lad didn't address me in the third person the canadian and i sat him up we massaged his contracted arms and when he regained his five senses that eternal classifier mumbled in a broken voice class of cartilaginous fish order crondopterygia with fixed gills suborder salacia family regiforma genus electric ray yes my friend i answered it was an electric ray that put you in this deplorable state oh master can trust me on this conseil shot back i'll be revenged on that animal how 
i'll eat it which he did that same evening but strictly as retaliation because frankly it tasted like leather poor conseil had assaulted an electric ray of the most dangerous species the cumana living in a conducting medium such as water this bizarre animal can electrocute other fish from several meters away so great is the power of its electric organ an organ whose two chief surfaces measure at least twenty seven square feet during the course of the next day april twelve the nautilus drew near the coast of dutch guiana by the mouth of the moroni river there several groups of sea cows were living in family units these were manatees which belonged to the order sirenia like the dugong and stellar's sea cow harmless and unaggressive these fine animals were six to seven meters long and must have weighed at least four thousand kilograms each i told ned land and conseil that far-seeing nature had given these mammals a major role to play in essence manatees like seals are designed to graze the underwater prairies destroying the clusters of weeds that obstruct the mouths of tropical rivers and do you know i added what happened since man has almost completely wiped out these beneficial races rotting weeds have poisoned the air and this poisoned air causes the yellow fever that devastates these wonderful countries this toxic vegetation has increased beneath the seas of the torrid zone so the disease spreads unchecked from the mouth of the rio de la plata to florida and if professor tausenel is correct this plague is nothing compared to the scourge that will strike our descendants once the seas are depopulated of whales and seals by then crowded with jellyfish squid and other devilfish the oceans will have become huge centers of infection because their waves will no longer possess these huge stomachs that god has entrusted with scouring the surface of the sea meanwhile without scorning these theories the nautilus's crew captured half a dozen manatees in essence it was an issue of stocking the larder with excellent red meat even better than beef or veal their hunting was not a fascinating sport the manatees let themselves be struck down without offering any resistance several thousand kilos of meat were hauled below to be dried and stored the same day an odd fishing practice further increased the nautilus's stores so full of game were these seas our trawl brought up in its meshes a number of fish whose heads were topped by little oval slabs with fleshy edges these were suckerfish from the third family of the Sabrachian Malacopterygia. These flat discs on their heads consist of crosswise plates of movable cartilage between which the animals can create a vacuum, enabling them to stick to objects like suction cups. The remoras I had observed in the Mediterranean were related to this species, but the creature at issue here was Echeneus osteochara, unique to this sea right after catching them our seamen dropped them in buckets of water its fishing finished the nautilus drew nearer to the coast in this locality a number of sea turtles were sleeping on the surface of the waves it would have been difficult to capture these valuable reptiles because they wake up at the slightest sound and their solid carapaces are harpoon proof but our sucker fish would effect their capture with extraordinary certainty and precision in truth this animal is a living fish-hook promising wealth and happiness to the greenest fisherman in the business the nautilus's men attached to each fish's tail a ring that was big enough not to hamper its movements and to this ring a long rope whose other end was moored on board thrown into the sea the sucker fish immediately began to play their roles going and fastening themselves onto the breastplates of the turtles their tenacity was so great they would rip apart rather than let go they were hauled in still sticking to the turtles that came aboard with them in this way we caught several loggerheads reptiles a meter wide and weighing two hundred kilos they are extremely valuable because of their carapaces which are covered with big slabs of horn thin brown transparent with white and yellow markings besides they were excellent from an edible viewpoint with an exquisite flavor comparable to the green turtle this fishing ended our stay in the waterways of the amazon and that evening the nautilus took to the high seas once more end of part two chapter seventeen
Part two, chapter eighteen of Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, an underwater tour of the world by Jules Verne. Chapter eighteen, the Devilfish. For some days the Nautilus kept veering away from the American coast. It obviously didn't want to frequent the waves of the Gulf of Mexico or the Caribbean Sea. Yet there was no shortage of water under its keel, since the average depth of these seas is 1,800 meters. But these waterways, strewn with islands and plowed by steamers, probably didn't agree with Captain Nemo. On April 16, we raised Martinique and Guadeloupe from a distance of about 30 miles. For one instant, I could see their lofty peaks. The Canadian was quite disheartened, having counted on putting his plans into execution in the Gulf, either by reaching shore or by pulling alongside one of the many boats flying a coastal trade from one island to another. An escape attempt would have been quite feasible, assuming Ned Land managed to seize the skiff without the captain's knowledge, but in mid-ocean it was unthinkable. The Canadian, Conseil, and I had a pretty long conversation on this subject. For six months we had been prisoners aboard the Nautilus. We had fared 17,000 leagues, and as Ned Land put it, there was no end in sight. So he made me a proposition I hadn't anticipated. We were to ask Captain Nemo this question straight out. Did the captain mean to keep us on board his vessel permanently? This measure was distasteful to me. To my mind it would lead nowhere. We could hope for nothing from the Nautilus's commander, but could depend only on ourselves. Besides, for some time now the man had been gloomier, more withdrawn, less sociable. He seemed to be avoiding me. I encountered him only at rare intervals. He used to take pleasure in explaining the underwater wonders to me. Now he left me to my research and no longer entered the lounge. What changes had come over him? From what cause? I had no reason to blame myself. Was our presence on board perhaps a burden to him? Even so, I cherished no hopes that the man would set us free. So I begged Ned to let me think about it before taking action. If this measure proved fruitless, it could arouse the captain's suspicions, make our circumstances even more arduous, and jeopardize the Canadian's plans. I might add that I could hardly use our state of health as an argument. Except for that grueling ordeal under the ice bank at the South Pole, we had never felt better, neither Ned, Conseil, or I. The nutritious food, life-giving air, regular routine, and uniform temperature kept illness at bay, and for a man who didn't miss his past existence on land, for a Captain Nemo who was at home here, who went where he wished, who took paths mysterious to others if not to himself in attaining his ends, I could understand such a life. But we ourselves hadn't severed all ties with humanity. For my part, I didn't want my new and unusual research to be buried with my bones. I had now earned the right to pen a definitive book on the sea, and sooner or later I wanted that book to see the light of day. There once more, through the panels opening into these Caribbean waters, ten meters below the surface of the waves, I found so many fascinating exhibits to describe in my daily notes. Among other zoophytes there were Portuguese men of war known by the name Fasalia pelagica, like big oblong bladders with a pearly sheen, spreading their membranes to the wind, letting their blue tentacles drift like silken threads to the eye delightful jellyfish, to the touch actual nettles that ooze a corrosive liquid. Among the articulates there were annelid worms one and a half meters long, furnished with a pink proboscis, equipped with seventeen hundred organs of locomotion, snaking through the waters and as they went, throwing off every gleam in the solar spectrum. From the fish branch there were manta rays, enormous cartilaginous fish ten feet long and weighing six hundred pounds, their pectoral fin triangular, their mid-back slightly arched, their eyes attached to the edges of the face at the front of the head. They floated like wreckage from a ship, sometimes fastening onto our windows like opaque shutters. There were American triggerfish, for which nature has ground only black and white pigments, feather-shaped gobies that were long and plump with yellow fins and jutting jaws, 
sixteen decimeter mackerel with short sharp teeth covered with small scales and related to the albacore species next came swarms of red mullet corseted with gold stripes from head to tail their shining fins all a-quiver genuine masterpieces of jewelry formerly sacred to the goddess diana much in demand by rich romans and about which the old saying goes he who catches them doesn't eat them finally adorned with emerald ribbons and dressed in velvet and silk golden angelfish passed before our eyes like courtiers in the paintings of veronese spurred gilt heads stole by their swift thoracic fins thread herring fifteen inches long were wrapped in their phosphorescent glimmers gray mullet thrashed the sea with their big fleshy tails red salmon seemed to mow the waves with their slicing pectorals and silver moonfish worthy of their name rose on the horizon of the waters like the whitish reflections of many moons how many other marvelous new specimens i still could have observed if little by little the nautilus hadn't settled to the lower strata its slanting fins drew it to depths of two thousand and three thousand five hundred meters there animal life was represented by nothing more than sea lilies starfish delightful crinoids with bell-shaped heads like little chalices on straight stems top-shell snails blood-red tooth shells and fissurella snails a large species of coastal mollusk by april twenty we had risen to an average level of fifteen hundred meters the nearest land was the island group of the bahamas scattered like a batch of cobblestones over the surface of the water there high underwater cliffs reared up straight walls made of craggy chunks arranged like big stone foundations among which there gaped black caves so deep our electric rays couldn't light them to the far ends these rocks were hung with huge weeds immense sea tangle giant fucus a genuine trellis of water plants fit for a world of giants in discussing these colossal plants conseil ned and i were naturally led into mentioning the sea's gigantic animals the former were obviously meant to feed the latter however through the windows of our almost motionless nautilus i could see nothing among these long filaments other than the chief articulates of the division brachyuria long-legged spider crabs violet crabs and sponge crabs unique to the waters of the caribbean it was about eleven o'clock when ned land drew my attention to a fearsome commotion out in this huge seaweed well i said these are real devilfish caverns and i wouldn't be surprised to see some of those monsters hereabouts what conseil put in squid ordinary squid from the class cephalopoda no i said devilfish of large dimensions but friend land is no doubt mistaken because i don't see a thing that's regrettable conseil answered i'd like to come face to face with one of those devilfish i've heard so much about which can drag ships down into the depths those beasts go by the name of crack fake it is more like it the canadian replied sarcastically krakens conseil shot back finishing his word without wincing at his companion's witticism nobody will ever make me believe ned land said that such animals exist why not conseil replied we sincerely believed in master's narwhal we were wrong conseil no doubt but there are others with no doubts who believe to this day probably conseil but as for me i'm bound and determined not to accept the existence of any such monster till i've dissected it with my own two hands yet conseil asked me doesn't master believe in gigantic devilfish yikes who in hades ever believed in them the canadian exclaimed many people ned my friend i said no fishermen scientists maybe pardon me ned fishermen and scientists why i to whom you speak conseil said with the world's straightest face i recall perfectly seeing a large boat dragged under the waves by the arms of a cephalopod you saw that the canadian asked yes ned with your own two eyes with my own two eyes where may i ask in saint malo conseil returned unflappably in the harbor ned land said sarcastically no in a church conseil replied in a church the canadian exclaimed 
yes ned my friend it had a picture that portrayed the devilfish in question oh good ned land exclaimed with a burst of laughter mr conseil put one over on me actually he's right i said i've heard about that picture but the subject it portrays is taken from a legend and you know how to rate legends in matters of natural history besides when it's an issue of monsters the human imagination always tends to run wild people not only claimed these devilfish could drag ships under but a certain oleus magnus tells of a cephalopod a mile long that looked more like an island than an animal there's also the story of how the bishop of trondheim set up an altar one day on an immense rock after he finished saying mass this rock started moving and went back into the sea the rock was a devilfish and that's everything we know the canadian asked no i replied another bishop pontopidon of bergen also tells of a devilfish so large a whole cavalry regiment could maneuver on it they sure did go on those old-time bishops ned land said finally the naturalists of antiquity mentioned some monsters with mouths as big as a gulf which were too huge to get through the strait of gibraltar good work men the canadian put in but in all these stories is there any truth conseil asked none at all my friends at least in those that go beyond the bounds of credibility and fly off into fable or legend yet for the imaginings of these storytellers there had to be if not a cause at least an excuse it can't be denied that some species of squid and other devilfish are quite large though still smaller than cetaceans aristotle put the dimensions of one squid at five cubits or three point one meters our fishermen frequently see specimens over one point eight meters long the museums in Trist and montpellier have preserved some devilfish carcasses measuring two meters besides according to the calculations of naturalists one of these animals only six feet long would have tentacles as long as twenty-seven which is enough to make a fearsome monster does anybody fish for them nowadays the canadian asked if they don't fish for them sailors at least sight them a friend of mine captain paul boss of le havre has often sworn to me that he encountered one of these monsters of colossal size in the seas of the east indies but the most astonishing event which proves that these gigantic animals undeniably exist took place a few years ago in eighteen sixty one what event was that ned land asked just this in eighteen sixty one to the northeast of tenerife and fairly near the latitude where we are right now the crew of the gunboat Electo spotted a monstrous squid swimming in their waters. Commander Bagur approached the animal and attacked it with blows from a harpoon and blasts from rifles, but without much success, because bullets and harpoons crossed its soft flesh as if it were semi-liquid jelly. After several fruitless attempts, the crew managed to slip a noose around the mollusk's body. This noose slid as far as the caudal fins and came to a halt. Then they tried to haul the monster on board, but its weight was so considerable that when they tugged on the rope, the animal parted company with its tail, and deprived of this adornment, it disappeared beneath the waters. Finally, an actual event, Ned Land said. An indisputable event, my gallant Ned. Accordingly, people have proposed naming this devilfish Bagur's Squid. And how long was it? the Canadian asked didn't it measure about six meters said conseil who was stationed at the window and examining anew the crevices in the cliff precisely i replied wasn't its head conseil went on crowned by eight tentacles that quivered in the water like a nest of snakes precisely weren't its eyes prominently placed and considerably enlarged yes conseil and wasn't its mouth a real parrot's beak but of fearsome size correct conseil well with all due respect to master conseil replied serenely if this isn't bagur's squid at least it's one of his close relatives i stared at conseil ned land rushed to the window what an awful animal he exclaimed i stared in my turn and couldn't keep back a movement of revulsion before my eyes there quivered a horrible monster worthy of a place among the most far-fetched teratological legends 
it was a squid of colossal dimensions fully eight meters long it was traveling backward with tremendous speed in the same direction as the nautilus it gazed with enormous staring eyes that were tinted sea green its eight arms or more accurately feet were rooted in its head which has earned these animals the name cephalopod its arms stretched a distance twice the length of its body and were writhing like the serpentine hair of the furies you could plainly see its two hundred and fifty suckers arranged over the inner sides of its tentacles and shaped like semispheric capsules sometimes these suckers fastened onto the lounge window by creating vacuums against it the monster's mouth a beak made of horn and shaped like that of a parrot opened and closed vertically its tongue also of horn substance and armed with several rows of sharp teeth would flicker out from between these genuine shears what a freak of nature a bird's beak on a mollusk its body was spindle-shaped and swollen in the middle a fleshy mass that must have weighed twenty thousand to twenty five thousand kilograms its unstable color would change with tremendous speed as the animal grew irritated passing successively from bluish gray to reddish brown what was irritating this mollusk no doubt the presence of the nautilus even more fearsome than itself and which it couldn't grip with its mandibles or the suckers on its arms and yet what monsters these devilfish are what vitality our creator has given them what vigor in their movements thanks to their owning a triple heart sheer chance had placed us in the presence of this squid and i didn't want to lose this opportunity to meticulously study such a cephalopod specimen i overcame the horror that its appearance inspired in me picked up a pencil and began to sketch it perhaps this is the same as the electos conseil said can't be the canadian replied because this one's complete while the other one lost its tail that doesn't necessarily follow i said the arms and tails of these animals grow back through regeneration and in seven years the tail on the gure's squid has surely had time to sprout again anyhow ned shot back if it isn't this fellow maybe it's one of those indeed other devilfish had appeared at the starboard window i counted seven of them they provided the nautilus with an escort and i could hear their beaks gnashing on the sheet iron hull we couldn't have asked for a more devoted following i continued sketching these monsters kept pace in our waters with such precision they seemed to be standing still and i could have traced their outlines in miniature on the window but we were moving at a moderate speed all at once the nautilus stopped a jolt made it tremble through its entire framework did we strike bottom i asked in any event we're already clear the canadian replied because we're afloat the nautilus was certainly afloat but it was no longer in motion the blades of its propeller weren't churning the waves a minute passed followed by his chief officer captain nemo entered the lounge i hadn't seen him in a good while he looked gloomy to me without speaking to us without even seeing us perhaps he went to the panel stared at the devilfish and said a few words to his chief officer the latter went out soon the panels closed the ceiling lit up i went over to the captain an unusual assortment of devilfish i told him as carefree as a collector in front of an aquarium correct mr naturalist he answered me and we're going to fight them at close quarters i gaped at the captain i thought my hearing had gone bad at close quarters i repeated yes sir our propeller is jammed i think the horn-covered mandibles of one of these squid are entangled in the blades that's why we aren't moving and what are you going to do rise to the surface and slaughter the vermin a difficult undertaking correct our electric bullets are ineffective against such soft flesh where they don't meet enough resistance to go off but we'll attack the beast with axes and harpoons sir the canadian said if you don't turn down my help i accept it mr land we'll go with you i said and we followed captain nemo heading to the central companionway there some ten men were standing by for the assault armed with boarding axes conseil and i picked up two more axes ned land seized a harpoon 
by then the nautilus had returned to the surface of the waves stationed on the top steps one of the seamen undid the bolts of the hatch but he had scarcely unscrewed the nuts when the hatch flew up with tremendous violence obviously pulled open by the suckers on a devilfish's arm instantly one of those long arms glided like a snake into the opening and twenty others were quivering above with a sweep of the axe captain nemo chopped off this fearsome tentacle which slid writhing down the steps just as we were crowding each other to reach the platform two more arms lashed the air swooped on the seamen stationed in front of captain nemo and carried the fellow away with irresistible violence captain nemo gave a shout and leaped outside we rushed after him what a scene seized by the tentacle and glued to its suckers the unfortunate man was swinging in the air at the mercy of this enormous appendage he gasped he choked he yelled help help these words pronounced in french left me deeply stunned so i had a fellow countryman on board perhaps several i'll hear his harrowing plea the rest of my life the poor fellow was done for who could tear him from such a powerful grip even so captain nemo rushed at the devilfish and with a sweep of the axe hewed one more of its arms his chief officer struggled furiously with the other monsters crawling up the nautilus's sides the crew battled with flailing axes the canadian conseil and i sank our weapons into these fleshy masses an intense musky odor filled the air it was horrible for an instant i thought the poor man entwined by the devilfish might be torn loose from its powerful suction seven arms out of the eight had been chopped off brandishing its victim like a feather one lone tentacle was writhing in the air but just as captain nemo and his chief officer rushed at it the animal shot off a spout of blackish liquid secreted by a pouch located in its abdomen it blinded us when this cloud had dispersed the squid was gone and so was my poor fellow countryman what rage then drove us against these monsters we lost all self-control ten or twelve devilfish had overrun the nautilus's platform and sides we piled helter-skelter into the thick of these sawed-off snakes which darted over the platform amid waves of blood and sepia ink it seemed as if these viscous tentacles grew back like the many heads of hydra at every thrust ned land's harpoon would plunge into a squid's sea-green eye and burst it but my daring companion was suddenly toppled by the tentacles of a monster he could not avoid oh my heart nearly exploded with excitement and horror the squid's fearsome beak was wide open over ned land the poor man was about to be cut in half i ran to his rescue but captain nemo got there first his axe disappeared between the two enormous mandibles and the canadian miraculously saved stood and plunged his harpoon all the way into the devilfish's triple heart tit for tat captain nemo told the canadian i owed it to myself ned bowed without answering him this struggle had lasted a quarter of an hour defeated mutilated battered to death the monsters finally yielded to us and disappeared beneath the waves red with blood motionless by the beacon captain nemo stared at the sea that had swallowed one of his companions and large tears streamed from his eyes End of Part 2, Chapter 18part two chapter nineteen of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne chapter nineteen the gulf stream this dreadful scene on april twenty none of us will ever be able to forget i wrote it up in a state of intense excitement later i reviewed my narrative i read it to conseil and the canadian they found it accurate in detail but deficient in impact to convey such sights it would take the pen of our most famous poet victor hugo author of the toilers of the sea as i said captain nemo wept while staring at the waves his grief was immense this was the second companion he had lost since we had come aboard and what a way to die smashed strangled crushed by the fearsome arms of a devilfish ground beneath its iron mandibles this friend would never rest with his companions in the placid waters of their coral cemetery as for me what had harrowed my heart in the thick of this struggle was the despairing yell given by this unfortunate man 
forgetting his regulation language this poor frenchman had reverted to speaking his own mother tongue to fling out one supreme plea among the nautilus's crew allied body and soul with captain nemo and likewise fleeing from human contact i had found a fellow countryman was he the only representative of france in this mysterious alliance obviously made up of individuals from different nationalities this was just one more of those insoluble problems that kept welling up in my mind captain nemo re-entered his stateroom and i saw no more of him for a good while but how sad despairing and irresolute he must have felt to judge from this ship whose soul he was which reflected his every mood the nautilus no longer kept to a fixed heading it drifted back and forth riding with the waves like a corpse its propeller had been disentangled but was barely put to use it was navigating at random it couldn't tear itself away from the setting of this last struggle from this sea that had devoured one of its own ten days went by in this way it was only on may first that the nautilus openly resumed its northbound course after raising the bahamas at the mouth of old bahama channel we then went with the current of the sea's greatest river which has its own banks fish and temperature i mean the gulf stream it is indeed a river that runs independently through the middle of the atlantic its waters never mixing with the ocean's waters it's a salty river saltier than the sea surrounding it its average depth is three thousand feet its average width sixty miles in certain localities its current moves at a speed of four kilometers per hour the unchanging volume of its waters is greater than that of all the world's rivers combined as discovered by commander maury the true source of the gulf stream its starting point if you prefer is located in the bay of biscay there its waters still weak in temperature and color begin to form it goes down south skirts equatorial africa warms its waves in the rays of the torrid zone crosses the atlantic reaches cape sao roque on the coast of brazil and forks into two branches one going to the caribbean sea for further saturation with heat particles then entrusted with restoring the balance between hot and cold temperatures and with mixing tropical and northern waters the gulf stream begins to play its stabilizing role attaining a white heat in the gulf of mexico it heads north up the american coast advances as far as newfoundland swerves away under the thrust of a cold current from the davies strait and resumes its ocean course by going along the great circle of the earth on the rum line it then divides into two arms near the forty-third parallel one helped by the northeast trade winds returns to the bay of biscay and the azores the other washes the shores of ireland and norway with lukewarm water goes beyond spitzbergen where its temperature falls to four degrees centigrade and fashions the open sea at the pole it was on this oceanic river that the nautilus was then navigating leaving old bahama channel with its fourteen leagues wide by three hundred and fifty meters deep the gulf stream moves at the rate of eight kilometers per hour its speed steadily decreases as it advances northward and we must pray that this steadiness continues because as experts agree if its speed and direction were to change the climates of europe would undergo disturbances whose consequences are incalculable near noon i was on the platform with conseil i shared with him the relevant details on the gulf stream when my explanation was over i invited him to dip his hands into its current conseil did so and he was quite astonished to experience no sensation of either hot or cold that comes i told him from the water temperature of the gulf stream which as it leaves the gulf of mexico is barely different from your blood temperature this gulf stream is a huge heat generator that enables the coasts of europe to be decked in eternal greenery and if commander maury is correct were one to harness the full warmth of this current it would supply enough heat to keep molten a river of iron solder as big as the amazon or the missouri just then the gulf stream's speed was two point two five meters per second so distinct is its current from the surrounding sea its confined waters stand out against the ocean and operate on a different level from the colder waters murky as well and very rich in saline material their pure indigo contrasts with the green waves surrounding them 
moreover their line of demarcation is so clear that abreast of the carolinas the nautilus's spur cut the waves of the gulf stream while its propeller was still churning those belonging to the ocean this current swept along with it a whole host of moving creatures argonauts so common in the mediterranean voyaged here in schools of large numbers among cartilaginous fish the most remarkable were rays whose ultra slender tails made up nearly a third of the body which was shaped like a huge diamond twenty-five feet long then little one-meter sharks the head large the snout short and rounded the teeth sharp and arranged in several rows the body seemingly covered with scales among bony fish i noted grizzled wrasse unique in these seas deep-water gilthead whose iris has a fiery gleam one-meter croakers whose large mouths bristle with small teeth and which lets out thin cries black rudderfish like those i've already discussed blue dorados accented with gold and silver rainbow-hued parrotfish that can rival the loveliest tropical birds in coloring banded blennies with triangular heads bluish flounder without scales toadfish covered with a crosswise yellow band in the shape of a t swarms of little freckled gobies stippled with brown spots lungfish with silver heads and yellow tails various specimens of salmon mullet with slim figures and a softly glowing radiance that lassipi dedicated to the memory of his wife and finally the american kavala a handsome fish decorated by every honorary order bedizened with their every ribbon frequenting the shores of this great nation where ribbons and orders are held in such low esteem i might add that during the night the gulf stream's phosphorescent waters rivaled the electric glow of our beacon especially in the stormy weather that frequently threatened us on may eight while abreast of north carolina we were across from cape hatteras once more there the gulf stream is seventy five miles wide and two hundred and ten meters deep the nautilus continued to wander at random seemingly all supervision had been jettisoned under these conditions i admit that we could easily have gotten away in fact the populous shores offered ready refuge everywhere the sea was plowed continuously by the many steamers providing service between the gulf of mexico and new york or boston and it was crossed night and day by little schooners engaged in coastal trade over various points on the american shore we could hope to be picked up so it was a promising opportunity despite the thirty miles that separated the nautilus from these union coasts but one distressing circumstance totally thwarted the canadians plans the weather was thoroughly foul we were approaching waterways where storms are commonplace the very homeland of tornadoes and cyclones specifically engendered by the gulf stream's current to face a frequently raging sea in a frail skiff was a race to certain disaster ned land conceded this himself so he champed at the bit in the grip of an intense homesickness that could be cured only by our escape sir he told me that day it's got to stop i want to get to the bottom of this your nemo's veering away from shore and heading up north but believe you me i had my fill at the south pole and i'm not going with him to the north pole what can we do ned since it isn't feasible to escape right now i keep coming back to my idea we've got to talk to the captain when we were in your own country's seas you didn't say a word now that we're in mine i intend to speak up before a few days are out i figure the nautilus will lie abreast of nova scotia and from there to newfoundland is the mouth of a large gulf and the st lawrence empties into that gulf and the st lawrence is my own river the river running by quebec my home town and when i think about all this my gorge rises and my hair stands on end honestly sir i'd rather jump overboard i can't stay here any longer i'm suffocating the canadian was obviously at the end of his patience his vigorous nature couldn't adapt to this protracted imprisonment his facial appearance was changing by the day his moods grew gloomier and gloomier i had a sense of what he was suffering because i also was gripped by homesickness nearly seven months had gone by without our having any news from shore moreover captain nemo's reclusiveness his changed disposition and especially his total silence since the battle with the devilfish all made me see things in a different light i no longer felt the enthusiasm of our first days on board 
you needed to be flemish like conseil to accept these circumstances living in a habitat designed for cetaceans and other denizens of the deep truly if that gallant lad had owned gills instead of lungs i think he would have made an outstanding fish well sir ned land went on seeing that i hadn't replied well ned you want me to ask captain nemo what he intends to do with us yes sir even though he has already made that clear yes i want it settled once and for all speak just for me strictly on my behalf if you want but i rarely encounter him he positively avoids me all the more reason you should go look him up i'll confer with him ned when the canadian asked insistently when i encounter him professor aronnax would you like me to go find him myself no let me do it tomorrow today ned land said so be it i'll see him today i answered the canadian who if he took action himself would certainly have ruined everything i was left to myself his request granted i decided to dispose of it immediately i like things over and done with i re-entered my stateroom from there i could hear movements inside captain nemo's quarters i couldn't pass up this chance for an encounter i knocked on his door i received no reply i knocked again then tried the knob the door opened i entered the captain was there he was bending over his work table and hadn't heard me determined not to leave without questioning him i drew closer he looked up sharply with a frowning brow and said in a pretty stern tone oh it's you what do you want to speak with you captain but i'm busy sir i'm at work i give you the freedom to enjoy your privacy can't i have the same for myself this reception was less than encouraging but i was determined to give as good as i got sir i said coolly i need to speak with you on a matter that simply can't wait whatever could that be sir he replied sarcastically have you made some discovery that has escaped me has the sea yielded up some novel secret to you we were miles apart but before i could reply he showed me a manuscript open on the table and told me in a more serious tone here professor aronnax is a manuscript written in several languages it contains a summary of my research under the sea and god willing it won't perish with me signed with my name complete with my life story this manuscript will be enclosed in a small unsinkable contrivance the last surviving man on the nautilus will throw this contrivance into the sea and it will go wherever the waves carry it the man's name his life story written by himself so the secret of his existence might some day be unveiled but just then i saw this announcement only as a lead-in to my topic captain i replied i'm all praise for this idea you're putting into effect the fruits of your research must not be lost but the methods you're using strike me as primitive who knows where the winds will take that contrivance into whose hands it may fall can't you find something better can't you or one of your men never sir the captain said swiftly interrupting me but my companions and i would be willing to safeguard this manuscript and if you give us back our freedom your freedom captain nemo put in standing up yes sir and that's the subject on which i wanted to confer with you for seven months we've been aboard your vessel and i ask you today in the name of my companions as well as myself if you intend to keep us here forever professor aronnax captain nemo said i'll answer you today just as i did seven months ago whomever boards the nautilus must never leave it what you're inflicting on us is outright slavery call it anything you like but every slave has the right to recover his freedom by any worthwhile available means who has denied you that right captain nemo replied did i ever try to bind you with your word of honor the captain stared at me crossing his arms sir i told him to take up this subject a second time would be distasteful to both of us so let's finish what we've started i repeat it isn't just for myself that i raise this issue to me research is a relief a potent diversion an enticement a passion that can make me forget everything else like you i'm a man neglected and unknown living in the faint hope that some day i can pass on to future generations the fruits of my labors 
figuratively speaking by means of some contrivance left to the luck of winds and waves in short i can admire you and comfortably go with you while playing a role i only partly understand but i still catch glimpses of other aspects of your life that are surrounded by involvements and secrets that alone on board my companions and i can't share and even when our hearts could beat with yours moved by some of your griefs or stirred by your deeds of courage and genius we've had to stifle even the slightest token of that sympathy that arises at the sight of something fine and good whether it comes from friend or enemy all right then it's this feeling of being alien to your deepest concerns that makes our situation unacceptable impossible even impossible for me but especially for ned land every man by virtue of his very humanity deserves fair treatment have you considered how a love of freedom and hatred of slavery could lead to plans of vengeance in a temperament like the canadian's what he might think attempt endeavor i fell silent captain nemo stood up ned land can think attempt or endeavor anything he wants what difference is it to me i didn't go looking for him i don't keep him on board for my pleasure as for you professor aronnax you're a man able to understand anything even silence i have nothing more to say to you let this first time you've come to discuss this subject also be the last because a second time i won't even listen i withdrew from that day forward our position was very strained i reported this conversation to my two companions now we know ned land said that we can't expect a thing from this man the nautilus is nearing long island we'll escape no matter what the weather but the skies became more and more threatening there were conspicuous signs of a hurricane on the way the atmosphere was turning white and milky slender sheaves of cirrus clouds were followed on the horizon by layers of nimbocumulus other low clouds fled swiftly the sea grew towering inflated by long swells every bird had disappeared except a few petrels friends of the storms the barometer fell significantly indicating a tremendous tension in the surrounding haze the mixture in our storm glass decomposed under the influence of the electricity charging the air a struggle of the elements was approaching the storm burst during the daytime of may thirteen just as the nautilus was cruising abreast of long island a few miles from the narrows to upper new york bay i am able to describe this struggle of the elements because captain nemo didn't flee into the ocean depths instead from some inexplicable whim he decided to brave it out on the surface the wind was blowing from the southwest initially a stiff breeze in other words with a speed of fifteen meters per second which built to twenty-five meters near three o'clock in the afternoon this is the figure for major storms unshaken by these squalls captain nemo stationed himself on the platform he was lashed around the waist to withstand the monstrous breakers foaming over the deck i hoisted and attached myself to the same place dividing my wonderment between the storm and this incomparable man who faced it head on the raging sea was swept with huge tattered clouds drenched by the waves i saw no more of the small intervening billows that form in the troughs of the big crests just long soot-colored undulations with crests so compact they didn't foam they kept growing taller they were spurring each other on the nautilus sometimes lying on its side sometimes standing on end like a mast rolled and pitched frightfully near five o'clock a torrential rain fell but it lulled neither wind nor sea the hurricane was unleashed at a speed of forty-five meters per second hence almost forty leagues per hour under these conditions houses topple roof tiles puncture doors iron railings snap in two and twenty-four pounder cannons relocate and yet in the midst of this turmoil the nautilus lived up to that saying of an expert engineer a well-constructed hull can defy any sea this submersible was no resisting rock that waves could demolish it was a steel spindle obediently in motion without rigging or masting and able to brave their fury with impunity meanwhile i was carefully examining these unleashed breakers they measured up to fifteen meters in height over a length of one hundred and fifty to one hundred and seventy five meters and the speed of their propagation 
half that of the wind, was fifteen meters per second. Their volume and power increased with the depth of the waters. I then understood the role played by these waves, which trap air in their flanks and release it in the depths of the sea where its oxygen brings life. Their utmost pressure, it has been calculated, can build to 3,000 kilograms on every square foot of surface they strike. It was such waves in the Hebrides that repositioned a stone block weighing 84,000 pounds. It was their relatives in the tidal wave on December 23, 1854, that toppled part of the Japanese city of Tokyo, then went that same day at 700 kilometers per hour to break on the beaches of America. After nightfall, the storm grew in intensity. As in the 1860 cyclone on Reunion Island, the barometer fell to 710 millimeters. At the close of day, I saw a big ship passing on the horizon, struggling painfully. It lay, too, at half steam in an effort to hold steady on the waves. It must have been a steamer on one of those lines out of New York to Liverpool or Le Havre. It soon vanished into the shadows. At ten o'clock in the evening, the skies caught on fire. The air was streaked with violent flashes of lightning. I couldn't stand this brightness, but Captain Nemo stared straight at it, as if to inhale the spirit of the storm. A dreadful noise filled the air, a complicated noise made up of the roar of crashing breakers, the howl of the wind, claps of thunder. The wind shifted to every point of the horizon, and the cyclone left the east to return there after passing through north, west, and south, moving in the opposite direction of revolving storms in the southern hemisphere. Oh, that Gulf Stream! It truly lives up to its nickname, the Lord of Storms. All by itself it creates these fearsome cyclones through the difference in temperature between its currents and the superimposed layers of air. The rain was followed by a downpour of fire. Droplets of water changed into exploding tufts. You would have thought Captain Nemo was courting a death worthy of himself, seeking to be struck by lightning. In one hideous pitching movement, the Nautilus reared its steel spur into the air like a lightning rod, and I saw long sparks shoot down it. Shattered, at the end of my strength, I slid flat on my belly to the hatch. I opened it and went below to the lounge. By then the storm had reached its maximum intensity. It was impossible to stand upright inside the Nautilus. Captain Nemo re-entered near midnight. I could hear the ballast tanks filling little by little, and the Nautilus sank gently beneath the surface of the waves. Through the lounge's open windows, I saw large, frightened fish passing like phantoms in the fiery waters. Some were struck by lightning right before my eyes. The Nautilus kept descending. I thought it would find calm again at fifteen meters down. No. The upper strata was too violently agitated. It needed to sink to fifty meters, searching for a resting place in the bowels of the sea. But once there, what tranquility we found! What silence! What peace all around us! Who would have known that a dreadful hurricane was then unleashed on the surface of this ocean? End of Part 2, Chapter 19Part 2, Chapter 20 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne Chapter 20 in latitude 47 degrees 24 minutes and longitude 17 degrees 28 minutes in the aftermath of this storm we were thrown back to the east away went any hope of escaping to the landing places of new york or the st lawrence in despair poor ned went into seclusion like captain nemo conseil and i no longer left each other as i said the nautilus veered to the east to be more accurate, I should have said to the northeast. Sometimes on the surface of the waves, sometimes beneath them, the ship wandered for days amid these mists so feared by navigators. These are caused chiefly by melting ice, which keeps the air extremely damp. How many ships have perished in these waterways as they tried to get directions from the hazy lights on the coast? How many casualties have been caused by these opaque mists? How many collisions have occurred with these reefs, where the breaking surf is covered by the noise of the wind? 
how many vessels have rammed each other despite their running lights despite the warnings given by their bosun's pipes and alarm bells so the floor of this sea had the appearance of a battlefield where every ship defeated by the ocean still lay some already old and encrusted others newer and reflecting our beacon light on their ironwork and copper undersides among these vessels how many went down with all hands with their crews and hosts of immigrants at these trouble spots so prominent in the statistics cape race st paul island the strait of belle isle the st lawrence estuary and in only a few years how many victims have been furnished to the obituary notices by the royal mail inman and montreal lines by vessels named the solway the isis the paramata the hungarian the canadian the anglo-saxon the humboldt and the united states all run aground by the arctic and the lyonnaise sunk in collisions by the president the pacific and the city of glasgow lost for reasons unknown in the midst of their gloomy rubble the nautilus navigated as if passing the dead in review by may fifteen we were off the southern tip of the grand banks of newfoundland these banks are the result of marine sedimentation an extensive accumulation of organic waste brought either from the equator by the gulf stream's current or from the north pole by the countercurrent of cold water that skirts the american coast here too erratically drifting chunks collect from the ice breakup here a huge boneyard forms from fish mollusks and zoophytes dying over it by the billions the sea is of no great depth at the grand banks a few hundred fathoms at best but to the south there is a deep suddenly occurring depression a three thousand meter pit here the gulf stream widens its waters come to full bloom it loses its speed and temperature but it turns into a sea among the fish that the nautilus startled on its way i'll mention a one meter lump fish blackish on top with orange on the belly and rare among its brethren in that it practices monogamy a good-sized eel pout a type of emerald moray whose flavor is excellent wolf fish with big eyes in a head somewhat resembling a canine's viviparous blennies whose eggs hatch inside their bodies like those of snakes bloated gobio or black gudgeon measuring two decimeters grenadiers with long tails and gleaming with a silvery glow speedy fish venturing far from their high arctic seas our nets also hauled in a bold daring vigorous and muscular fish armed with prickles on its head and stings on its fins a real scorpion measuring two to three meters the ruthless enemy of cod blennies and salmon it was the bullhead of the northerly seas a fish with red fins and a brown body covered with nodules the nautilus's fishermen had some trouble getting a grip on this animal which thanks to the formation of its gill covers can protect its respiratory organs from any parching contact with the air and can live out of water for a good while and i'll mention for the record some little banded blennies that follow ships into the northernmost seas sharp snouted carp exclusive to the north atlantic scorpion fish and lastly the gadoid family chiefly the cod species which i detected in their waters of choice over these inexhaustible grand banks because newfoundland is simply an underwater peak you could call these cod mountain fish while the nautilus was clearing a path through their tight ranks conseil couldn't refrain from making this comment mercy look at these cod he said why i thought cod were flat like dab or sole innocent boy i exclaimed cod are flat only at the grocery store where they're cut open and spread out on display but in the water they're like mullet spindle-shaped and perfectly built for speed i can easily believe master conseil replied but what crowds of them what swarms bah my friend there'd be many more without their enemies scorpion fish and human beings do you know how many eggs have been counted in a single female 
i'll go all out conseil replied five hundred thousand eleven million my friend eleven million i refuse to accept that until i count them myself so count them conseil but it will be less work to believe me besides frenchmen englishmen americans danes and norwegian catch these cod by the thousands they're eaten in prodigious quantities and without the astonishing fertility of these fish the seas would soon be depopulated of them accordingly in england and america alone five thousand ships manned by seventy-five thousand seamen go after cod each ship brings back an average catch of forty-four hundred fish making twenty-two million off the coast of norway the total is the same fine conseil replied i'll take master's word for it i won't count them count what those eleven million eggs but i'll make one comment what's that if all their eggs hatched just four codfish could feed england america and norway as we skimmed the depths of the grand banks i could see perfectly those long fishing lines each armed with two hundred hooks that every boat dangled by the dozens the lower end of each line dragged the bottom by means of a small grappling iron and at the surface it was secured to the buoy rope of a cork float the nautilus had to maneuver shrewdly in the midst of this underwater spider web but the ship didn't stay long in these heavily traveled waterways it went up to about latitude forty two degrees this brought it abreast of st john's in newfoundland and heart's content where the atlantic cable reaches its end point instead of continuing north the nautilus took an easterly heading as if to go along this plateau on which the telegraph cable rests where multiple soundings have given the contours of the terrain with the utmost accuracy it was on may seventeen about five hundred miles from heart's content and two thousand eight hundred meters down that i spotted this cable lying on the seafloor conseil whom i hadn't alerted mistook it at first for a gigantic sea snake and was gearing up to classify it in his best manner but i enlightened the fine lad and led him down gently by giving him various details on the laying of this cable the first cable was put down during the years eighteen fifty seven through eighteen fifty eight but after transmitting about four hundred telegrams it went dead in eighteen sixty three engineers built a new cable that measured three thousand four hundred kilometers weighed four thousand five hundred metric tons and was shipped aboard the great eastern this attempt also failed now then on may twenty fifth while submerged to a depth of three thousand eight hundred thirty six meters the nautilus lay in precisely the locality where this second cable suffered the rupture that ruined the undertaking it happened six hundred and thirty eight miles from the coast of ireland at around two o'clock in the afternoon all contact with europe broke off the electricians on board decided to cut the cable before fishing it up and by eleven o'clock that evening they had retrieved the damaged part they repaired the joint and its splice then the cable was resubmerged but a few days later it snapped again and couldn't be recovered from the ocean depths these americans refused to give up the daring cyrus field who had risked his whole fortune to promote this undertaking called for a new bond issue it sold out immediately another cable was put down under better conditions its sheaves of conducting wire were insulated within a gutta percha covering which was protected by a padding of textile material enclosed in a metal sheath the great eastern put back to sea on july thirteenth eighteen sixty six the operation proceeded apace yet there was one hitch as they gradually unrolled this third cable the electricians observed on several occasions that someone had recently driven nails into it trying to damage its core captain anderson his officers and the engineers put their heads together then posted a warning that if the culprit were detected he would be thrown overboard without a trial after that these villainous attempts were not repeated by july twenty three the great eastern was lying no farther than eight hundred kilometers from newfoundland when it received telegraphed news from ireland of an armistice signed between prussia and austria after the battle of sadova 
through the mists on the 27th, it sighted the port of Heart's Content. The undertaking had ended happily, and in its first dispatch, young America addressed old Europe with these wise words so rarely understood. Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to men of good will. I didn't expect to find this electric cable in mint condition, as it looked on leaving its place of manufacture. The long snake was covered with seashell rubble and bristling with foraminifera. A crust of caked gravel protected it from any mollusks that might bore into it. It rested serenely, sheltered from the sea's motions, under a pressure favorable to the transmission of that electric spark that goes from America to Europe in thirty-two one-hundredths of a second. This cable will no doubt last indefinitely because, as observers note, its gutta-percha casing is improved by a stay in salt water. Besides, on this well-chosen plateau, the cable never lies at depths that could cause a break. The Nautilus followed it to its lowest reaches, located 4,431 meters down, and even there it rested without any stress or strain. Then we returned to the locality where the 1863 accident had taken place. There the ocean floor formed a valley 120 kilometers wide, into which you could fit Mont Blanc without its summit poking above the surface of the waves. This valley is closed off to the east by a sheer wall 2,000 meters high. We arrived there on May 28, and the Nautilus lay no farther than 150 kilometers from Ireland. Would Captain Nemo head up north and beach us on the British Isles? No. Much to my surprise, he went back down south and returned to European seas. As we swung around the Emerald Isle, I spotted Cape Clear for an instant, plus the lighthouse on Fastnet Rock that guides all those thousands of ships setting out from Glasgow or Liverpool. An important question then popped into my head. Would the Nautilus dare to tackle the English Channel? Ned Land, who promptly reappeared after we hugged shore, never stopped questioning me. What could I answer him? Captain Nemo remained invisible. After giving the Canadian a glimpse of American shores, was he about to show me the coast of France? But the Nautilus kept gravitating southward. On May 30, in sight of Land's End, it passed between the lowermost tip of England and the Scilly Islands, which it left behind to starboard. If it was going to enter the English Channel, it clearly needed to head east. It did not. All day long, on May 31, the Nautilus swept around the sea in a series of circles that had me deeply puzzled. It seemed to be searching for a locality that it had some trouble finding. At noon, Captain Nemo himself came to take our bearings. He didn't address a word to me. He looked gloomier than ever. What was filling him with such sadness? Was it our proximity to these European shores? Was he reliving his memories of that country he had left behind? If so, what did he feel? Remorse or regret? For a good while, these thoughts occupied my mind, and I had a hunch that fate would soon give away the captain's secrets. The next day, June 1st, the Nautilus kept to the same tack. It was obviously trying to locate some precise spot in the ocean. Just as on the day before, Captain Nemo came to take the altitude of the sun. The sea was smooth, the skies clear. Eight miles to the east, a big steamship was visible on the horizon line. No flag was flapping from the gaff of its fore and aft sail, and I couldn't tell its nationality. A few minutes before the sun passed its zenith, Captain Nemo raised his sextant and took his sights with the utmost precision. The absolute calm of the waves facilitated this operation. The Nautilus lay motionless, neither rolling nor pitching. I was on the platform just then. After determining our position, the captain pronounced only these words. It's right here. He went down the hatch. Had he seen that vessel change course and seemingly head toward us? I'm unable to say. I returned to the lounge. The hatch closed, and I heard water hissing in the ballast tanks. The Nautilus began to sink on a vertical line, because its propeller was in check and no longer furnished any forward motion. 
some minutes later it stopped at a depth of eight hundred and thirty three meters and came to rest on the seafloor the ceiling lights in the lounge then went out the panels opened and through the windows i saw for a half mile radius the sea brightly lit by the beacon's rays i looked to port and saw nothing but the immenseness of these tranquil waters to starboard a prominent bulge on the sea bottom caught my attention you would have thought it was some ruin enshrouded in a crust of whitened seashells as if under a mantle of snow carefully examining this mass i could identify the swollen outlines of a ship shorn of its masts which must have sunk bow first this casualty certainly dated from some far-off time to be so caked with the limestone of these waters this wreckage must have spent many a year on the ocean floor what ship was this why had the nautilus come to visit its grave was it something other than a maritime accident that had dragged this craft under the waters i wasn't sure what to think but next to me i heard captain nemo's voice slowly saying originally this ship was christened the marseillaise it carried seventy-four cannons and was launched in seventeen sixty two on august thirteenth seventeen seventy eight commanded by le poep vertrio it fought valiantly against the preston on july four seventeen seventy nine as a member of the squadron under admiral d'estaing it assisted in the capture of the island of granada on september five seventeen eighty one under the count de grasse it took part in the battle of chesapeake bay in seventeen ninety four the new republic of france changed the name of this ship on april sixteen of that same year it joined the squadron at brest under rear admiral villarette de joyeuse who was entrusted with escorting a convoy of wheat coming from america under the command of admiral van stabel in this second year of the french revolutionary calendar on the eleventh and twelfth days in the month of pasture this squadron fought an encounter with english vessels sir today is june first eighteen sixty eight or the thirteenth day in the month of pasture seventy four years ago to the day at this very spot in latitude forty seven degrees twenty four minutes and longitude seventeen degrees twenty eight minutes this ship sank after a heroic battle its three masts gone water in its hold a third of its crew out of action it preferred to go to the bottom with its three hundred and fifty six seamen rather than surrender and with its flag nailed up on the after deck it disappeared beneath the waves to shouts of long live the republic this is the avenger i exclaimed yes sir the avenger a splendid name captain nemo murmured crossing his arms End of Part 2, Chapter 20。Part 2, Chapter 21 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. Chapter 21 A Mass Execution. The way he said this, the unexpectedness of this scene, first the biography of this patriotic ship, then the excitement with which this eccentric individual pronounced these last words the name avenger whose significance could not escape me all this taken together had a profound impact on my mind my eyes never left the captain hands outstretched toward the sea he contemplated the proud wreck with blazing eyes perhaps i would never learn who he was where he came from or where he was heading but more and more i could see a distinction between the man and the scientist it was no ordinary misanthropy that kept captain nemo and his companions sequestered inside the nautilus's plating but a hate so monstrous or so sublime that the passing years could never weaken it did this hate also hunger for vengeance time would soon tell meanwhile the nautilus rose slowly to the surface of the sea and i watched the avenger's murky shape disappearing little by little soon a gentle rolling told me that we were afloat in the open air just then a hollow explosion was audible i looked at the captain the captain did not stir captain 
i said he didn't reply i left him and climbed onto the platform conseil and the canadian were already there what caused that explosion i asked a cannon going off ned land replied i stared in the direction of the ship i had spotted it was heading toward the nautilus and you could tell it had put on steam six miles separated it from us what sort of craft is it ned from its rigging and its low masts the canadian replied i bet it's a warship here's hoping it pulls up and sinks this damned nautilus ned my friend conseil replied what harm could it do the nautilus will it attack us under the waves will it cannonade us at the bottom of the sea tell me ned i asked can you make out the nationality of that craft creasing his brow lowering his lids and puckering the corners of his eyes the canadian focused the full power of his gaze on the ship for a short while no sir he replied i can't make out what nation it's from it's flying no flag but i'll swear it's a warship because there's a long pennant streaming from the peak of its mainmast for a quarter of an hour we continued to watch the craft bearing down on us but it was inconceivable to me that it had discovered the nautilus at such a distance still less that it knew what this underwater machine really was soon the canadian announced that the craft was a big battleship a double-decker ironclad complete with ram dark dense smoke burst from its two funnels its furled sails merged with the lines of its yard arms the gaff of its fore and aft sail flew no flag its distance still kept us from distinguishing the colors of its pennant which was fluttering like a thin ribbon it was coming on fast if captain nemo let it approach a chance for salvation might be available to us sir ned land told me if that boat gets within a mile of us i'm jumping overboard and i suggest you follow suit i didn't reply to the canadian's proposition but kept watching the ship which was looming larger on the horizon whether it was english french american or russian it would surely welcome us aboard if we could just get to it master may recall conseil then said that we have some experience with swimming he can rely on me to tow him to that vessel if he's agreeable to going with our friend ned before i could reply white smoke streamed from the battleship's bow then a few seconds later the waters splashed astern of the nautilus disturbed by the fall of a heavy object soon after an explosion struck my ears what's this they're firing at us i exclaimed good lads the canadian muttered that means they don't see us as castaways clinging to some wreckage with all due respect to master gracious conseil put in shaking off the water that had sprayed over him from another shell with all due respect to master they've discovered the narwhal and they're cannonading the same but it must be clear to them i exclaimed that they're dealing with human beings maybe that's why ned land replied staring hard at me the full truth dawned on me undoubtedly people now knew where they stood on the existence of this so-called monster undoubtedly the latter's encounter with the abraham lincoln when the canadian hit it with his harpoon had led commander farragut to recognize the narwhal as actually an underwater boat more dangerous than any unearthly cetacean yes this had to be the case and undoubtedly they were now chasing this dreadful engine of destruction on every sea dreadful indeed if as we could assume captain nemo had been using the nautilus in works of vengeance that night in the middle of the indian ocean when he imprisoned us in the cell hadn't he attacked some ship that man now buried in the coral cemetery wasn't he the victim of some collision caused by the nautilus yes i repeat this had to be the case one part of captain nemo's secret life had been unveiled and now even though his identity was still unknown at least the nations allied against him knew they were no longer hunting some fairy tale monster but a man who had sworn an implacable hate toward them this whole fearsome sequence of events appeared in my mind's eye instead of encountering friends on this approaching ship we would find only pitiless enemies 
meanwhile shells fell around us in increasing numbers some meeting the liquid surface would ricochet and vanish into the sea at considerable distances but none of them reached the nautilus by then the ironclad was no more than three miles off despite its violent cannonade captain nemo hadn't appeared on the platform and yet if one of those conical shells had scored a routine hit on the nautilus's hull it could have been fatal to him the canadian then told me sir we've got to do everything we can to get out of this jam let's signal them damnation maybe they'll realize we're decent people ned land pulled out his handkerchief to wave it in the air but he had barely unfolded it when he was felled by an iron fist and despite his great strength he tumbled to the deck scum the captain shouted do you want to be nailed to the nautilus's spur before it charges that ship dreadful to hear captain nemo was even more dreadful to see his face was pale from some spasm of his heart which must have stopped beating for an instant his pupils were hideously contracted his voice was no longer speaking it was bellowing bending from the waist he shook the canadian by the shoulders then dropping ned and turning to the battleship whose shells were showering around him oh ship of an accursed nation you know who i am he shouted in his powerful voice and i don't need your colors to recognize you look i'll show you mine and in the bow of the platform captain nemo unfurled a black flag like the one he had left planted at the south pole just then a shell hit the nautilus's hull obliquely failed to breach it ricocheted near the captain and vanished into the sea captain nemo shrugged his shoulders then addressing me go below he told me in a curt tone you and your companions go below sir i exclaimed are you going to attack the ship sir i am going to sink it you wouldn't i will captain nemo replied icily you're ill-advised to pass judgment on me sir fate has shown you what you weren't meant to see the attack has come our reply will be dreadful get back inside from what country is that ship you don't know fine so much the better at least its nationality will remain a secret to you go below the canadian conseil and i could only obey some fifteen of the nautilus's seamen surrounded their captain and stared with a feeling of implacable hate at the ship bearing down on them you could feel the same spirit of vengeance in kindling their very soul i went below just as another projectile scraped the nautilus's hull and i heard the captain exclaim shoot you demented vessel shower your futile shells you won't escape the nautilus's spur but this isn't the place where you'll perish i don't want your wreckage mingling with that of the avenger i repaired to my stateroom the captain and his chief officer stayed on the platform the propeller was set in motion the nautilus swiftly retreated putting us outside the range of the vessel's shells but the chase continued and captain nemo was content to keep his distance near four o'clock in the afternoon unable to control the impatience and uneasiness devouring me i went back to the central companionway the hatch was open i ventured onto the platform the captain was still strolling there his steps agitated he stared at the ship which stayed to his leeward five or six miles off he was circling it like a wild beast drawing it eastward letting it chase after him yet he didn't attack was he perhaps still undecided i tried to intervene one last time but i had barely queried captain nemo when the latter silenced me i'm the law i'm the tribunal i'm the oppressed and there are my oppressors thanks to them i've witnessed the destruction of everything i loved cherished and venerated homeland wife children father and mother there lies everything i hate not another word out of you i took a last look at the battleship which was putting on steam then i rejoined ned and conseil we'll escape i exclaimed good ned put in where's that ship from i've no idea but wherever it's from it will sink before nightfall in any event it's better to perish with it than be accomplices in some act of vengeance whose merits we can't gauge that's my feeling ned land replied coolly 
let's wait for nightfall night fell a profound silence reigned on board the compass indicated that the nautilus hadn't changed direction i could hear the beat of its propeller churning the waves with steady speed staying on the surface of the water it rolled gently sometimes to one side sometimes to the other my companions and i had decided to escape as soon as the vessel came close enough for us to be heard or seen because the moon would wax full in three days and was shining brightly once we were aboard that ship if we couldn't ward off the blow that threatened it at least we could do everything that circumstances permitted several times i thought the nautilus was about to attack but it was content to let its adversary approach and then it would quickly resume its retreating ways part of the night passed without incident we kept watch for an opportunity to take action we talked little being too keyed up ned land was all for jumping overboard i forced him to wait as i saw it the nautilus would attack the double-decker on the surface of the waves and then it would be not only possible but easy to escape at three o'clock in the morning full of uneasiness i climbed onto the platform captain nemo hadn't left it he stood in the bow next to his flag which a mild breeze was unfurling above his head his eyes never left that vessel the extraordinary intensity of his gaze seemed to attract it beguile it and draw it more surely than if he had it in tow the moon then passed its zenith jupiter was rising in the east in the midst of this placid natural setting sky and ocean competed with each other in tranquillity and the sea offered the orb of night the loveliest mirror ever to reflect its image and when i compared this deep calm of the elements with all the fury seething inside the plating of this barely perceptible nautilus i shivered all over the vessel was two miles off it drew nearer always moving toward the phosphorescent glow that signaled the nautilus's presence i saw its green and red running lights plus the white lantern hanging from the large stay of its foremast hazy flickerings were reflected on its rigging and indicated that its furnaces were pushed to the limit showers of sparks and cinders of flaming coal escaped from its funnels spangling the air with stars i stood there until six o'clock in the morning captain nemo never seeming to notice me the vessel lay a mile and a half off and with the first glimmers of daylight it resumed its cannonade the time couldn't be far away when the nautilus would attack its adversary and my companions and i would leave forever this man i dared not judge i was about to go below to alert them when the chief officer climbed onto the platform several seamen were with him captain nemo didn't see them or didn't want to see them they carried out certain procedures that on the nautilus you could call clearing the decks for action they were quite simple the man ropes that formed a handrail around the platform were lowered likewise the pilot house and the beacon housing were withdrawn into the hull until they lay exactly flush with it the surface of this long sheet iron cigar no longer offered a single protrusion that could hamper its maneuvers i returned to the lounge the nautilus still emerged above the surface a few morning gleams infiltrated the liquid strata beneath the undulations of the billows the windows were enlivened by the blushing of the rising sun that dreadful day of june too had dawned at seven o'clock the log told me that the nautilus had reduced speed i realized that it was letting the warship approach moreover the explosions grew more intensely audible shells furrowed the water around us drilling through it with an odd hissing sound my friends i said it's time let's shake hands and may god be with us ned land was determined conseil calm i myself nervous and barely in control we went into the library just as i pushed open the door leading to the well of the central companionway i heard the hatch close sharply overhead the canadian leaped up the steps but i stopped him a well-known hissing told me that water was entering the ship's ballast tanks indeed in a few moments the nautilus had submerged some meters below the surface of the waves i understood this maneuver it was too late to take action 
the nautilus wasn't going to strike the double-decker where it was clad in impenetrable iron armor but below its waterline where the metal carapace no longer protected its planking we were prisoners once more unwilling spectators at the performance of this gruesome drama but we barely had time to think taking refuge in my stateroom we stared at each other without pronouncing a word my mind was in a total daze my mental processes came to a dead stop i hovered in that painful state that predominates during the period of anticipation before some frightful explosion i waited i listened i lived only through my sense of hearing meanwhile the nautilus's speed had increased appreciably so it was gathering momentum its entire hull was vibrating suddenly i let out a yell there had been a collision but it was comparatively mild i could feel the penetrating force of the steel spur i could hear scratchings and scrapings carried away with its driving power the nautilus had passed through the vessel's mass like a sailmaker's needle through canvas i couldn't hold still frantic going insane i leaped out of my stateroom and rushed into the lounge captain nemo was there mute gloomy implacable he was staring through the port panel an enormous mass was sinking beneath the waters and the nautilus missing none of its death throes was descending into the depths with it ten meters away i could see its gaping hull into which water was rushing with a sound of thunder then its double rows of cannons and railings its deck was covered with dark quivering shadows the water was rising those poor men leaped up into the shrouds clung to the masts writhed beneath the waters it was a human anthill that an invading sea had caught by surprise paralyzed rigid with anguish my hair standing on end my eyes popping out of my head short of breath suffocating speechless i stared i too i was glued to the window by an irresistible allure the enormous vessel settled slowly following it down the nautilus kept watch on its every movement suddenly there was an eruption the air compressed inside the craft sent its decks flying as if the powder stores had been ignited the thrust of the waters was so great the nautilus swerved away the poor ship then sank more swiftly its mastheads appeared laden with victims then its cross trees bending under clusters of men finally the peak of its mainmast then the dark mass disappeared and with it a crew of corpses dragged under by fearsome eddies i turned to captain nemo this dreadful executioner this true archangel of hate was still staring when it was all over captain nemo headed to the door of his stateroom opened it and entered i followed him with my eyes on the rear paneling beneath the portraits of his heroes i saw the portrait of a still youthful woman with two little children captain nemo stared at them for a few moments stretched out his arms to them sank to his knees and melted into sobs End of Part 2, Chapter 21Part 2, Chapter 22 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne Chapter 22, The Last Words of Captain Nemo The panels closed over this frightful view, but the lights didn't go on in the lounge inside the nautilus all was gloom and silence it left this place of devastation with prodigious speed 100 feet beneath the waters where was it going north or south where would the man flee after this horrible act of revenge i re-entered my stateroom where ned and conseil were waiting silently captain nemo filled me with insurmountable horror whatever he had once suffered at the hands of humanity he had no right to mete out such punishment he had made me if not an accomplice at least an eyewitness to his vengeance even this was intolerable 
at eleven o'clock the electric lights came back on i went into the lounge it was deserted i consulted the various instruments the nautilus was fleeing northward at a speed of twenty-five miles per hour sometimes on the surface of the sea sometimes thirty feet beneath it after our position had been marked on the chart i saw that we were passing into the mouth of the english channel that our heading would take us to the northernmost seas with incomparable speed i could barely glimpse the swift passing of long-nosed sharks hammerhead sharks spotted dogfish that frequent these waters big eagle rays swarms of seahorse looking like knights on a chessboard eels quivering like fireworks serpents armies of crab that fled obliquely by crossing their pincers over their carapaces finally schools of porpoise that held contests of speed with the nautilus but by this point observing studying and classifying were out of the question by evening we had cleared two hundred leagues up the atlantic shadows gathered and gloom overran the sea until the moon came up i repaired to my stateroom i couldn't sleep i was assaulted by nightmares that horrible scene of destruction kept repeating in my mind's eye from that day forward who knows where the nautilus took us in the north atlantic basin always at incalculable speed always amid the high arctic mists did it call at the capes of spitzbergen or the shores of novaya zemlya did it visit such uncharted seas as the white sea the kara sea the gulf of ob the lyakov islands or those unknown beaches on the siberian coast i'm unable to say i lost track of the passing hours time was in abeyance on the ship's clocks as happens in the polar regions it seemed that night and day no longer followed their normal sequence i felt myself being drawn into that strange domain where the overwrought imagination of edgar allan poe was at home like his fabled arthur gordon pym i expected any moment to see that quote, shrouded human figure very far larger in its proportions than any dweller among men end quote thrown across the cataract that protects the outskirts of the pole i estimate but perhaps i'm mistaken that the nautilus's haphazard course continued for fifteen or twenty days and i'm not sure how long this would have gone on without the catastrophe that ended our voyage as for captain nemo he was no longer in the picture as for his chief officer the same applied not one crewman was visible for a single instant the nautilus cruised beneath the waters almost continuously when it rose briefly to the surface to renew our air the hatches opened and closed as if automated no more positions were reported on the world map i didn't know where we were i'll also mention that the canadian at the end of his strength and patience made no further appearances Conseil couldn't coax a single word out of him, and feared that in a fit of delirium while under the sway of ghastly homesickness, Ned would kill himself. So he kept a devoted watch on his friend every instant. You can appreciate that under these conditions our situation had become untenable. One morning, whose date I'm unable to specify, I was slumbering near the first hours of daylight, a painful, sickly slumber. Waking up, I saw Ned Land leaning over me, and I heard him tell me in a low voice, We're going to escape. I sat up. When? I asked. Tonight. There doesn't seem to be any supervision left on the Nautilus. You'd think a total daze was raining on board. Will you be ready, sir? Yes. Where are we? In sight of land. I saw it through the mists just this morning twenty miles to the east what land is it i've no idea but whatever it is there we'll take refuge yes ned we'll escape tonight even if the sea swallows us up the sea's rough the wind's blowing hard but a twenty-five mile run in the nautilus's nimble longboat doesn't scare me unknown to the crew i've stowed some food and flasks of water inside i'm with you 
what's more the canadian added if they catch me i'll defend myself i'll fight to the death then we'll die together ned my friend my mind was made up the canadian left me i went out on the platform where i could barely stand upright against the jolts of the billows the skies were threatening but land lay inside those dense mists and we had to escape not a single day not even a single hour could we afford to lose i returned to the lounge dreading yet desiring an encounter with captain nemo wanting yet not wanting to see him what would i say to him how could i hide the involuntary horror he inspired in me no it was best not to meet him face to face best to try and forget him and yet how long that day seemed the last i would spend aboard the nautilus i was left to myself ned land and conseil avoided speaking to me afraid they would give themselves away at six o'clock i ate supper but i had no appetite despite my revulsion i forced it down wanting to keep my strength up at six thirty ned land entered my stateroom he told me we won't see each other again before we go at ten o'clock the moon won't be up yet we'll take advantage of the darkness come to the skiff conseil and i will be inside waiting for you the canadian left without giving me time to answer him i wanted to verify the nautilus's heading i made my way to the lounge we were racing north northeast with frightful speed fifty meters down i took one last look at the natural wonders and artistic treasures amassed in the museum this unrivaled collection doomed to perish some day in the depths of the seas together with its curator i wanted to establish one supreme impression in my mind i stayed there an hour basking in the aura of the ceiling lights passing in review the treasures shining in their glass cases then i returned to my stateroom there i dressed in sturdy seafaring clothes i gathered my notes and packed them tenderly about my person my heart was pounding mightily i couldn't curb its pulsations my anxiety and agitation would certainly have given me away if captain nemo had seen me what was he doing just then i listened at the door to his stateroom i heard the sound of footsteps captain nemo was inside he hadn't gone to bed with his every movement i imagined he would appear and ask me why i wanted to escape i felt in a perpetual state of alarm my imagination magnified this sensation the feeling became so acute i wondered whether it wouldn't be better to enter the captain's stateroom dare him face to face brave it out with word and deed it was an insane idea fortunately i controlled myself and stretched out on the bed to soothe my bodily agitation my nerves calmed a little but with my brain so aroused i did a swift review of my whole existence aboard the nautilus every pleasant or unpleasant incident that had crossed my path since i went overboard from the abraham lincoln the underwater hunting trip the tories strait our running aground the savages of papua the coral cemetery the suez passageway the island of santorini the cretan diver the bay of vigo atlantis the ice bank the south pole our imprisonment in the ice the battle with the devilfish the storm in the gulf stream the avenger and that horrible scene of the vessel sinking with its crew all these events passed before my eyes like backdrops unrolling upstage in a theater in this strange setting captain nemo then grew fantastically his features were accentuated taking on superhuman proportions he was no longer my equal he was the man of the waters the spirit of the seas by then it was nine thirty i held my head in both hands to keep it from bursting i closed my eyes I no longer wanted to think a half hour still to wait a half hour of nightmares that could drive me insane just then i heard indistinct chords from the organ melancholy harmonies from some undefinable hymn 
actual pleadings from a soul trying to sever its earthly ties i listened with all my senses at once barely breathing immersed like captain nemo in this musical trance that was drawing him beyond the bounds of this world then a sudden thought terrified me captain nemo had left his stateroom he was in the same lounge i had to cross in order to escape there i would encounter him one last time he would see me perhaps speak to me one gesture from him could obliterate me a single word shackle me to his vessel even so ten o'clock was about to strike it was time to leave my stateroom and rejoin my companions i dared not hesitate even if captain nemo stood before me i opened the door cautiously but as it swung on its hinges it seemed to make a frightful noise this noise existed perhaps only in my imagination i crept forward through the nautilus's dark gangways pausing after each step to curb the pounding of my heart i arrived at the corner door of the lounge i opened it gently the lounge was plunged into profound darkness chords from the organ were reverberating faintly captain nemo was there he didn't see me even in broad daylight i doubt he would have noticed me so completely was he immersed in his trance i inched over the carpet avoiding the tiniest bump whose noise might give me away it took me five minutes to reach the door at the far end which led into the library i was about to open it when a gasp from captain nemo nailed me to the spot i realized that he was standing up i even got a glimpse of him because some rays of light from the library had filtered into the lounge he was coming toward me arms crossed silent not walking but gliding like a ghost his chest was heaving swelling with sobs and i heard him murmur these words the last of his to reach my ears oh almighty god enough enough was it a vow of repentance that had just escaped from this man's conscience frantic i rushed into the library i climbed the central companionway and going along the upper gangway i arrived at the skiff i went through the opening that had already given access to my two companions let's go let's go i exclaimed right away the canadian replied first ned land closed and bolted the opening cut into the nautilus's sheet iron using the monkey wrench he had with him after likewise closing the opening in the skiff the canadian began to unscrew the nuts still bolting us to the underwater boat suddenly a noise from the ship's interior became audible voices were answering each other hurriedly what was it had they spotted our escape i felt ned land sliding a dagger into my hand yes i muttered we know how to die the canadian paused in his work but one word twenty times repeated one dreadful word told me the reason for the agitation spreading aboard the nautilus we weren't the cause of the crew's concerns maelstrom maelstrom they were shouting the maelstrom could a more frightening name have rung in our ears under more frightening circumstances were we lying in the dangerous waterways off the norwegian coast was the nautilus being dragged into this whirlpool just as the skiff was about to detach from its plating as you know at the turn of the tide the waters confined between the pharaoh and lofoten islands rush out with irresistible violence they form a vortex from which no ship has ever been able to escape monstrous waves race together from every point on the horizon they form a whirlpool aptly called the ocean's navel whose attracting power extends a distance of fifteen kilometers it can suck down not only ships but whales and even polar bears from the northernmost regions this was where the nautilus had been sent accidentally or perhaps deliberately by its captain it was sweeping around in a spiral whose radius kept growing smaller and smaller the skiff still attached to the ship's plating was likewise carried around at dizzying speed i could feel a swirling i was experiencing that accompanying nausea that follows such continuous spinning motions we were in dread in the last stages of sheer horror our blood frozen in our veins our nerves numb 
drenched in cold sweat as if from the throes of dying and what a noise around our frail skiff what roars echoing from several miles away what crashes from the waters breaking against sharp rocks on the seafloor where the hardest objects are smashed where tree trunks are worn down and worked into a shaggy fur as norwegians express it what a predicament we were rocking frightfully the nautilus defended itself like a human being its steel muscles were cracking sometimes it stood on end the three of us along with it we've got to hold on tight ned said and screw the nuts down again if we can stay attached to the nautilus we can still make it he hadn't finished speaking when a cracking sound occurred the nuts gave way and ripped out of its socket the skiff was hurled like a stone from a sling into the midst of the vortex my head struck against an iron timber and with this violent shock i lost consciousness end of part two chapter twenty two part two chapter twenty three of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne chapter twenty three conclusion we come to the conclusion of this voyage under the seas what happened that night how the skiff escaped from the maelstrom's fearsome eddies how ned land conseil and i got out of that whirlpool i am unable to say but when I regained consciousness, I was lying in a fisherman's hut on one of the Lofoten Islands. My two companions, safe and sound, were at my bedside clasping my hands. We embraced each other heartily. Just now we can't even dream of returning to France. Travel between Upper Norway and the South is limited, so I have to wait for the arrival of a steamboat that provides bi-monthly service from North Cape. So it is here, among these gallant people who have taken us in, that I am reviewing my narrative of these adventures. It is accurate. Not a fact has been omitted. Not a detail has been exaggerated. It's the faithful record of this inconceivable expedition into an element now beyond human reach, but where progress will some day make great inroads. Will anyone believe me? I don't know. Ultimately, it's unimportant. What I can now assert is that I've earned the right to speak of these seas, beneath which, in less than ten months, I've cleared twenty thousand leagues in this underwater tour of the world that has shown me so many wonders across the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, the southernmost and northernmost seas. But what happened to the Nautilus? Did it withstand the Maelstrom's clutches? Is Captain Nemo alive? Is he still under the ocean pursuing his frightful program of revenge? Or did he stop after the latest mass execution? Will the waves some day deliver that manuscript that contains his full life story? Will I finally learn the man's name? Will the nationality of the stricken warship tell us the nationality of Captain Nemo? I hope so. I likewise hope that his powerful submersible has defeated the sea inside its most dreadful whirlpool, that the Nautilus has survived where so many ships have perished. If this is the case, and Captain Nemo still inhabits the ocean, his adopted country, may the hate be appeased in that fierce heart. May the contemplation of so many wonders extinguish the spirit of vengeance in him. May the executioner pass away, and the scientist continue his peaceful exploration of the seas. If his destiny is strange, it's also sublime. Haven't I encompassed it myself? Didn't I lead ten months of this otherworldly existence? Thus, to the question asked six thousand years ago in the book of Ecclesiastes, quote, Who can fathom the soundless depths? End quote. Two men out of all humanity have now earned the right to reply, Captain Nemo and I. End of Part 2, Chapter 22 End of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea 
an underwater tour of the world by jules verne first published in 1869 this recording completed in october 2013 